Broom for One More, Sea Witch Cozy Mysteries, Book 3, written by Morgana Best, narrated by Amy Soakes. Chapter 1 Help me, I screamed as I ran down the hallway. The monster from the Green Lagoon had broken into my house and was drinking my coffee. I didn't even know the monster from the Green Lagoon was real, let alone under-caffeinated. I put down my mug, looking for something I could fight a monster with, like that ugly lamp I pretended to love that my grandmother had given me one Christmas. Then I caught my reflection in the mirror once more and stopped screaming. It was me. I was the monster. Well, I suppose that's true of everyone who has not had enough coffee. I had decided to pamper myself, so a French green clay mask covered my face and 24 heated rollers sat resplendent in my hair. I know the electric rollers were a kind of 1980s thing to do, but the humidity at the Gold Coast made my hair hang limp and flat. I winced at my reflection once more and then walked back to the living room where a glass of Chardonnay was waiting to welcome me. Coffee was not going to be enough. I stretched out on the sofa, uttered a sigh of contentment and reached for my wine. Just as I did so, a grunt startled me. I sat upright. Persnickel, my wombat, was standing on the old sofa against one of the front windows, making a deep growling sound at whatever he could see outside. I abandoned my wine and hurried to the window. A bunch of runners, all dressed in orange, were running along the road that ran past my house. For some reason, Persnickel particularly hated the colour orange, unless it was in the form of carrots. He could not abide anything orange. Before I could stop him, he launched himself right through the fly screen of the front door and bounced down the footpath. I tore after him, my bathrobe flapping in the wind. I thought he would stop at the front gate, but he crashed right through the wood and took off after the runners. I had no choice but to follow him. Persnickel! Persnickel! I screamed. He was chasing the runners. Goodness knows what he would do if he caught one. I knew they were from the Netherlands and had recently booked the entire nearby East Bucklebury Spa Resort and Colonics Centre, a resort which doled out nothing but raw juices and colonics. It didn't sound like my idea of fun. Still, it obviously did something for running ability because Persnickel wasn't gaining on the runners. A large bus pulled up beside me. The driver waved as the occupants leant out and took photos of me. Stop! I yelled at them, waving my fist. That only seemed to send them into a further flurry. It looked as if every passenger had either a smartphone or a proper camera. I took a deep breath and tried to run faster. My breath was coming in ragged bursts and my throat was on fire. Finally, Persnickel overtook a straggler. The hapless man fell to the ground, one orange shoe cast aside. He was yelling something, presumably in Dutch, and I figured it wasn't complimentary. Persnickel wasted no time devouring his shoe. The bus came to a stop beside me, and the occupants all filed out. I soon realized they too were speaking in Dutch, so they must have been the non-running sector of the resort party. One of the women hurried over to me. She was accompanied by a man who appeared terrified. Green the reptile woman, the wild animal is eating the shoe, she said in broken English. He's not a wild animal, he's my pet, I told her. She clutched her throat. You speak well, she said. You will speak well for a wild Australian woman from the outback. I realized I must have looked a fright with my furry dog slippers and my flapping bathrobe, my bright green face and my hair in rollers. Then again, why would people from the outback wear electric rollers? I thought that a flaw in her argument. I was about to point that out when the driver pulled her back inside the bus. The bus drove away, the occupants hanging out the windows taking photos of me. I realized I didn't have Persnickel's leash, so I took off my bathrobe cord and looped it around his neck. Come with me, you naughty wombat, I scolded him. I'm going to have to pay for that shoe, 
And fair enough, too. Running shoes aren't cheap. Persnickel merely grunted by way of response, and little bits of orange fabric fell out the sides of his mouth. You know, I'm going to have to take you to the vet, I told him. He's going to need to check you out. There could be poison or some sort of nasty glue in those shoes. Persnickel's eyes filled with fear at the mention of the word vet. Serves you right, I added. After I dragged Persnickel back home, I locked him in the living room while I took off my face mask. It had gone rock hard and deep crevices had formed in my face. I took one of the rollers out of my hair and then let out a scream. My hair came with the roller. I removed the other rollers as fast as I could, and to my dismay they had snapped off most of my hair. My remaining hair, the little that was left, was standing upright as if I had put my hand in an electric socket. There was no way I could fix this. It was all I could do not to burst into tears. Most of my hair was missing. What a day this had been. I sure hoped it was going to get better. One thing was certain. I couldn't go out in public with my hair like this. I would have to buy a wig, but I didn't know where to buy one in person. Even if I did, I couldn't leave the house in my current state. To make matters worse, an online delivery would take days to get here. It was then I remembered that just before I left Melbourne, I had gone to a fancy dress party dressed as Morticia Adams. Surely I still had that costume. I hurried to one of the spare rooms, and as luck would have it, the wig was in the last box I unpacked. It was a nice, full-length black wig. I threw it over my damaged head of hair and hurried back to the bathroom to look in the mirror. It wasn't quite my style, but it was certainly an improvement. I took off the wig and scrubbed all the green slime off my face. I quickly threw on some makeup and some clothes and put the black wig on again. It wasn't too bad. It actually looked like real hair and not a wig, although I didn't look anything like my usual self. I walked back out to get Persnickel's car harness and his leash, but he ran behind the sofa when he saw me. You come out right now, I scolded him. This is all your fault. If you hadn't chased those people dressed in orange, this would never have happened. You're a very naughty wombat. After a bit of wrestling and several carrot treats, I managed to catch Bursnickel. I thought about calling the vet clinic to make an appointment, but I figured they would tell me to come another day, and for all I knew it could be important. I had never noticed a vet clinic in town, but once Persnickel was secured in the car, I did a quick search on my iPhone. It turned out there was only one vet in town, a Dr. Chase Evans. Given that it only took five minutes to drive from one end of town to the other, I didn't have much trouble finding his place. But it was the end of a swampy road in quite an isolated position. I would have thought the vet clinic would be in the middle of town. There were no cars in the parking area, and I was afraid everyone had left for the day, despite the fact it was only three in the afternoon. Still, strange things happen in the country. Persnickel had obviously been there before, because he was quite reluctant to get out of the car, and even a carrot would not tempt him. After a lot of grunting, I managed to strong-arm him out of the car. I dragged him to the door, and to my relief, it wasn't locked. Hello? Is anyone here? I called out. No one was in the waiting room, and there was no bell on the desk, although the door did sound an alarm as I walked in. But no one came to my aid. I wondered if all the staff were in surgery. I cleared my throat loudly, and then cleared it again. I noticed the door at the end of the corridor was ajar, and it did not have the word surgery written on it like two of the other doors. I tentatively walked down the short corridor and knocked on the open door. The room was large and well decorated and smelt of wet dogs. Large, framed photographs of various animals hung on the wood panelled walls. The only sound was the bone chilling screech of black cockatoos in the sky above. Still, something wasn't right. Do you have an appointment? I gasped as a man loomed in front of me. He floated towards me, 
his feet not touching the ground. Chapter Two The scream froze in my throat. There, on the ground behind a large wooden desk, was a trousered leg. I felt as though I were dreaming. Everything slowed down. After what seemed an age, I edged forward, pulling Persnickel behind me. I looked over the desk and saw a dead man. The ghost saw himself too, gasped, and then vanished. I stood there, staring in disbelief, when a voice called out behind me, You're not allowed in there. I spun around to see a woman in a vet nurse uniform. He, he's dead, I stammered, pointing to the body on the floor. What? She stared at me, her mouth agape for a few moments, before collecting herself and rushing past me. She gasped momentarily when she saw the man, and then hurried to feel his pulse. I wasn't a vet nurse, but even I knew there would be no pulse to be felt. She stood up. What happened? She asked breathlessly. I clutched Persnickel's leash. Uh, I just got here. There was no one here, and my wombat had just eaten a Dutch man's running shoe. I thought it was an emergency, so I came straight here. For some reason, she seemed puzzled by my words. He's been shot, she said, somewhat unnecessarily. Have you called the police? I shook my head. I just got here, just then, literally that second. I only saw him nanoseconds before you came. Where were you? I asked, narrowing my eyes. She appeared to take no offense. I had to pop into town, she said. There were no bookings for the next hour. You didn't phone first? I shook my head again. No, I thought it was an emergency because my wombat just ate a running shoe, I said more slowly this time. Did you see anyone else? No, I didn't, I said. There were no other cars or anything. This door was open, though, so I knocked and then I saw him. Is he the vet? For the first time, she seemed overcome by sadness. Yes, he was, she dabbed at her eyes. I'd better call the police. After she called emergency, she ushered me into the waiting room. We had better avoid the office in case we destroy evidence, she said. I'm Georgia Garrison. Tears streamed down her cheeks. I'm Goldie, Goldie Bloom, and this is my wombat, Persnickel. I'm sorry about your boss. I didn't know what else to say. Georgia took a seat beside me and clutched her stomach. Is there anything I can do for you? I asked her. She was trembling. I doubted she had been the one to shoot him, because I didn't think anyone could act quite so well. Georgia dabbed at her eyes more furiously, and then said, No, thank you. Why did you say you were here again? I had already told her several times, but I think it was the shock of seeing her boss like that. My wombat hates the color orange, and some of the Dutch people... You know the one staying at the health resort? She nodded, and I pushed on. He ate a shoe belonging to one of the runners. He ate the whole shoe, and I didn't know if there were toxic ingredients in it, so I brought him here to be checked over. She stared at Persnickel again, probably because he was making grunting sounds. He only does that when he's scared, I told her. I inherited him from my uncle only recently. She looked at me with renewed interest. Oh, yes. I expect Peter Proteus was your uncle. We've had this wombat in before. He doesn't like vets much. So is eating a shoe dangerous? I asked her. She shrugged. No, I'm sure he'll be fine. He didn't choke on it, obviously. So just keep an eye on him and bring him back if he seems off color or goes off his food. I wondered if she would send me a bill. Is there another vet in town? I asked her, and to my dismay, she burst into hysterical sobs. No, she managed to say between her sobs. Chase was the only vet in East Buckleberry. She blew her nose so loudly that Persnickel jumped. Do you think I need to take him to another vet? I asked her. She shook her head. I'm sure he'll be fine. Like I said, 
I don't think you have anything to worry about. Just don't let him eat any more shoes. I didn't actually let him eat that one, I muttered. Can I get you a glass of water or anything? No, it's just a terrible shock. She was going to say more, but we heard the police sirens. That didn't take them long, she added. She crossed to open the clinic door wide and wedged a piece of wood under it. Two uniformed officers presently walked into the room, followed by two detectives. I recognised them as Detective John Walters and Detective Rick Power, who had wrongfully arrested my friend Oleander after the recent murder of the residence manager of the local retirement home. They marched straight over to us. Names, Power snapped. Georgia Garrison, I I'm a vet nurse here. Georgia's voice broke. The detective turned to me. Goldie Bloom, I brought my wombat here to see the vet. As soon as I said it, I thought it a silly thing to say. Why else would I be in a vet's waiting room clutching a wombat on a leash? Both detectives stared at me. I know you from somewhere, Detective Power said. I nodded. Yes, I'm friends with Oleander Blanche and Athanasius Chadwick Pryor from the local retirement home. Power glared at me. Oh, yes, I remember you. But didn't you have red hair? Your hair wasn't long, straight and black, that's for sure. I was horribly embarrassed. This is a wig, I said. One of the uniformed officers stuck his head around the door and summoned him. Wait here, Power snapped. When the detectives returned, Detective Power addressed us again. Do you have any idea why Dr. Evans would take his own life? Georgia jumped. Take his own life? Of course he didn't take his own life. That's ridiculous. Power looked at me. And what's your opinion on the matter? I shrugged. I don't have an opinion. I've never met him, I said. The first time I saw him was when I found him like that. Power narrowed his eyes. I'm going to ask you both to come down to the station to give your witness statements, but for now, I need you both to tell me what happened. Which one of you actually discovered the body? Georgia winced. She pointed to me. She found him. There was more than a little accusation in her tone. Once more, I explained the events of earlier. My wombat ate a running shoe, so I brought him down to the vet clinic to be checked over, just in case it was going to make him sick. When I got here, no one was here. I called out, and then I saw that the door there, I pointed to the end of the corridor, was slightly open. I walked in and saw a leg sticking out from behind the desk, so I hurried over to look, and just as I did, Georgia came in. Power stared at Georgia. Do you two know each other? Georgia shook her head. I only met her, just then. The detective looked her up and down. What's your version of events? We didn't have any appointments until later in the afternoon, so I popped into town. When I got back, I found this woman looking at Chase. He was lying on the ground. Power turned his attention back to me. Did you make an appointment to see the vet? I shook my head. No, it had just happened, and I thought it might be an emergency, so I drove straight here to see if they could fit me in. His brows knit together. And why did you see fit to wear a disguise? I was flabbergasted. A disguise? I repeated. That long black wig. He jabbed one finger in my direction. I damaged my hair with electric rollers, I admitted. Show me. Excuse me? I said angrily, you want me to take off my wig? Yes. I didn't want to take off my wig and show them my damaged hair, but I did as he asked, albeit reluctantly. I dislodged it and then put it back on quite quickly. It does look damaged, Power said to Detective Walters, who was doing his best to stifle a laugh. To me, Power said, so that's your reason for wearing a disguise? It's not a disguise, I snapped at him. If I was coming here in disguise, why would I bring my wombat? I'm the only person in town who has a wombat on a leash, and everyone would know it was me. That's extremely obvious, I would think. I shot him my most withering glare as I said it. 
Power appeared unperturbed. He waved one hand at me in dismissal and then walked back into the room where the body was. Georgia and I did not speak. I wondered why the detective seemed to think the vet had been murdered when at first he said it was suicide. I hadn't seen a note, but then again I hadn't been looking. Chapter 3 A uniformed officer approached us. I'm going to perform a gunshot residue test, he said, pulling strips of paper from a container. Do either of you have any objections? No, both Georgia and I said in unison. The officer stuck bits of thin paper or tape, I couldn't quite tell, over my hands and my clothes and then did the same to Georgia. Will this prove we didn't do it? She asked the officer. He shrugged one shoulder. I'm only collecting the samples. The detectives are the ones on the case. But Detective Power told us it was suicide, I said. The officer simply nodded. It wasn't suicide, Georgia hissed. In that case, he was murdered, I told her. That means we're going to be the main suspects. A look of shock flashed over Georgia's face. Clearly, that had not occurred to her. As the officer walked away, she called out after him. How long do those results take? He turned back to her. About a week. I groaned aloud. Detectives Power and Walters were the ones who had arrested Oleander on decidedly tenuous evidence. Since I was the one to discover the body... I wouldn't be at all surprised if they had me in prison in double quick time. I had hoped the results would be instant, or at least take no more than 24 hours. I pulled out my phone and googled gunshot residue test. The results were overly scientific, not to mention boring, although I came across the transcript of a documentary that said that if someone sprints from the room as soon as they shoot someone then they will have no gunshot residue on them. I wondered if Georgia had shot the vet. He was obviously a nice man, I said to her. She looked at me, startled. What? Oh, sorry. Yes, everyone loved him. Not everyone, I said. He was murdered, Georgia gasped. Finally, she said, I have no idea who would do such a thing. Hopefully the police won't suspect you if you have an alibi in town. I raised my eyebrows, hoping she would divulge the information, but she simply said, Yes. I wondered how long he had been lying there, so I asked, How long were you in town? An hour, she said. I was having lunch with friends. It's a bit late in the day for lunch, isn't it? She shot me a look. I had to work through lunch. We had an emergency. Power marched back into the room. I need you both to accompany me to the station and give witness statements. Accompany you, I repeated. We can't drive there independently. He shook his head. I'd prefer you to come in the police vehicle. But what about my wombat? I said plaintively. Do you want me to take him to the police station too? Power's right eye twitched. After a few moments' silence, he said, We will follow you back to your house. After you secure the wombat, you will accompany us to the station. I held up my hands in surrender. Sure. I drove home, followed by the police vehicle containing Detective Power and Detective Walters, as well as Georgia Garrison. My stomach churned and my palms were sweaty. It sure was hot under that wig. To my dismay, Power followed me to my door. Maybe he thought I was going to stash a gun somewhere. Does your wombat have the run of your house? He asked in disbelief. He's a pet wombat. It's not against the law or anything, is it? I added in a sarcastic tone. But then I remembered that coffee was illegal in this town due to an obscure old bylaw. So nothing would surprise me. I wished I had kept my mouth shut. Power simply narrowed his eyes and gestured to the car. I shook my head. Just wait a minute. I have to put on the TV to keep him happy while I'm away. I hurried over to the TV and slipped in a DVD of an episode of Starsky and Hutch. 
Persnickel lowered himself into his dog bed, or should I say his wombat bed, and made a small grunt of pleasure. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, Power muttered to himself as we walked out the door. The drive to the police station across the other side of the M1 was long and boring. No one spoke. I felt like a criminal sitting in the back of the police vehicle and only consoled myself with the fact that Georgia was a fellow suspect. When we reached the police station, Detective Power parked around the back and ushered us in through a back door. I expected to be taken straight to a waiting room, but he all but pushed Georgia into one room with a uniformed officer and then guided me into another room. Sit, he barked, pointing to a grey plastic chair. I walked around the old wooden table and sat in the chair. Do you have any objection to us videotaping this session? He asked me. No, I said, but you said it was suicide. And you think it wasn't suicide? He asked me. You are asking questions that you'd only ask if he'd been murdered, I pointed out. And Georgia and I were both tested for gunshot residue. If you truly thought it was suicide, then we wouldn't have been tested for gunshot residue. Power made no reply, but simply left the room, leaving me alone. I surveyed my surroundings. Some of the room was a pale shade of mint green, but the rest of the room was not so tasteful. The door and the skirting boards were bright, full-gloss forest green, and the Venetian blinds, over what I could only assume was a one-way mirror, were tattered and broken in parts. There was no video camera in the room, so I figured that Power had gone to fetch one. I wondered if he would offer me coffee, as it was legal everywhere apart from East Buckleberry. Some caffeine certainly wouldn't go astray, but I was sure I would be offered a glass of tap water. I always drank filtered water because I couldn't stand the taste of the chlorine in the local tap water. Still, drinking ghastly water was the least of my worries. It was clear to me I was a serious suspect in a murder investigation. I'd certainly had a bad day, running down the street chasing runners from the Netherlands in their orange uniforms, and Persnickel tackling the runner and eating his shoe. I sighed. I wondered if the runner would bring a civil case against me. I made a mental note to go to the health resort with a large box of chocolates. Surely anyone at a health resort would be craving chocolates. I smiled to myself, pleased with my plan. Power chose that moment to return. What are you smiling about? He asked me. It's wind, I said, remembering that babies often appear to smile when they have wind. I had no idea where that thought came from, but I went with it. Power sat opposite me, while Walters crossed to one side of the room and set up a video recorder on a tripod. I noticed there were no windows, and I was suddenly hit with claustrophobia. It was a humid day, and while the building had air conditioning, none of it seemed to have made its way into this room. I fought the urge to gasp for breath. Bauer and Walters went through the formalities, such as instructing me to state my name, age and address, and that I agreed to be videotaped. Now, in your own words, tell us why you're wearing a disguise, were Power's opening words. I fought my growing irritation. I've already told you it's not a disguise, I said tersely. Persnickel saw some runners running down the street and they were wearing orange, he hates the colour orange. I could say no more, because Power held up his hand. For the record, who or what is Persnickel? Persnickel is my pet wombat, I said. I silently added, and he's my familiar. When he's around, I can see and speak to ghosts. Of course, I couldn't say that aloud. Power waved one hand at me. Go on. I was wearing a French green clay face mask and I had heated rollers in my hair at the time Persnickel decided to chase the runners, I explained. I had to run after them in my bathrobe. In fact, you can ask the Dutch people from the health resort. They were taking photos of me, so you can see for yourself that I had the heated rollers in my hair. Anyway, Persnickel hates orange, apart from carrots, of course, 
so he ate a shoe because it was orange. Power pulled a face as if he had no idea what I was talking about. I decided to press on. Then I ran home quickly and washed off my face mask, and I was about to take Persnickel to the vet to see if eating the shoe would harm him. I continued, My hair was horribly damaged, and I didn't want to be seen in public like that, and there was no time to order a wig, and I didn't want to be seen in public buying one. I paused for breath. I remembered I had gone as Morticia Adams to a fancy dress event in Melbourne, so I stuck the wig on my head. Power and Walters exchanged glances. Who is this Morticia Adams? Power asked me. You know, the Adams family. I hummed the theme song and clicked my fingers. Power put his elbows on the desk and rubbed his forehead. Did you make an appointment with the vet? He asked when he looked up again. His face was white and drawn. We've been through this already, I said. No, because I thought it was an emergency. I wanted to get my wombat straight to the vet. And what did you see when you reached the vet's clinic? There were no other cars. I didn't even see the vet's car. The door was open, so I went in, but there was no one behind the reception desk, so I waited for a while. Then I thought it was strange no one was around, and I noticed the door open at the end of the corridor. I went in and saw a leg sticking out from behind the desk. I went over and saw that the man had been shot. Just at the very second I saw him, Georgia, the vet nurse, came in. For the next 15 minutes, Power made me repeat myself over and over again. Finally, he seemed satisfied. And you had never met the vet before, he asked for the umpteenth time. I exhaled slowly. No, and I'd never even spoken to him. I didn't even know his name. I didn't even know he existed. My tone was firm. And had you met any of the vet nurses or anyone who works for the clinic? He asked. No, I only met Georgia when I discovered the body. I've never met anyone from the vet clinic, and I've never been to the vet clinic here in my entire life. I didn't even know where it was until I googled it today, I said with a sigh. I wondered how many more times he was going to ask me that. To my relief, he said, that will be all for now, Miss Bloom. We will need to speak with you again at some point. I jumped to my feet. My butt had gone numb from sitting in the uncomfortable chair for so long. I'm free to go home? No, not quite yet. Detective Walters will escort you to the waiting room because we might need to speak with you further today. Then again, we might not, in which case I will instruct a uniformed officer to drive you home. For now, I'll ask you to remain in the waiting room. I pulled a face. I thought my early escape was too good to be true. I sat in the waiting room, my stomach growling. I was absolutely starving. I wondered why he didn't know whether he would need to speak with me again, but I figured it would depend on George's story. If it matched mine, which of course it should, then I supposed they would let us both go. I figured it was only if they found discrepancies that they would question me again. The swinging door on the corridor leading to the detectives' rooms opened, and Detective Max Grayson walked out. A somewhat irritating man, Max was tall, well-built, and rather handsome. If I had to admit it, I would say I had a little crush on him. Sadly, it did not appear to be reciprocated. I was shocked to see him, and it appeared this feeling, at least, was mutual. Goldie, what are you doing here? I quickly filled him in on everything, followed by, What are you doing here? Aren't you still on leave? Yes, I just came to get my favourite stapler. He waved said stapler at me as he spoke. Oh, there really was no suitable reply to that. He was still staring hard at me. Your hair? I almost didn't recognise you. My hand flew to my wig. Oh, um, uh, yes, I changed it. He bit his lip for a while before speaking. So have they finished questioning you? Why are you still here? Detective Power said they might need to speak to me again, but he didn't seem sure. 
I figured he wanted to see if my statement matched the other witness's statement. Max nodded. That seems likely. You said they drove you here. I nodded. I'll give you a lift back if you like. I did my best not to look too pleased. Thanks, that would be nice. Wait right here and I'll see where those two detectives are at with everything. Max returned 15 minutes later, but before he spoke to me, turned back to speak to the desk sergeant. I looked at his bum. I hadn't meant to look at his bum, but it was right there in front of my eyes and it was great. A really top-notch bum. I thought about sending his mum a congratulations card, but I figured Hallmark didn't make those. Congratulations, your son has a delightful buttock. Or was it buttocks? Maybe I should ask Max. I should definitely not ask Max. You ready to go? Max asked me. I'm ready to shake my tail feathers, I said. Then I felt my cheeks burn. Not that I'm thinking about tail feathers. Chapter 4 Max hadn't spoken to me much on the trip back to my place. I could tell something was bothering him. He left me at my front gate and promised to return later to see if I was okay. I had no idea if he meant later that day or later in the week. I hurried to the door and flung it open. My stomach was growling and I was desperate for food. Just as my hand reached for the fridge door, I heard a knock. Surely Max wasn't back already. I hurried back into the living room and opened the front door. Oleanta, I wasn't expecting you. I quickly added, that's fine, of course. Come in. Goldie, what happened to your hair? I had almost forgotten about the wig. Oh, um, I had a heated roller accident, so I had to throw on this wig. Oleanda nodded absently and continued to fidget. I could see something was wrong. I can't come in. Not yet, anyway. She pointed to the car. I peeked around her and could see Athanasius sitting in a tiny white car. Whose car is that? Enid White's. You don't know her. What's wrong? Are you concerned that I was the one to discover the vet's body? I suppose I should have broken the news more gently in my text. No, it's not that. Uh, nothing is wrong, exactly, she said. It's just that I'm so not good at asking favours. You want to ask me a favour? I asked, confused. Not for myself, she said, gesturing to the car. It's just, oh, well, I might as well come out and say it. Do you have room for one more? I rubbed my forehead. Room for one more? Do you mean Athanasius? Why? Isn't he able to stay at the retirement home any longer? You're not making much sense. Oleander sighed. Oh, I'm sorry. I know I'm not making any sense. It's just that Enid White, you don't know her, has taken ill. She's been in hospital. Now she has to go into the assisted care for a few days, and she doesn't know what to do with him. I rubbed my forehead hard. With Athanasius, I didn't know he was dating anyone. Oleander's hands flew to her cheeks. Her mouth formed a perfect O. I don't think I've done a very good job of explaining. I'll start from the beginning. Enid White has a paddy melon. Someone minded the paddy melon for her while she was in the hospital, but they can't do so any longer, and now she's going to the assisted care facility at the retirement home. She'll be stuck there for a few days. Are you able to mind a paddy melon? I mean, I know it's a terrible imposition, but it is only for a few days, and... I was immensely relieved. It wasn't a house guest after all. Of course I can look after a paddy melon, I said. It's no trouble at all. Oleander looked confused, but immensely relieved. That's great, Goldie. Thank you. I'll just tell Athanasius to bring him in. I watched her walk away for a while, and then I walked inside to the coffee machine. These local residents sure took their fruit seriously. Still, the price of mangoes was exorbitant, and I supposed other fruit was awfully expensive. 
but such a fuss over a melon. It all seemed a little too much to me. Oleander returned. That's so good of you, Goldie, she said again. I'll have to put it up high, I said, otherwise Persnickel might eat it. Oleander gasped with horror, leaving me to assume this type of melon must indeed be horribly expensive. I'm sure he wouldn't do a thing like that, she said. Wombats aren't carnivorous, after all. I was really worried about her. Oleander, have you been drinking or smoking something strange? Maybe swapping medications with someone? She looked at me as though I was the one who was strange, when Athanasius walked through the door and gasped. Goldie, what have you done to your hair? I sighed. I burnt it off with heated rollers. By mistake, of course, I hastened to add, just in case he thought it was a fashion statement. I'll have to wear a wig until it grows back. I looked at what I presumed was the melon wrapped up in a blanket. To my horror, a little head poked out over the top. I backed up and shrieked. What's that? I asked, pointing. It's a paddy melon, like I told you, Oleander said. Goldie, you sure are acting strange today. I'm acting strange, Oleander frowned. I must say it is awfully kind of you to mind the padded melon. I told Enid White that you're good at looking after native animals, so you wouldn't mind another one for a few days. I was perplexed, but I thought I was looking after a piece of fruit. Oleander and Athanasius exchanged glances, Athanasius put the little creature down on the floor. I shrieked again. It looks like a giant rat. I kept telling you over and over again, he's a paddy melon, Oleander said. I've never heard of them before. He looks like a cross between a kangaroo and a rat. Still, the little creature was cute, sporting a cream belly and a brown grey body with red fur over his neck and shoulders. He looked like an extremely overweight, but miniature kangaroo. A paddy melon is like a very small wallaby, Athanasius explained. This is a redneck paddy melon. I'm sure you don't need to insult him, I censured him. I didn't know what I had let myself in for. Sure, I preferred the paddy melon to a human houseguest, but what would Persnickel think? I was about to find out. Persnickel walked into the room, he didn't notice the paddy melon at first, but then all at once he did. Thankfully, he didn't think the paddy melon was a type of carrot treat, but he let out a wombat shriek and sprinted from the room, which for a wombat was like a fast amble. They'll get used to each other, Oleander said. Let's all have some coffee and wait for them to become friends. How long do you have? I said snarkily but then went to make the coffee. Why don't I make the coffee, and you can do something to make Persnickel happy? Oleander suggested. Okay. I put on a DVD of Starsky and Hutch, and as soon as Persnickel heard the theme music, he waddled back into the room, looking around warily. I handed him a carrot. The paddy melon had run under a chair and was eyeing Persnickel with what appeared to be trepidation. What's his name? I asked them. Paddy, Oleander said. It's not a very imaginative name. She pulled a glass container out of her handbag. Here is his food, and these are the instructions for what he eats. I also have some special potted grasses in the car that are supposed to be left around so he can eat them. I continued to rub my forehead. Don't worry about it, Goldie. You'll be fine. Oleander nodded slowly in encouragement. Your place is secure for native animals, and you're already experienced with them. I shook my head. I'm not really experienced with them. Athanasius tapped me on the shoulder. Well, this should make you happy. I peeped into the living room and was relieved to see Persnickel stretched out in his favorite spot in front of the TV, and Paddy the Paddy Melon was right behind him. It seems they will get on well with each other, Athanasius said with obvious relief. I turned to the kitchen. Let's all fetch our coffee and take it into the living room. We can watch them. No sooner had I taken a step 
Then I heard another shriek. I spun around to see Paddy sitting on top of Persnickel. Persnickel was running around in circles, apparently trying to dislodge the Paddy Melon. Oleander clamped her hands over her eyes. I was hoping that wasn't going to be a problem. Enid said she has a robot vacuum cleaner and Paddy likes to ride around the house on it. Oleander and Athanasius didn't stay long. Perhaps they were afraid I would change my mind about Paddy. After I showed them out, Persnickel was still watching Starsky and Hutch, much to my relief. I poured myself a glass of wine and leant back on the sofa, momentarily distracted by the Torino flying around a corner. I wondered how many of those cars they had totaled during production. I was certain the detectives were going to try to pin this one on me. After all, I was a stranger to town, and Detective Power had thought I was wearing a disguise. I would have to take matters into my own hands. Oleander had told me I was a powerful sea witch, but all I knew about that, to date, was that if someone killed me, they could get my powers, whatever they were. Actually, I knew one other thing. When I was angry, frightened, upset, or experiencing any powerful emotion, a storm brewed. I would like to be able to control that. But see witch or not, I had long been a practicing traditional witch. Now was the time to act. I hurried to my altar cupboard and looked for the items I would need. I paused to admire my glass-encased Baybury candle and my glass-encased road opener candle, both of which I had bought from the U.S. The shipping on both items had been exorbitant, but it was worth it. I reached into the cupboard and pulled out calamus root licorice root and bergamot leaf for compulsion, and althea root for truth. Now what else did I need in a truth spell? My mind had gone blank. I returned to my coffee table and fetched my glass of wine. I downed it in one gulp. Surprisingly, it didn't help me think any more clearly. What else did I need for a truth spell? And where was my book of shadows? I hurried back to my bedroom and found it on my bedside table. I had been reading it the previous night. How could I have forgotten? I had spells for love, spells for money, and spells for protection, but I didn't have a truth spell in my book of shadows. Never mind, intention was everything. I would use the ingredients I had, light a candle, and focus on the truth coming out. I changed my mind and decided to Google truth spell, but nothing much turned up. Still, I was sure that the compulsion idea was good, and I could use the ingredients of a bend-over work used in hoodoo to bend someone to one's will. I thought of coffee. I always chose coffee in spells to speed up the process. Obviously, the police would find I didn't have any gunshot residue on my clothes, but I might be in the Southport watch house by then. So I grabbed a bag of coffee beans and ground some. The Southport watch house was where people were held awaiting trial or a bail hearing. Some newspaper articles labelled the conditions there as inhumane, and Oleander had been ensconced there only recently. Since Persnickel liked to steal lit candles, I shut the sliding doors across my altar room. He shot me a look but went back to watching Starsky and Hutch. Now that I was safely secured in the room, I looked in my cupboard for candles. I had brown ones, white ones, black ones, all colours and sizes of candles. I finally decided on a rich orange-yellow candle in the typical colours for bend over. Once my ingredients were assembled, I called the quarters. I didn't always call the quarters, but I figured I needed all the help I could get. I always started in the east, but I had been so accustomed to doing it in my old apartment in Melbourne that I had to think twice about the position of the east in my new house. Of course, east was the ocean. That should be easy. Aloud, I said, I call for your help, guardians of the east. I turned clockwise. I call for your help, guardians of the south. I continued, I call for your help, guardians of the West. I call for your help, guardians.
guardians of the north. Then I said, The goddess within and without, create a circle round about. Let love in, keep evil out. The circle is up, around about. I used to watch a lot of charming pixie flora videos back in the day, and I had taken that wording from one of her old videos. I wrote on a piece of paper, The truth will come out and fast. I placed the paper in a fireproof dish. I dropped in calamus root, licorice root, bergamot leaves, althea root, and some coffee. I picked up the candle and put some bend-over oil on it, stroking the oil in an upward direction, all the while focusing on my intent. I made some holes in the candle and pushed some of the oil and the ground herbs into the wax. I placed the candle on the fireproof dish on top of the name paper and sprinkled more calamus, licorice, bergamot and coffee all over it. I picked up my lighter and lit the candle, saying as I did, Spirits and guides go out immediately and make the truth come to light. I need to know the truth, and I need it now, immediately. The candle lit at once and burnt strongly, which I took as a good sign. I wrote on another name paper, The truth will come out now. I underlined the word now. Using tweezers, I picked up the piece of paper and burnt it, holding it over the candle flame. It caught a light and fell into the candle, which made the candle burn even faster. I always liked to read candles. If they did not light easily, I took that as a sign that I would have to work harder to achieve my outcome, and if they worked quickly and burnt well, as this one did, I took it that my spell would be successful. I closed the circle and then went to the kitchen looking for cake. Spells always made me hungry, and food was useful for grounding myself after a spell. I was careful to shut the sliding doors behind me so Purse Nickel would not steal the candle. After he had stolen the first candle, I had made sure that my altar table was quite high, but I wasn't taking any risks. Although I couldn't actually see the candle, I was reassured by the fact that I had installed several smoke alarms in that room and I had a large jar of water sitting just inside the door should anything go wrong. I walked back to the sofa and stretched out on it. I wanted to throw on some old clothes, but I was worried that Max would return, so I had no choice but to stay in my tight jeans and tight bra. After an hour, I had convinced myself that Max wasn't coming back. I was about to abandon my tight clothes for my hideous old pyjamas and take off the hot wig. No sooner had I made that decision than I heard a car. I crossed to the window and peeped out surreptitiously. Sure enough, it was Max's bright red car. I walked back to the sofa. After he knocked, I counted to five before I opened the door. After all, I didn't want to appear too eager. Hello, Max, come in, I said in what I hoped was a nonchalant tone. As soon as he walked inside, I shut the door behind him. Persnickel was snoring gently in front of the TV, so I grabbed the remote and turned off the TV. Paddy was asleep next to him. Would you like some coffee? I asked him. Yes, I have a serious coffee addiction, he said. I'm also obsessed with The Bachelor. I watch The Australian Bachelor and The American Bachelor. I can't seem to stop watching it. There's always drama, but I can't stop watching it. I must say The Bachelor is an obsession of mine. I was aware that my jaw had dropped open. Why was he telling me that? Before I had a chance to ask him, he pushed on. I'm on leave because my supervisor forced me to take paid leave. I didn't want to take paid leave, but internal affairs officers are in town investigating everyone at our police station. My supervisor thought I was the one who called them in, so he told me I had to take paid leave. So that was why he was on leave. I wondered why he had decided to tell me now. Is that legal? I asked him. He shrugged. I have no idea. I don't suspect my supervisor of any wrongdoing, but he said it's bad for morale if they think there is a dibber-dobber in their midst. 
I'm a bit upset that he thinks I'm the person who did it, but there's nothing I can do. I've been depressed, moping about the house, not being able to be involved in any cases. I don't really have a favourite stapler. I just went back to the police station today, hoping I would happen to see my supervisor and he would have a change of heart. But that didn't happen. I was delighted to see you, of course, because... At that point, Persnickel woke up, grunted and hurried over to Max. He wants a treat, I said. I'll fetch a bit of carrot for you to give him. When I walked back into the room, Max was looking surprised. Why is there a paddy melon here? I quickly filled him in, but he didn't appear to be listening. I have no idea why I told you all that, he said. Please don't tell anyone else. It's all supposed to be hush-hush. Something else I'm not supposed to tell you is that the vet's computer had words which could be construed as a suicide note on the screen. He pulled out his phone and showed me a photo of the computer. I sneaked in and looked through the evidence after you told me that they suspected you. He held out his phone. The victim's computer screen displayed the words, I've realised I can't take it any more." in a word doc. I won't tell anyone, I said. I won't tell them about The Bachelor either. I did my best not to giggle. Max rubbed his forehead. I have no idea why I said that. He held up both hands, palms upwards in exasperation. You're no doubt under a lot of stress. Are you sure you'd like some coffee? Wouldn't you rather have some wine? Max smiled appreciatively. Wine would be nice. I made my way into the kitchen when there was another knock on the door. I wasn't expecting any visitors, and I felt somewhat uneasy. I hurried to the door and opened it to see a tall, thin man wearing a tight suit and a pinched expression. I'm looking for Detective Max Grayson. Oh, yes, he's in here, I said. I'm an arrogant person with a very high opinion of myself, the man said. I watch love actually every Christmas and cry. When my wife goes out with her friends, I try on her clothes. Blackly suits me. Anyway, what are you doing here, Grayson? The man's tone was bordering on belligerent. Miss Bloom is a friend of mine, Max said. I wondered why he sounded defensive rather than shocked by the man's admissions. The man crossed his arms over his chest. Did I interrupt something? He addressed the question to me. I was quite puzzled. No, Detective Grayson saw me at the police station earlier today and offered to take me home because my car was here. I was upset, so he said he would check back later to see if I was all right. How neighbourly of him, the man said with more than a little sarcasm. Grayson, will you come with me? It was more of an order than a question. Max shot me a sheepish look and followed him out the door. Chapter 5 I had spent a restless night wondering what was going on with Max. Why had he left with the mysterious man? It made no sense. I tossed and turned all night and woke up feeling tired. I staggered into the kitchen, fed Persnickel, who was just as grumpy in the mornings as I was, and then switched on the coffee machine. I found Paddy asleep in Persnickel's wombat bed and fed him too. Two coffees later, I was ready to face the day. Persnickel appeared to have grown accustomed to Paddy riding on his back, although he did emit weary wombat sighs at intervals. I had texted Oleander to bring her up to speed with how Paddy was doing, and she had asked me to come over. I dressed Persnickel in his therapy wombat blanket. At the sight of the blanket, he danced from one foot to the other, knowing he was going for a ride in the car. Paddy didn't seem upset to be left home alone. In fact, he seemed pleased to have the wombat bed all to himself. When I reached the parking area of the East Bucklebury Retirement Home, the security guard stopped me. Athanasius and Oleander are waiting for you, Goldie, he said. After the recent murder of the residence manager, the retirement home had employed a security guard to screen all visitors. Athanasius opened the door for me to get out. 
and then helped Persnickel out of his seat. I used to be quite a man about town in my day, Athanasius said. I was always one with the ladies. Of course I was a good boy after I got married, and I never did any embezzling or anything like that. I probably would have made quite a good homicidal maniac, because many people irritated me, though it never came to that. I have hair growing out of my ears. Oleander and I exchanged glances, and then Oleander said, I've had problems with my bowels. I think I might be gluten intolerant. It all started thirty years ago, and I thought it was because I couldn't digest chickpeas and nuts. But the problems with my bowels continued. Why, sometimes... I held up a hand to forestall her. Stop. I think I know what's happening. I did a truth spell. Athanasius and Oleander exchanged glances. You did a what? Athanasius asked me. I slapped myself on the side of my head. How could I have been so silly? It's only just dawned on me. What exactly has dawned on you? Oleander said. You had better come to my apartment and explain. It's like I said in my text. The police did gunshot residue tests on me, but they said the results would take a week or so. I said, ever since the time the detectives arrested you and threw you in the Southport Watch House, Oleander, I was afraid they would do the same to me. I don't think I would be able to last out a week. That's why I did the truth spell, so the murderer would come to light, and soon. Athanasius rubbed his chin. I don't suppose you followed the first rule of witchcraft, that is, to be completely specific. I was shamefaced. Um, no, perhaps I wasn't specific enough. You know, Max and the man who came for him last night both said lots of things I thought very strange at the time. Why didn't I realize this before? It's obvious now. Everything is obvious in hindsight, Athanasius said sagely. Oleander agreed. But don't you see, Goldie, this is good. It means the murderer will tell you the truth as well. Persnickel had found some flowering fuchsia bushes, and I had a devil of a job to pull his head out of them. Persnickel, stop that, I said. You've already had your breakfast. Athanasius came to my aid. Persnickel, I have a lemon tart. At the sound of the promised tart, Persnickel whipped his head around like lightning and almost bowled Athanasius over. Athanasius fed him the tart and said, Where was I? Yes, the only trouble is we don't know who the suspects are. Oleander nodded. Let's brainstorm on that when we get to my apartment. Athanasius and Oleander both owned independent living apartments at the East Bucklebury Retirement Home. Oleander's apartment was on the east side of the home, along with all the other independent living apartments. But Athanasius bought a former staff member's apartment, and it was in the same complex as the assisted living section. It was to Oleander's apartment we were now heading. To my dismay, we happened across Harriet Hemsworth, brandishing pruning shears and bending over a patch of overgrown daisies. She beamed when she saw us. Oh, I didn't know there was a therapy wombat session today. I shook my head. There isn't. I'm just bringing Persnickel for an outing to see Athanasius and Oleander. Her face fell. Did I ever tell you I was a naturopath? She began. I quickly said, yes, you told us all about it. Undaunted, she pushed on. I have a bad case of hemorrhoids. Did you know Napoleon had hemorrhoids? That's why some people say he lost the Battle of Waterloo, because he couldn't sit on his horse for too long. Still, I saw his old desk chair in an episode of Escape from the Country, and that chair was as hard as a rock. Surely what they say about him can't be true, because he'd have needed to sit on a cushion. I have to sit on a cushion, a soft ring cushion. What do you think of that? I muttered something and made to walk away, but she reached out her hand and dug her bony fingers into my arm. I have terrible gas. At first I thought it was from eating cabbages, but I don't know now. It just doesn't stop. 
It's embarrassing because I don't know when it will happen and everyone looks at me. I always blame the woman sitting next to me or I blame Josephine Gatz. Everyone thinks it's Josephine, but it's me. She bent down and pointed to her feet. And I haven't clipped my toenails in years. It's a wonder they don't curl over. I keep thinking I should go for a pedicure, but I'm sure they'd frighten those ladies who do them. I did try to take scissors to my toenails once, but they were just too hard to cut. Like old boots they were. Um, that's nice. I said over my shoulder as Athanasius and Oleander pulled me away from her. Thank goodness Harriet hadn't shown us her ghastly book that contained graphic photos of every manner of disease from her naturopath days. When we reached Oleander's apartment, I pulled a thermos from my big shoulder bag. Coffee. Both Athanasius and Oleander shrieked in delight. Why don't you put Persnickel out in the courtyard to stretch his legs? Oleander said, I didn't think it a good idea. Are you sure there's nothing he can eat out there? No, I think those plants are quite safe from him. I haven't weeded the garden lately, so the weeds are fair game. It would be good if he could eat them. Now, to business, Athanasius said, sitting on one of the sofas and indicating that we should too. Goldie, you think the police suspect you? I nodded. It's that super irritating detective power. He arrested Oleander without any solid evidence, and I'm worried the same thing will happen to me. After all, I found the body. Athanasius nodded solemnly. Now, who was that woman that you said was there soon after? Georgia Garrison, the vet nurse, I said. She arrived at the clinic not long after I did, but like I said in my text, I saw the vet's body and just about as soon as I laid eyes on him, she came into the room. Athanasius raised his bushy eyebrows. Did she appear genuinely upset? I nodded. She seemed genuinely shocked and distraught, and if she was acting, then she should win an Oscar. We shouldn't discount her, nevertheless, Oleander said, tapping her chin. Didn't you say the police initially said it was suicide? Yes, that's what was strange. At first, Power said it was suicide, and then he was acting like it was a murder investigation. Athanasius set down his empty coffee mug, and I refilled it from my thermos. Perhaps there was a note left or something. In other words, perhaps the murderer tried to make it look like suicide, but the police weren't taken in by it. I couldn't tell them about the note on the computer screen, because Max had told me that in confidence. It must have been quite obviously not suicide if Detective Power figured out it was murder. I pulled a face. And you didn't see anyone else driving down the road when you arrived? I shook my head. I didn't see a single car, not even the vets. I expect he parked around the back, but if someone had driven away after I'd got there, then Georgia would have seen them. The vet clinic is right on the edge of town, but it does back onto some walking tracks, Oleander pointed out. A fit person could have jogged there and then jogged away again. I groaned. There are a lot of fit people in town at the moment, what with the big run coming up, I said. In fact, that's what all started it. Is there any more coffee? Oleander asked me. Before I could answer, she poured herself some more from the thermos. Yes, you told me all about the Norwegians. They weren't Norwegians, they were Dutch, I told her. But I thought you said they were dressed in orange. Isn't orange the national colour of the Norwegians? I shook my head. No, orange is the Dutch colour. But their flag isn't orange, Oleander said, clearly confused. Orange is their national sporting colour, I told her. They're in town en masse at the local health resort, having raw juices and colonics. Both Athanasius and Oleander sniggered. I can't see why one of those Dutch people would have done it, I continued. They haven't been in town long, not long enough to develop any sort of dislike for the vet. Who did dislike the vet? Did he charge a lot or something? 
There wouldn't be many vets left in Australia if they were murdered over the size of the vet bills, Athanasius pointed out. I suspect that's not the motive. Oleander leapt to her feet. I know, the disgruntled dog owner. I was startled. What? Oleander sat down again. She's complained about the vet for the last month. She took her dog to the vet. He misdiagnosed him and the dog nearly died. She held up both hands in a gesture of reassurance. Don't worry, the dog is fine now, because she took him to a vet in Southport who completely healed him. But he had some genetic disorder. I forget what it was. Not peritonitis. It starts with a P. I know, pancreatitis. The Southport vet said he has to take tablets with every meal. But the local vet misdiagnosed him and thought it was something else entirely, so he could have died. This woman was absolutely furious about it. She's told everyone who will listen. But would that be a motive for murder? I asked her. Athanasius folded his arms across his chest. I don't think so, given that the dog turned out all right. Still... She was absolutely furious with Dr. Chase Evans, and to make matters worse, even though he misdiagnosed the dog and nearly caused the poor dog's demise, he still charged her a hefty price for his treatment, and threatened to take her to court if she didn't pay. So he wasn't nice then, I asked him. If he did it to her, then likely he did it to other people too. Both Athanasius and Oleander nodded. Quite possibly. I think we need to speak with the disgruntled dog owner, Oleander said. She's the only suspect we have to date, apart from the vet nurse, Georgia Garrison. There's that male nurse as well, so we'll put him on our list of suspects. There must be other suspects, so we need to find out if anyone else had a grudge against the vet. And Goldie, you need to take Persnickel to the vet clinic to try to speak with the vet's ghost. Once more that morning, I slapped myself on the side of my head. You're kidding. Both of them were surprised at my outburst, so I added, You know, I hadn't even thought of that. Honestly, I don't know what's wrong with me. That should have been the first thing I thought of. Oleander leant forward and patted my knee. You've had a lot on your mind, Goldie. And speaking of a lot on your mind, what did Max Grayson confess to you? She winked at me as she said it. My spirits fell. Nothing like that. He didn't confess any feelings for me, if that's what you're thinking. Oleander pulled a face. Oh, I'm sorry, Goldie. I sighed long and hard. He was interrupted by Persnickel, I suppose. He just told me stuff about work. Boring stuff about how he went to work and got his stapler. Nothing interesting. All the more reason why you should speak with suspects as soon as you can, Athanasius said. We have no idea how long this truth spell will work. And if you can speak with the murderer soon, that person might confess. Oleander rubbed her hands together. That's exactly right, Athanasius. Do you have anything else to do right now, Goldie? I shook my head, so she pushed on. All right, then. Let's go and visit the disgruntled dog owner. She lives alone, and I know she will be pleased to have visitors. Chapter 6 We'll just wing it, Oleander said, as I drove us all to the disgruntled dog owner's house. Oleander had informed me that said woman's name was Mabel Wraith. To tell you the truth, that doesn't give me much confidence, I said to Oleander. I would feel better if we had some sort of a concrete plan. Like what? Oleander asked me. I shrugged, so she added, There you go, in a triumphant tone. Mabel Wraith lived in a part of town I hadn't seen before. We drove through cane fields and then down a dirt lane, to an unremarkable, semi-dilapidated blue building. When we got out of the car and made to open the front gate, several Maltese terriers barked viciously at us. 
I was glad I had taken Persnickel home first and set him in front of the television. A crotchety-looking woman stormed out the gate, waving her walking stick at us. What do you want? She screeched angrily, but her face changed when she saw Oleander. Oleander, what brings you here? I wondered what Oleander would say. After all, it was her idea to wing it, so I was glad she was the one put on the spot. I thought you'd be interested to know that my friend Goldie here was the one who found the vet's body. I thought you wouldn't mind hearing a bit of gossip. Mabel's face lit up. Come in. I was just about to have some walnut cake. I was relieved that we were welcomed, but I was not so relieved when Oleander hissed in my ear, Don't eat anything, whatever you do. As soon as I walked in the door, the unpleasant smell of damp hit me, probably because the floor joists were likely rotted. Black mould and signs of rising damp adorned the walls, the odour even overcoming the pungent smell of dog. It looked like an episode of one of those shows where people try to help the worst of hoarders. The place was chock-a-block full, from floor to ceiling, with every manner of object, from china ornaments in overfilled china cabinets to cardboard boxes of indeterminate items. Take a seat if you can find one, Mabel said with a crooked smile. Athanasius moved some cardboard boxes aside so we could sit on the three-seater sofa. I'll make us a nice cup of tea and fetch the walnut cake. Don't go to any trouble on our account, Oleander said hurriedly. We don't want to intrude and take advantage of your hospitality. Mabel waved a hand in dismissal. It's no trouble at all. I'll just put the walnut cake in the microwave. It's been in the fridge for a year or so. Oleander shot me a warning look. I grimaced while trying to breathe. The stench was overpowering. I wondered why Mabel hadn't opened some windows, but maybe she was immune to the frightful odour. Mabel presently returned with a tray, on top of which were three cups of black tea. I heard that dreadful vet was dead, Mabel said. I thought about killing him myself. I'm not sorry he's dead, given that he overcharged people. I'm surprised no one has killed him before, she added all the while waving her hands angrily. I make walnut cakes and put some in the freezer and then forget they're there. Sometimes when I thaw them out, there's mould on them. Who'd have thought? I thought freezing things would stop mould forming, but no. You have some. I'm not going to have any in case it makes me sick. I don't want to end up in hospital with food poisoning, but you go ahead and help yourselves. I wanted to ask her if she had murdered the vet, but I couldn't get a word in edgeways. He was a nasty man, she pushed on. He could have murdered my poor puddles. Any fool could have diagnosed that poor puddles had pancreatitis, but not that idiot vet. I'm a pensioner and I can't afford all those dreadful bills, but do you think he cared? No, he didn't. She looked around the room before continuing. You know, I thought about murdering my husband. He was a most unpleasant man. He smoked incessantly and made me quite sick. I asked him not to smoke in the house, but all he did was scream at me. I couldn't outright murder him, but he had high cholesterol, so I served him lots of bacon and eggs for breakfast every morning. He thought I was being nice to him, but I was actually trying to kill him. And it worked, you know. Eventually, he had a heart attack and died. That's when I got my dogs. He didn't like dogs, you see. At least no one can accuse me of being a crazy cat lady, because I don't have cats. I only have dogs. She burst into a manic laugh. Go on, help yourselves to the cake. I can't see any mould on it. I did look to see if there was any mould on it. I was going to cut the mouldy pieces off so you wouldn't see it. Of course, if there was mould on the ends, it would go right through it. But I didn't care. I don't like people, you see. I'm an animal person. People can take their own chances as far as I'm concerned. But animals can't look after themselves, the poor things. Help yourselves to some cake. 
Oh, I gave you all black tea. Would anyone like some milk? It's well past its use-by date, but I think it's harmless. I tipped a bit in the sink and it didn't curdle or anything like that. We all assured her the black tea was fine. I hoped like crazy she didn't have a graphic medical condition because I couldn't bear hearing anything else. If only I had been more careful with my truth spell. I opened my mouth to ask if she had killed the vet, but she pushed on in a loud voice. I stole some dog treats from the supermarket once. No one saw me. It made me quite afraid. But if they caught me, I was going to say I'd put them in my handbag by mistake. I only did it once, mind you. I felt guilty for about a day, and then I got over it. I spent so much money at the local supermarket and pay their inflated prices, so I thought that would be fine. Do you have any idea who killed Chase Evans? Oleander said, but she had to talk over the top of Mabel to make herself heard. Mabel tapped her chin with one stubby finger for some time before answering. He had loose morals. What do you mean? I asked her. I don't like to speak ill of the dead, but he was a man about town, if you get my meaning. She winked at me. Do you mean he was having affairs? I asked her. Was he married? She nodded. Yes, he was married, and so was his main girlfriend, Georgia. I gasped. Georgia Garrison, the vet nurse. Chase Evans was having an affair with her. Mabel nodded solemnly. Yes, he sure was. No wonder she was so upset, I said to myself. To Mabel, I said, do you think she would have had a reason to murder him? Mabel shrugged. Do I look like a detective? How should I know? I just know he had loose morals, so if he was having an affair with one married woman, then he could have been having an affair with others. Maybe Georgia found out. Maybe he tried to break it off with her so she had to do away with him. That was one revelation after another. I had no idea Georgia was married. Was Chase Evans having an affair with the other vet nurse too? I asked her. She laughed, showing a full set of long yellow teeth. No, he wasn't gay. The other vet nurse is a man, Adrian Young. He's married too. I had forgotten that the other vet nurse was a man. Can you think of anyone else who might have wanted to kill him? Athanasius asked her. I refuse to talk any more until you all eat some cake, she said. I had no desire to have my stomach pumped, so I took a piece of cake from her and when she wasn't looking, thrust it in my pocket. I noticed Athanasius and Oleander were doing the same. Mabel did not appear to notice because she pushed on. I assume the murderer was a woman he was having an affair with, or her husband, or a person he'd ripped off in the vet clinic, or maybe one of his running buddies. He ran, I asked her. She nodded. He was training for the upcoming East Buckleberry races, you know, the one all the Norwegians are in town for. I was going to tell her they were Dutch, but Oleander put a warning hand on my knee. Maybe he upset someone in the running club, Mabel said. Or maybe he upset the Norwegians. Maybe his best friend did away with him. Thanks, you've been ever so helpful, Oleander said as she stood. You haven't drunk your tea, Mabel protested. You can't go until you drink your tea. I'll just go out and fetch the bowl of sugar. I looked around for a potted plant so I could empty the tea into it but Oleander hissed at me. Pour it onto the floor. I stared at her in amazement. Are you crazy? I can't tip tea onto her carpet. Oleander pointed to the carpet. For the first time, I realized it was dreadfully stained. I shuddered at the sight. It dawned on me why the dog was called Puddles. She won't notice it, trust me, Oleander said, tipping her tea onto the carpet. Athanasius did likewise, so I followed suit. I had to admit the tea didn't make a difference to the colour of the carpet. Those Maltese terriers were obviously never let out for bathroom privileges. My stomach churned. Oh, you have finished your tea, 
Mabel said with clear disappointment. I thought you might like some sugar. None of us take sugar, but thank you for your hospitality, Oleander said. I'll just give you a walnut cake to take home. I've got a spare one in my freezer. Mabel vanished and soon returned with something that looked like it contained chemical weapons of mass destruction. I'm sure the CIA would have liked to have seized it, because it seemed to be overflowing with toxins. Oleander took it gingerly. Luckily, it was tightly wrapped in plastic. We all thanked Mabel and beat a hasty retreat. Chapter 7 Oleander had talked me into going home to collect Persnickel to take him to the vet clinic. She was sure I would be able to speak with the ghost of the deceased vet. We took a detour first to throw the walnut cake into the nearest public rubbish bin. Although I wanted to clear my name, I wasn't too keen to speak with the vet's ghost because I was worried the detectives would catch me on the premises and think I was up to no good. As we drove up the road to the vet clinic, my fears appeared to be ungrounded. There were no cars in sight. What will I tell the detectives if they turn up? I asked Oleander. She pursed her lips and then said, We'll think of something on the spur of the moment. I groaned. I'd never been a girl guide, but I always liked to be prepared. Oleander gave me a little push. Go on, take Persnickel out for a walk and see if the ghost appears to you. Aren't you coming with me? I asked her. She shook her head. No, I found from experience that newly deceased ghosts are often shy. I frowned at that. I had no idea she had experience with speaking to ghosts, but I wasn't about to question her now. Come on, I encouraged Persnickel, and he followed me around to the back of the building. I came to a stop outside the window where I had found the body. Hello, is anyone there? I said, feeling somewhat foolish. Nothing happened, not so much as a shimmer. Is anyone there? I called again, more loudly this time. Oleander appeared around the corner. Don't draw attention to yourself, Goldie, she said. I'm sure ghosts aren't deaf. I shrugged. He hasn't shown up yet. She waved one hand at me. I'll go away again, and you wait here for a few more minutes. He might still be coming to terms with being a ghost. Okay. I checked the time on my phone. I would give it five minutes, and then I would leave. A minute or so later, the ghost appeared. He looked around him and then stared at me. I'm dead, aren't I? I nodded. Yes, sorry about that. Aren't I supposed to see a white light or something? I shrugged. I'm not an expert, but I think so. Maybe you have to find out who murdered you first. You didn't commit suicide or anything, did you? The ghost appeared shocked. No way. Is that what they said happened? I shook my head. The police did say that at first, but now they're investigating it as a homicide. Did you see who did it? The ghost shimmered before once more taking full form. It was all such a shock. I can't believe someone murdered me. It's too hard to believe. I feel like I'm in a bad dream and I'm going to wake up. Do you know who did it? I pressed him. No, they shot me from behind, he said. I was disappointed. You don't have a clue? He rubbed his eyes with both hands. No. Well, I'm trying to solve your murder, I said. Can you tell me everything you remember? He bit his lip. I was in my office and got up to stretch my legs. I looked out the window because I heard some runners going past, and that was the last thing I remember. You didn't hear anyone else? He shook his head. No. Did you? I began, but he vanished. I waited for a few more moments, but he didn't show. I called out again, more quietly than last time, but he didn't reappear. I gave up and made my way back to Oleander and Athanasius and relayed what had happened. I wanted to ask him more questions, I concluded. Oleander patted my shoulder. You'll have to bring Persnickel back to speak with him again. The vet might remember more after some time. 
Right now, he's no doubt settling into accepting the fact that he's dead. At least he confirmed that he didn't commit suicide, I said. Athanasius nodded. There is that. See, it wasn't a complete waste of time. I pulled a face. Only he didn't have a clue who did it. I also wanted to ask him for a list of suspects, because he would obviously know who had something against him. Do you think I should wait around a bit longer? Oleander shook her head. No, I doubt he'll appear again today. I wonder if the runners heard anything. If they did, they would have reported it to the police, Athanasius pointed out. I bit my lip. You know, it was altogether too convenient that Georgia Garrison wasn't in the office when he was murdered. Maybe the murderer was just hanging around awaiting his or her opportunity, Oleander said. Or maybe she did it. Perhaps she wanted him to leave his wife for her and he refused. So in a fit of jealousy, she grabbed a gun and shot him. I said, how can we find out what sort of gun it was? We can't, Oleander said. And there are a lot of farmers around here and all of them have rifles. I clapped my hands. That's it. Won't they do a ballistics report or something? Then they can go to all the suspects and check their guns against the ballistics report. I'm afraid it won't be that simple, Goldie, Athanasius said. I'm sure the murderer has already thought of that. The murderer wouldn't have used his or her own gun, rest assured. My face fell. We've made no inroads into this investigation at all. A lemon tart, Athanasius said, pulling one from his backpack. They make everything seem all right. Don't be disheartened. We've only just started this investigation. We know that Chase Evans was having an affair with the vet nurse, and so perhaps his wife did it. As for the suspects, we have Georgia Garrison, her husband, and the other vet nurse, Adrian Young. That is, I don't know if Georgia is married, so perhaps she doesn't have a husband, and Mabel was wrong. Nevertheless, it is no cause for alarm, because even without a possible husband there, we still have four suspects. I was hoping Mabel would confess if she did it, I said, but she simply went on and on confessing other things. Maybe she did do it, maybe she didn't, Athanasius said. What she told us doesn't present evidence either way, I'm sorry to say. The only one who can help us is Georgia Garrison. I think we need to speak with her next. I nodded. That's a good idea, but what are we going to say to her? We can't just go up to her and fire questions at her. Oleander waved her finger at me. I don't think you need to worry about that. I know you're worried the police suspect you, but she'd have to be an equal suspect in their eyes. She tapped her chin. If not equal, then a close second. You can approach her and say that you're trying to solve the case because the police suspect you. I'm sure she'd be happy to help. I do hope you're right, I said. What's the worst that can happen? Athanasius said. She might be rude to you and ask you to leave. It won't be the end of the world. I smiled. True. Okay, then, I'll question Georgia. And at some point we need to speak to the victim's wife. Yes, but... Oleander began, but her face froze in horror. I turned around and followed her gaze, only to see a police vehicle approach. Oh, no, I groaned. Detective Power and Detective Walters jumped out of the car. What are you doing here, Ms. Bloom? Power demanded. My wombat is scared of vets, I said, and I'm trying to do immersion therapy. What's that? Walters asked me. You know, it's like if a woman is afraid of heights, you take her up to the top of a tall building and make her look over, I said. Detective Power flinched, and I suspected he had a fear of heights. What's that got to do with your wombat? He barked. Persnickel was quite distraught about visiting the vet clinic yesterday. I told him, Athanasius Oleander and I decided we should bring him here when no one was in attendance at the vet surgery to get him used to the building and to see that nothing scary was going to happen to him and feed him carrot treats. I pulled a piece of carrot from my pocket as I spoke and handed it to Persnickel. Power narrowed his eyes. I could see he didn't believe me, but he seemed to be at a loss as to how to respond. All right, then, on your way. 
and no more interfering with police business. I was about to ask how we were possibly interfering with police business, but Oleander put a firm hand on the small of my back and ushered me forward. I was about to say something uncomplimentary about the detective as I was driving away when I heard a message on my phone. I pressed the play button on my car Bluetooth and the disembodied voice read out the text. Funeral on tomorrow. The screen said the text was from Max. That was all he had to say. Chapter 8 I had heard the East Bucklebury Health Resort was a gated estate, and I knew I should have called ahead, so I was relieved that the tall wooden gates were wide open. Maybe the runners from the Netherlands were out on another training run. I was there with a big box of chocolates and a bunch of cash to give to the runner whose shoe Persnickel had devoured. I drove through the gates slowly. For some reason, the idea of a health resort filled me with fear. I was afraid they could somehow sense how much wine and coffee I usually imbibed, not to mention my general diet. The place was beautiful, I had to admit. Lush lawns gave way to a magnificent wooden building behind a large glistening pool. People were lounging around the pool while others were doing yoga on one of the lawns. Beautiful Australian native birds, resplendent in vivid shades of red and green, adorned the small shrubs dotted over the lawns. I made my way back to my car and headed for a sign pointing to reception. A slim yet well-muscled woman looked up when she saw me. She smiled, flashing a row of stunningly white teeth. I was glad I was wearing my sunglasses. Hello, I began, but she interrupted me. Welcome to the East Fucklebury Spa Resort and Colonics Centre, she said. Are you here to book for the fasting days? I clutched my throat. Fasting? I squeaked. No, no, I'm not. I'm here. Once more, she interrupted me. I can see you're not here for our weight loss retreat, but you clearly need a course of colonics. I backed away from the desk. Why would you say that? I asked, affronted. If you don't mind my saying so, it's your hair, she said. We do hair testing here, and by the look of your hair, it's clear you have toxins in your system, such as lead and mercury, possibly arsenic. I was tempted to tell her it was a wig, but then I would have to explain why I was wearing one. So I simply said, I'm not here to book at all. My wombat ate a running shoe belonging to one of the running group from the Netherlands, and I wanted to come here and pay him. The woman's jaw dropped open. Clearly, she was having trouble processing my simple remark. I'm sorry, I didn't understand anything you said, she admitted. I have a pet wombat, I told her. He hates the colour orange. When the Dutch people were running past my house, my wombat saw they were all wearing orange, so he chased them. He managed to catch the slowest runner. He knocked him over and then proceeded to eat one of his shoes. Does that make sense? No, um, yes, she attempted to frown. What can I do for you? I'm simply here to pay the man for another pair of running shoes, I told her. I see. She seemed relieved by my statement. Do you know his name? No, but he's one of the Netherlands running group, I said with forced patience. Can you tell me where they are now? She pursed her lips. I'm sorry, but we can't have non-guests wandering around the premises. I rubbed my forehead. This was not going at all well. I have no wish to wander around your premises, trust me, I said through clenched teeth. I simply need to find this man and hand him over some money. I can't imagine he's brought a second pair of shoes with him to another country, and since my wombat destroyed his shoes, I'm the one who should pay for another pair. What is that box under your arm? She asked me, narrowing her eyes. I've brought him a box of chocolates as well. She snatched them so quickly I did not have time to react. Chocolates are forbidden. Could I speak with someone else? I asked hopefully, and then added more forcefully, I'll need those chocolates back when I leave. I thought she would object, but she seemed quite pleased to pass me over to someone else. Come with me, 
she said with an obvious measure of relief. She took me back outside and around a circular pool that had some sort of a fountain in it. It looked like the fountain pool from the Playboy Mansion. Not that I had ever been there, mind you. Some people were sitting under purple umbrellas, sipping green drinks. It was certainly a color clash, and by the way they pursed their lips, they were not enjoying their drinks. I imagined it was probably blended celery and cucumber. I was glad no one had offered me one. The woman led me over a little wooden bridge and under some frangipanis to where people were doing tai chi. At least, I think it was tai chi, but for all I knew it could have been pilates or yoga. She guided me past those people to a woman in a white suit. This lady wants to pay one of the Dutch guys for his shoes, she said. I shook my head. That's not quite right. The woman in the white suit looked me up and down. Are you here for a cologne? I shook my head, but before I could speak, she said, In your case, I must suggest a course of cologne. Your hair has an unnatural sheen to it. You don't know the half of it, I muttered. More loudly, I said, I'm not here to be a victim. Oops, sorry, I mean a guest. I'm here because my wombat ate a running shoe belonging to one of your Dutch guests, and I'm here to pay him for a new pair of shoes. She exchanged glances with the first woman. Did you mention a wombat? I nodded. My name is Goldie Bloom. I have a pet wombat named Persnickel. He hates the color orange. He chased the Dutch runners when they were running past my house. He managed to catch the slowest one, and he ate his orange shoe. Is that clear? No, not at all, the woman said. Why are you here? I tried to make it as simple as I could. I am responsible for the destruction of one of the Dutch runner's shoes. I am here to give him some money so he can buy another pair of shoes. Does that make sense? The woman nodded. Perfect sense. Why didn't you say so the first time? Simone, take her to the Dutch runner's. Simone looked quite put out. But, but, she sputtered, but the other woman waved her arm. Hurry along, Simone. I'm about to take the meditation class. The Dutch people are in the juice bar. I followed a rather put out Simone back through the grounds, and we went into a different part of the building. This was absolutely luxurious. Gorgeous vanilla scented candles adorned the room. The expensive white furniture contrasted beautifully with the polished wooden floors and walls. The wide glass windows afforded a beautiful view of the lush lawns and tropical gardens. For a moment, I almost thought it would be worth coming here, until I rounded the corner and came upon the juice bar. Two women were drinking the familiar green juice and clutching their throats. Come on, drink it up, it's good for you, Simone urged them. But I don't like the taste of blended cucumber and celery, one woman complained. You need an alkaline system, Simone said. If you drink lots of this, you won't need so many colonics. Without any further exhortation, both women held their noses and downed their glasses in one gulp. I walked past them to the bar, where the Dutch runners were sitting drinking red juice. They all looked happy. Considering they were all wearing orange, I was glad I hadn't brought Persnickel with me, not that he would have been allowed in such a place. When they saw me, they did a double take. It is her, the closest Dutch person said. I pulled out the cash and held it in front of me. I'm so sorry about your shoe, I said to the crowd. I couldn't tell which one the victim was, considering they were all wearing orange and were all about the same age. Which one of you, um, had the eaten shoe? One of them stepped forward. It was me, wild Australian woman, he said. Your monster ate my shoe. I hurried to apologize. I'm so dreadfully sorry, I said. Here is some money to replace your shoe. But I will need two shoes, he said in a plaintive tone. I nodded vigorously. Of course, of course. Will this be enough money to pay for a pair of shoes? He raised his eyebrows. Two shoes? I nodded. Will this be enough money to buy two shoes? He looked at the money and then looked at the man standing next to him. He took the money and flipped through it and then said, 
Yes, good amount of money. He grabbed my hand and shook it enthusiastically. Thank you, wild Australian woman. You're welcome, I said. I made to go, but someone tapped my arm. Could we please have a selfie with you? I thought that a strange request, but complied. After all, I was relieved that the man hadn't pressed charges, what with Persnickel knocking him down and eating his shoe. I posed with each Dutch runner in turn, and then walked back to Simone. Could you show me the way back to the parking area from here? I asked. And I must get those chocolates. She was staring at me strangely. Are you all right? She nodded. Can I have your autograph? I thought I had misheard, so I said, I'm sorry, what did you say? Can I have your autograph? I'm so sorry, I didn't recognize you at first. I can see now you're wearing a wig. My hand flew to my hair. Yes, I am, but I'm not sure what you mean by not recognizing me. Have we ever met? You don't know. She looked at me askance. But you're an internet sensation. I'm sorry, you must have me mixed up with someone else, I said with a shrug. I'm a little bit disorientated as to the layout of this facility as it's so big. May I have my chocolates back and then can you direct me to the car park? I'll take you there in person, she gushed, but please give me your autograph. Sure. Clearly the woman was crazed and wasn't going to let me out of there until I gave her an autograph. I pulled a notepad from my handbag along with a pen and scrawled, Best wishes, Goldie Bloom, and handed it to the woman. Thank you, she said when I handed it to her. Can we have a selfie? Sure. Clearly this woman had had one too many celery juices and one too many colonics. What a shame you're not wearing your green mask and the rollers in your hair. I went cold all over. How did you know about that? You're an internet sensation, she said again. She took a step back and shot me a long, hard look. You really don't know, do you? It's all over YouTube and it's gone viral. My breath caught in my throat. What do you mean? Come with me. I followed her back to the reception desk, where she fished an iPad out from under the counter. She tapped the screen and then slid the iPad across the desk to me. The first thing I saw was the heading, Wild Australian Mud Woman with Native Monster Attacking Runner. It showed a picture of me chasing Persnickel, who was chasing the runner. For all the world, it looked like I was chasing the runner. My green, French green clay mask was thickly plastered all over my face, and most of the rollers had already fallen off, leaving bits of hair sticking out. I put my face in my hands. I can't believe it, I can't believe it, I moaned. I told you, it's gone viral, she said. It's had over 50 million views. She took the iPad back and tapped away at the screen. What are you doing? I asked her. I was simply mortified. I'm just typing your name in the comments, she said. Everyone will be thrilled to know your name. The room spun, and I thought I would faint. Chapter 9 Sorry, what did you say? We were back in Oleander's apartment. I was distracted, wondering what had happened to Max. Apart from the brief text, I hadn't heard from him. But then again, I hadn't really expected to do so. I asked if you had any ideas as to how you could approach Georgia Garrison, Oleander said. I must admit I'm fresh out of ideas, Athanasius added. Well, since the vet clinic has shut down until it's sold to a new vet, I don't know where I would find her. At her house, of course, Oleander said. I shook my head. I don't feel comfortable going to her house. What would I say to her? Oleander rubbed her forehead. That's precisely what we are trying to figure out. We all lapsed into silence once more. Oleander was the first to speak. I know. Why don't you tell her that you lost a charm from your charm bracelet at the vet clinic and ask her to contact you if she finds it? I thought that sounded quite tenuous and said so. For a start, I don't have a charm bracelet. 
and wouldn't she find it strange that I went to her house to ask that? I said. Not at all. Athanasius shook his head vigorously. It's a small town and all that. Everyone knows everyone else, so she wouldn't think it at all strange that you went to her house. Oleander chimed in. Especially not over something as valuable as a charm bracelet. She jumped to her feet and waved her finger at me. I'll be right back. Oleander returned with a heavy gold bracelet, which she pushed onto my wrist before I could object. Say you're missing a heart charm. Tell her it has great sentimental value or something like that. This makes me uneasy, I admitted. What if she's annoyed with me? And what if she says she will look for the charm bracelet, but doesn't tell me anything else about the vet? It will be up to you to keep the conversation going, Oleander said. I shook my head. I'm not good at that sort of thing, I told her. I just can't blurt out questions such as asking her if the vet had any enemies now, can I? Whatever works. Athanasius looked up at me and smiled. And so minutes later, I was driving to George's house, having left Persnickel in the care of Athanasius and Oleander. The house was a pretty shade of blue-green, which contrasted rather horribly with the alternating cream and mission brown pickets on the front fence and the chartreuse colour-bond fence that ran the length of the driveway. There was a car in her driveway, so I figured she was home. This seemed like a bad idea to me, but if the alternative was spending a few days in the Southport watch house, then I was going to have to tighten my resolve and go through with it. I walked to the door, the charm bracelet jangling. The house had been renovated rather nicely. The outdoor furniture was set off by the wide verandas with their polished boards. I inhaled the heady scent of jasmine. I knocked once and heard movement inside. Presently the door opened. You, she said. It wasn't quite the welcome I had been hoping for. I launched straight into my speech. So sorry to bother you, Georgia, but I've discovered I lost my heart charm from my charm bracelet. I lifted up my arm and jangled the charm bracelet in front of her face. I'm really distressed that I lost it. She opened the door wider. Does it have sentimental value? It sure does, I said. Do you know the price of gold per ounce right now? I lost it somewhere at the clinic. I was hoping you could keep an eye out for it. Okay. I was afraid she was going to shut the door, and I was going to have to blurt out a question. But to my surprise, she invited me inside. Come in. The polished floorboards inside were less attractive and darker than their exterior counterparts. One wall was painted dark green, and heavy cream curtains hung beside the opened windows. I sat on the old, cracked vinyl sofa, narrowly managing to avoid several cats stretched out across the length of it. One of them, a chinchilla, fixed me with a steely glare for daring to sit in his spot. Beautiful, I said. They're all rescues, she said. Would you like a cold drink? Yes, please. When Georgia returned, she handed me a tall glass of lemonade. You'd never met Chase Evans before, had you? No, never, I said. She looked me up and down. I suppose you didn't kill him then. I was shocked at her forthright manner, but said, No, did you? She, in turn, looked shocked. But she said, I was having an affair with him. I knew it would hurt his wife if she found out. But to tell you the truth, I didn't care. I've never put myself first. I had to look after both my parents before they passed away after long illnesses. So thought it was about time I put myself first. I was in love with him, you see. I knew it would hurt other people, but I didn't care. That makes it sound horrible, but I really didn't care. She paused to wipe her eyes with the tissue. I was hoping he would leave his wife for me one day. I used to enjoy it when he said unpleasant things about Bree and the bad time she was giving him. I don't think he was in love with her, so I don't know why they stayed together. I used to drop hints about him leaving her, but he never seemed to take the hint. 
They didn't have any kids, so I wasn't hurting any children. Did the police give you a hard time at the questioning? Yes, they did. And you? She nodded. Yes, it was fairly bad. I admitted that I was having an affair with Chase because I knew they'd find out sooner or later. I'm sure they think I did it. Actually, I think they think I did it, I told her. But they'll have the gunshot residue tests back in a week, and then they'll know it wasn't us. It could have been Adrian Young, the other vet nurse, she said. Chase found out he'd been stealing, only small amounts at first, from the cash register, and he was about to confront him. And then... Her voice broke. Can you think of anyone else who had a reason to kill him? I asked her. I shoplifted a bra when I was 18 and living in Melbourne. She said, my friends dared me to do it. I was a student, so didn't have much money, but I wouldn't have stolen it for that reason. I did it because they dared me. Also, my stepfather left me an inheritance when I was 19. I blew through it in just five weeks. It wasn't a major inheritance as such, but it was enough. I spent it all on makeup, clothes, that sort of thing. It makes me look back and shudder. She blew her nose loudly before continuing. I stole a neglected dog and forged the owner's signature on the microchip form and then found a good home for the dog. I hid her first and nursed her back to health. That's a criminal offence. She went on with a catalogue of her sins, but none of them had anything to do with the vet. Did you kill him? I asked her again. Once more, she did not answer directly. Instead, she said, I was in love with him. I silently berated myself for not making the truth spell focused. It was certainly working, but not in the way in which I had intended it to work. I've thought of a list of suspects, and there is his wife, as well as Adrian, and Nico North, his running buddy. Running buddy? I said. This was the first I had heard of any running buddy. Perhaps it was Chase's previously mentioned best friend. Nico wouldn't have done it, though, she continued. The two of them were childhood friends. They were very competitive with each other. She sighed, long and hard. They were both training for the upcoming race. Chase always beat Nico in races, but I'm sure no one's ever murdered anyone for that reason. I had to agree. Can you think of anyone else? I asked her, fully aware that she had not given me a direct answer to my question. Well, there were several pet owners who weren't too happy with Chase, she said slowly. Chase did overcharge quite badly on some occasions. He usually made sure he did that to people who could afford it, although I think he slipped up once or twice. He would never admit to his mistakes. Can you think of the names of any of these pet owners off the top of your head? I asked her. She pursed her lips. No, not really. Only Mabel Wraith. She was by far the most vocal. She often came into the clinic and made a big public scene. The other owners who were annoyed with Chase just sent him rude emails or said a few words when they came to pay their bills. But no, no one was angry like Mabel Wraith. Do you think Mabel could have killed him? I asked her. She shrugged. I wouldn't have thought so. But someone did it, didn't they? I can't think of anyone who would do it. But I must be wrong, because someone did it. He is dead. Chapter 10 As I walked into the funeral home, I sneezed violently. Oleander turned to me. Are you all right, Goldie? I know he had friends, but this looks like a florist shop, not a chapel, I said before I sneezed again. Lilies usually make me sneeze, and I think every lily in Queensland must be in this room. Athanasius guided us to seats at the back of the room. 
I was surprised when Max texted you yesterday to say the funeral was on so soon. Oleander nodded. Well, it's not as if they were investigating some obscure form of African poison or anything like that. He was shot. That's not something you can overlook, so I suppose the police felt they could release the body soon. I looked around at all the flowers in the room. It seems he was popular after all. Not with everyone, Athanasius pointed out. True. Is Max coming? Oleander asked me. I was aware that my face fell, so I at once tried to plaster a happy look across my face. I don't know. I gave up all pretense and added, I think he's avoiding me. Oleander frowned. But didn't you say that he took you home after you found the body? From the police station, I mean. I shrugged one shoulder. Sure, and then he came over again that night, but he's been avoiding me ever since. If he was avoiding you, he wouldn't have texted you, Athanasius said. Oleander rolled her eyes. Typical man thing to say. She shot Athanasius a glare and then said, Goldie means he's avoiding her in person. I looked around the chapel. The walls were made of expansive glass, and the ceilings were high and pitched. I imagined the huge trees outside were all that stopped the chapel from becoming a hothouse. Of course, the air conditioning helped. It's a shame you didn't bring Persnickel, Oleander lamented. I rubbed my forehead. We've been through this. I can't bring a wombat to a funeral. Oleander pursed her lips. I know that, and as I kept telling you, I didn't mean you should bring him to the actual service. I think you should have held him outside, and then you would have been able to speak to the ghost. Of course the ghost would attend his own funeral. No doubt, I said dryly. And that would have been fine had the funeral been in East Bucklebury. But this is the middle of the city, and it would not have been practical for me to sit outside with Purse Nickel. Now we will all have to keep our eyes peeled for any evidence, Athanasius said in an obvious attempt to change the subject. Even if something seems insignificant, it could prove important later. From where we are sitting, we should have a good view of everyone. I opened the commemorative brochure. It says it's a closed casket funeral. Well, I suppose that's not surprising under the circumstances. Oleander disagreed. It's amazing what they can do with cosmetics these days. We were there early, and we had plenty of chances to survey the room. Some dreary music started, so I figured that the service could not be too far away. People were still filing in. A tall, well-dressed woman, overly tanned, and with a face that gave a nod to high-quality plastic surgery, walked down the aisle. She was entirely overdressed for the occasion. It looked as though she was going to a Melbourne Cup party in the members' stand. Oleander elbowed me in the ribs. That's Chase's wife, Bree. I thought that's who she was, I whispered back. And there's Georgia Garrison. Georgia filed in, clutching her large handbag to her chest. Her head was down, and it seemed as if she was crying. She was accompanied by a couple, the man patting her on the back. They took seats near the front of the chapel. Five minutes later, people were still filing in, although it seemed most had already arrived. Most of these people are from East Bucklebury, Athanasius said. Yes, of course they are, Oleander said. Chase did work there, after all, and just about everyone in East Bucklebury has at least one pet. I don't think you're in a very good mood today, Oleander, Athanasius said. Would you like a lemon tart? He pulled one from his man bag. Oleander narrowed her eyes, but graciously accepted one. He offered me one, but I declined. I sneezed again, and then said, I'm just going to duck out for a breath of fresh air. These lilies really are affecting my sinuses. Don't be long, Oleander said. The service is about to start. I hurried out the door and breathed in the clean, fresh sea air. I dabbed under my eyes with a tissue, careful not to smudge my mascara. A man, 
head down and walking slowly, approached me. He was clearly the minister, unless it was someone with unusual taste in clothes. I'm sorry for your loss, he said. I waved one hand at him. I didn't know Chase Evans. I'm allergic to lilies. He looked surprised and then said, I'm gay and my wife doesn't know. We have three children and I'm having an affair with a bricklayer. He's married too and his wife doesn't know he's gay either. I didn't know what to say. I just stared at him. I have a terrible case of athlete's foot, he continued. I finally found my voice. Oh, I'm sorry for your predicament. It's not my only predicament, he hurried to say. The church wouldn't mind me being gay because I'm from the Uniting Church and they would be completely fine with it. It's just that I don't know how to break the news to my wife. That's understandable. I realized he was telling me this because of the truth spell. I wondered how many people it would affect and whether or not it would lead me to the murderer. The minister was still speaking. I'm usually a good minister. Although I always ask for discounts, I think people should give me discounts because I'm a minister, don't you? My wife and I recently bought a house out at Hope Island, and I asked the lawyer for discounts. The firm refused to give me any, so I changed firms. I think ministers should be given discounts, because we work so hard for our money, and we don't make that much. I nodded. I have bad breath, not just athlete's foot, he added, and then hurried away with his hand firmly clamped over his mouth. I put my hands over my ears and hurried back into the chapel. You were away a long time, Oleander said. I was beginning to get worried about you. Remind me not to speak to anyone else, I said with some trepidation, watching the minister take the pulpit. I certainly hoped he wouldn't share with everyone what he had just shared with me, for his sake. Luckily, that was not the case. The minister made the usual speech about the deceased, what a wonderful person he had been, and how he was dearly missed by everyone. I half expected Athanasius to stand up and say, not everyone, but to my relief he remained silent. When it's over, speak to anyone who could be a suspect and they might confess to you, Oleander said. Do you think the truth spell is still working? Yes, but only when I'm close to someone, I said, just as the minister invited the victim's wife to take the stand. She too delivered a lengthy speech about how wonderful her husband had been and what a happy marriage they'd had. She said they hadn't wanted children but instead preferred to adopt dogs and cats. She went on and on about her wonderful marriage. I think people who say that are usually exaggerating, Oleander whispered to me. I had to agree. Chase's wife finally burst into a flood of dramatic tears, which I, perhaps unkindly, suspected were crocodile tears. I half expected her to pretend to faint, but she walked back to her seat hunched over, while other people stood up and crowded around her. The minister invited a representative of the vet clinic to speak. The man who was sitting next to Georgia Garrison stood up and hurried to the pulpit. He said that Chase was a wonderful person and he had been a wonderful boss. With some emotion, he said Chase had been very kind to animals and was a skilled surgeon who had saved many lives. The minister then invited another man to take the stand. He was introduced as Chase's long-term closest friend. This man was clearly an accomplished public speaker and held everyone's attention. He told hilarious anecdotes about the times he'd had with Chase and had most people in the chapel laughing. He said that Chase would have wanted to be remembered for how he was in life. Apparently, the victim didn't have any relatives because the minister took the stand again and announced that Chase would be cremated. The casket slid behind a curtain, and the curtain closed. Just as it did, the widow burst into loud wailing. People leapt to their feet and comforted her once more. 
I leaned across to Oleander and Athanasius. Cremated? That's suspicious, isn't it? It's a good way to destroy evidence. But the police would have taken all the samples they needed, Athanasius said. Oleander waggled her finger at him. You never know. You just never know. Maybe his widow asked for him to be cremated, Athanasius said. My hand flew to my mouth. Yes, they didn't have any children. Surely his wife is the sole heir to his fortune. What makes you think he was wealthy? Athanasius said. He was a vet, I said. Haven't you ever received a vet bill? They cost an arm and a leg. And didn't you get a good look at his wife? She's had very good plastic surgery. Top notch, in fact. Oleander laughed. This is the Gold Coast. It's top-notch plastic surgery central as far as Australia goes. That might be the case, but it still wouldn't be cheap, I said. I'm sure they had a wealthy lifestyle. Yes, they each owned an expensive car, Athanasius said. But then again, they hadn't spent all their money on children. Children are very expensive, even more so as they get older. Before I had time to file away that gem of wisdom for further consideration, a high-pitched scream erupted from the front of the room. Chapter 11 We jumped to our feet. It's his wife, several people said. Judging by the other people bending over and staring at the ground, I figured Bree Evans had finally pretended to faint. There was something so utterly fake about her that I couldn't bring myself to give her the benefit of the doubt. The minister tapped the microphone, and seconds later, a high-pitched sound reverberated around the room. Everyone is welcome to join us next door for refreshments, the minister said. He hurried over to where the widow was lying. Let's get to those refreshments fast before the others scoff off the best ones. Athanasius said. He took off out the door at a great rate of knots. I didn't know he could move that fast, I said to Oleander, as we both hurried after him. She laughed. It's amazing what he'll do for food. The aroma of coffee hit me as soon as I walked through the door. Oh, that's why there are so many East Bucklebury residents here, I said without thinking, and then slammed my hand over my mouth. That sounded so callous. At first I thought they were all here to pay their respects to their local vet, but then I thought, rather unkindly, that they're here to get free coffee. Oleander nodded. You could well be right. Have you noticed that the East Bucklebury residents are all standing around the coffee machines? I had been to funerals in the past, where they only had an urn of hot water and dreadful instant coffee but in this case there were several large drip filter machines set up. The East Bucklebury residents were filling their cups with glee. You need to speak to the victim's wife, Oleander said. Why me? I said. Can't we divide this up? Take a suspect each. The truth spell only works for you, of course, Oleander said. My face fell. She did have a point. Okay, then. There's the victim's wife, Bree, the vet nurses, Georgia and Adrian, and the best friend, Nico North. Have I missed anyone? Athanasius and Oleander exchanged glances and then looked at me. No, we don't think so, they both said in unison. Okay, then I'll start with his wife, I said. Bree had been shown to a seat at the back of the room and was fanning herself with a commemorative pamphlet. A man was patting her on the back. When he left, presumably to fetch her a drink, I hurried over. I'm so sorry for your loss, Miss Chase. Bree, she said. Bree, I repeated. I'm Goldie Bloom, a new resident of East Bucklebury. She looked at me with renewed interest. You were the one who found my husband. I nodded. I'm so sorry. I'm a bit of a tart she said. I've been having affairs for years, but I wouldn't divorce my husband because he was a big cash cow to me. I've been pretending to be sorry, partly because it's the thing a wife should do. 
and partly because those idiot detectives are here watching me like hawks. They are? I looked around the room and saw them skulking in a corner. I hadn't even noticed them. She was still talking. I have affairs with anyone I can get my hands on. I prefer younger men, of course. I've had my face all jacked up with plastic surgery again and again and again. But it looks really good, don't you think? Yes, it does look awfully good, I said truthfully. She pressed on. Nothing on me that you see is natural. I paid for everything on me. You'd be surprised what parts of me aren't real. She broke off and laughed. That's what you've got to do at the Gold Coast. Anyway, I wanted to divorce my husband, and now that he's dead, I'll inherit everything. And I do love our house at Sanctuary Cove. It's absolutely beautiful. Have you ever been to Sanctuary Cove? I had to admit that I hadn't. You should. It's just next to Hope Island. I'm glad I'll never have to set foot in East Bucklebury again. It's a complete dump of a place. It shouldn't even be called the Gold Coast because it's too far north. It's a joke that they included it in the Gold Coast. I'm a very superficial person who cares about nothing but my appearance. Hmm, I do care about my dogs and cats, but I don't care about anyone else. Now I will have more money to spend on my appearance. I was about to ask her if she knew who killed her husband when Detective Power suddenly manifested at my side. Do you two know each other? He asked as he loomed over me. No, we both said. I was just telling Bree how sorry I am for her loss. I said, it seems that you were both having a jolly good conversation. Bree was just telling me how upset she is, I said, and Bree winked at me. I excused myself and made my way back to Oleander. Did she confess? Oleander asked me. I shook my head. She just went on and on about how superficial she is and how she's had affairs and stuff like that. I was about to ask her straight out if she knew who killed him, but that's when that dreadful detective power turned up. Can't you go back and ask her after he leaves? Athanasius asked me. I shook my head. I'm afraid not. The truth spell only seems to work the first time I speak to someone. It stops working after that. Athanasius folded his arms over his chest. Oh, that's a terrible nuisance. You're telling me, I said. At least it will teach me to be more careful with my spells in future. Oleander grabbed my arm. There's that vet nurse, Adrian Young, isn't it? Go over and speak to him now. I haven't had a chance to eat anything yet, I protested. She grabbed the nearest cake, stuck it on a plate and thrust it into my hands. Off you go. I hurried over to the vet nurse, who was standing at the coffee machine. I was glad he was alone. Hi, I'm Goldie Bloom. I stuck out my hand. I'm afraid I was the one who found your boss. His eyes shot skyward. You're the one who found the body. He looked rather afraid of me, as if he thought I did it. I didn't murder him, I said quickly. He took a step backwards. No, of course not. Of course not. The police will know that any day because they tested for gunshot residues. His face visibly relaxed. Oh, yes, Georgia told me all about that. I nodded. I'm having an affair with a married woman. I stole some money. I've got a criminal record, and I've been stealing money in bits and pieces from the vet clinic. I've always intended to pay it back, of course. My intentions are always good. It's just that I never seem to have enough. Every month when I get paid, I intend to pay it back. But my money always seems to go on bills. Electricity has gone up so much lately. And even though I'm on an unlimited free text and unlimited free calls phone plan, it still all adds up, you know. Living is just so expensive, isn't it? I opened my mouth to say something, but he pushed on. Yes, I'm a thief and a liar. And like I said, I've been having an affair with a married woman. 
To make matters worse, I'm married too. My wife doesn't know I'm having an affair. He paused to wipe his brow. I had big ears when I was a child, and everyone at school called me big ears. They didn't bully me, mind you. It was an affectionate term. He paused to draw breath. I used to steal things out of people's lunches when I was a kid. I didn't steal a whole lunch from anybody, just the nice bits from it. I left the sandwiches. When I went to church, I pretended to put money on the plate, but I actually took money. No one ever noticed, or if they did, they didn't say anything. You should try it. It's quite easy to do. Do you know who killed your boss? I asked him, but at that moment he spilt coffee on the floor. Oh no, look what I've done. The minister hurried over to him. Don't worry about it. One of the ladies from the church will clean it later. Did you burn your hand? I caught Oleander's eye and shrugged. I wasn't getting very far with my questioning. Oleander nodded in the direction of the victim's best buddy. I turned around and saw he was looking me up and down. I smiled at him, despite the fact he gave me the creeps, and he sauntered over to me. I'm Nicholas North, he said. You can call me Nico. Goldie Bloom. I went to shake his hand, but he picked up my hand and kissed it. If I had some disinfectant, I would have dipped my hand in a bucket load of it. I'm a very competitive person, he said. I always did better times in training than Chase Evans, but Chase always beat me in races. We were training together for the Gold Coast Half Marathon that's coming up next June. Now I'll have to do it alone, and that annoys me, because I was sure I was going to beat him this time. In fact, I told my wife. He sighed. My wife refused to come to the funeral because she said she was busy. I know I seem like a dreadful flirt, but I'm madly in love with my wife, and I've never cheated on her. I went to school with Chase. We were always competitive. Do you know, I wanted to be a vet, too. I missed out getting into vet school by one point, and Chase scraped through by one point. He laughed ruefully. Still, everyone said he was a good vet, and I went into business instead and became an entrepreneur. I don't know what it was with Chase. He always beat me in everything. He got on the beach volleyball team, and I just missed out. It didn't matter what we did. He always beat me. We both went in the Gold Coast Half Marathon last year, and he'd beat me by 50 seconds. I even sprinted to the finish line. He sighed. I thought I was going to die. They took me into the medical tent and everything, but I just couldn't run him down. He looked as though he hadn't even had a run, and I was exhausted. He shrugged and held up his hands skyward. What was that with him? It seemed like he had a gifted life. Until someone shot him, I pointed out. His face fell. He got what he deserved. He said, I don't approve of cheating. And lately he was always boasting that he was having an affair with a married woman. I don't approve of cheating. He said again. Detective Power once more appeared at my side. Do you two know each other? No, we just now met for the first time, I said. Power looked at Nico. Is that true? He looked surprised at the question. Yes, I was just telling this lady how Chase lived a charmed life. Until someone shot him, Power said. For once, Power and I agreed. As I turned away, I saw a violent argument taking place outside the window. Chapter 12 I hurried over to the window and peeked out. Bree and Georgia Garrison were engaged in a heated argument. Both their faces were red, and both were waving their hands in the air. I couldn't hear a word they were saying. 
I tried to open the window, but it was locked. What are you doing? A voice said behind me. I spun around to see Oleander hovering over me. Look out there, I said urgently. The vet's wife and the vet nurse are having a big argument. It seems Chase's wife knew he was having an affair with Georgia, Oleander said. It would be interesting to know if she knew that all the time, or whether she's only just found out. I'd like to be able to overhear what they're saying, though. Oleander grabbed my arm. Let's go outside and pretend we're having a conversation. We might be able to overhear something. I readily agreed that was a good idea, so we hurried for the door. When we got outside, I was pleased to see that the front porch ran close to the corner where the two women were arguing. I nodded to Oleander, and she followed me to the far end. We both walked as quietly as we could. As soon as we reached the far wall, the women's voices could be heard. He was never going to leave me for you, you trollop, Bree yelled. You don't know that, Georgia screeched back. I knew all about him. You weren't his only conquest. He had girlfriends everywhere. He always made sure they were married because he didn't want anyone to get too attached to him. You got too attached to him, though. Were you the one who shot him? How dare you, Georgie yelled. Any fool could see you were the one who shot him. You stand to inherit everything. Bree made a grunting sound at the back of her throat. I was wealthy before I married him. That's hardly a motive. If you didn't do it, then tell me who did. And besides, would you like me to tell your husband what's been going on? Don't you dare, Georgia hissed. As I was straining to hear, Georgia stormed past us both. Luckily for us, she didn't see us. I gestured to Oleander that we should go back inside before Bree came upon us, but she pulled my arm and pointed in Bree's direction. Now she's speaking to a man. Can you hear? I strained my ears. I can hardly hear anything now, I told her. Can you hear what they're saying? No, not really. We had better go back inside and look out the window. Both of us hurried back inside and headed for the window, but Athanasius forestalled us. Where have you two been? I was getting worried. I'll tell you in a minute, Oleander said urgently. First, we have to look out the window. This time when we looked out the window, Adrian Young was speaking with Bree. They looked awfully friendly. Both were laughing, and she was patting his arm in an intimate manner, or so it seemed to me. Oleander and I exchanged glances. Can you tell me what's going on? Athanasius said. Bree, the vet's wife, was yelling at Georgia Garrison. I told him, she said her husband had plenty of affairs, although I don't know if that's true. Did she only just find out about her husband's affair with Georgia? Athanasius asked me. I looked at Oleander, but she shrugged. We couldn't really tell, she said, but she wasn't acting surprised. And what's more, she's out there now speaking in hushed tones with Adrian Young. And Georgia Garrison's husband is another suspect, I said. He might have found out about the affair and shot the vet for that reason. I suppose infidelity is a fairly common motive for murder, Athanasius said. I wonder why her husband isn't here at the funeral today. Maybe he had to work, I offered. Go and ask Georgia where her husband is. Oleander gave me a little push in Georgia's direction. I was going to protest, but Georgia caught my eye, so I walked over to her. Are you doing all right, Georgia? I can see you're terribly upset. Georgia did indeed look upset. Her eyes were red and puffy, and she kept dabbing at her eyes with the tissue. Yes, I'm having a rough day. The funeral must have been hard for you, I said wondering how to work up to the subject of her husband. She nodded. Is your husband here to help you through this hard time? I asked her. She looked alarmed, but then said, No, he's in Dubai for work. Dubai? I said, surprised. Did he just fly over there or what? 
He's been there for five months, she said. He's due to fly back at the end of this month. Oh, that's awfully hard for you, I said. Is he often away for work? She nodded. Yes, and it is very difficult. I have two sons. They've grown up and left home. One of them lives in London, and one of them lives in Dubai. So my husband is staying with that son. He's the eldest. I shot her a sympathetic look. Meanwhile, my synapses were sparking. It seemed her husband had an iron-clad alibi, unless he had slipped back into the country to kill the vet, but it didn't seem likely for several reasons. If he was staying with her son, then her son would have commented that his father wasn't there. It was a bit of a stretch to think the son was in on the murder. No, I thought I could discount the husband as a likely suspect. I wondered if it was true that the vet had plenty of affairs, because if so, there could be several angry husbands out there. I would have to find a way to question Bree more closely. She seemed someone who was quite self-serving, so it followed she would not like to answer questions, especially not if she was the one who did it. I still doubted that Georgia had done it, because she had seemed genuinely surprised at the time. I was still mulling things over when Georgia touched my arm. I jumped. Sorry, I didn't mean to startle you, but you were a million miles away. Oh, um, I started. I was just wondering who shot Chase, to be honest. She dabbed at her eyes again. For a moment I was afraid she would burst into a fresh flood of tears. Yes. You and me both. I can't wait for those gunshot residue tests to come back because the police had me down to the police station after hours last night for questioning again. They did? I said in shock. I thought I was the main suspect. You probably were, she admitted, but they found out that I was in the local gun club. I'm licensed to own a rifle. I used to live at Tamworth in New South Wales on a farm and I had to get a rifle to shoot snakes. Of course, it's illegal to harm snakes, but when you have a big brown coming at you, or one of your animals, you don't think twice. Every farmer I knew had a rifle for shooting brown snakes. Anyway, the police found out I had a gun license, and now they really think I did it. I was beginning to think they might be right. Surely we only have a few more days until the residue tests come back. I said. I couldn't think of anything else to say. That will clear you. Or maybe not, I added silently. I hope so, too. I hope so, she repeated. Because everyone knows those detectives put your friend Oleander in the Southport watch house with hardly any evidence, and I'm worried they'll do the same to me. Actually, I thought that's exactly what they were going to do to me. Georgia nodded. They've taken my rifles for testing, but so many people around here have rifles. I was surprised. They do? Why would anyone in the city need a rifle? She shook her head. No, I don't mean around Surface Paradise or Broadbeach, or anywhere around where we are now. I mean out at East Bucklebury. There are all those cane fields out there, and plenty of snakes. The farmers on the cane fields have rifles. I know it's not exactly a full-on rural area, like in the country, but it's country enough. I didn't know, I said. I'll be a bit nervous to be out bushwalking again. She laughed. I'm sure you're safe. You don't look anything like a snake. I laughed too. I meant I'd be in danger from snakes, not stray bullets. You know, I hope you don't mind me saying so, but I was standing at that window over there, and I saw you have a terrible row with Bree. I couldn't hear what you were arguing about. I lied. Are you all right? She looked shocked, but then said, She and I have never been friends. The reason I brought it up was that I'm just as worried as you are about being arrested by the police. I want to find out who killed Chase as fast as I possibly can, and I want to ask Bree questions. Do you think she did it? I shrugged. I don't have the slightest clue who did it, 
but I thought she might know something. Do you have any clues as to how I could approach her and ask her questions? I can hardly just walk up to her and give her the third degree like the police can. Georgia tapped her finger on her chin. You'll have to make her think it's in her best interests for you to solve the murder. How will I do that? Georgia sipped her coffee for a moment before answering. I know. Tell her that the police will freeze all Chase's assets until his murder is solved. Do they actually do that? I asked her. She shrugged one shoulder. I don't know, but Bree will believe it. That way she'll be happy to tell you anything she knows. Yes, but not if she was the one who did it, I said. Chapter 13 I stopped the car outside a newly built home, rendered in various shades of grey and white. A red golf buggy was parked in the well-manicured driveway. The massive home was in one of the exclusive gated estates in stunning Sanctuary Cove, where it was pretty much impossible to get a house for under a million dollars, and where most houses were worth in the region of four million. I hope she doesn't mind me coming along, Oleander said. She probably would have minded if Athanasius was with us as well, I said. I hope he's not too upset at being left at home. Oleander shook her head. He understands. It's amazing how you got her to agree to speak with you. It was George's idea, really, I said. When I called Bree to set up the meeting, I suggested we could help each other. She was entirely reluctant until I told her the police were going to freeze her husband's assets until the murder was solved. After that, she fell all over herself trying to help me. It seems she can't be the murderer then, Oleander said. I shook my head. Possibly, but things aren't always what they seem. Oleander scratched her head. I wonder how they could have afforded that house. How much money would a vet make in East Buckleberry? I mean, I know he was the only vet, but it's not as if he was a vet in Brisbane or Sydney or somewhere big like that. Bree said she had her own money, I pointed out. And speaking of money, my job starts soon. I've become accustomed to being a lady of leisure, which is kind of nice, even with my fear of boredom. Make sure you tell Bree you're a real estate agent, Oleander said. Perhaps she might sell that house one day and you'd get a really good commission on it. My eyes lit up. I sure would. That's a good idea. Come on, are you ready? Oleander frowned. I'm as ready as I'll ever be. We made our way to the wide timber and glass door. I had seen plenty of those doors around the North Gold Coast in places such as Hope Island and Paradise Point, so I figured her taste wasn't too out of the ordinary. Bree herself answered the door. I was half expecting a butler or a maid. Come in. She opened the door and stood aside. Her manner wasn't exactly welcoming, but there was no trace of hostility in her tone. I had expected a grand entrance hall, but it was merely an empty space, to the right of which was an expansive kitchen. The kitchen itself screamed expense, with granite bench tops and glass splashbacks. Bree ushered us past the kitchen, through the dining room and into a small sitting room. Two white sofas sat at right angles under a massive painting. I recognised the painter's name. His works weren't outrageously expensive, but he was quite well known, so I knew the painting would have cost a pretty penny. Would you like a drink? Coffee, please, we both answered automatically. Bree laughed, a high-pitched nasal laugh. Oh, yes, you're both from East Bucklebury. My husband hated that ridiculous coffee law. She crossed to the kitchen. It wasn't far away, so I was still able to speak to her. Why did your husband want to work in a tiny, out-of-the-way place like East Bucklebury? I asked her. I hurried to add, forgive me if that's rude, but I'm from Melbourne, inner city Melbourne actually, and it's taking me quite some time to get used to East Bucklebury. She snorted rudely. Yes, and I'm from Manly Beach, and East Bucklebury is a far cry from the north shores of Sydney. Don't get me wrong, I do love Sanctuary Cove, and with the shopping and golf courses and everything around here, it's the best. 
But East Bucklebury, it's a terrible dump. I shot a look at Oleander, but she didn't seem too offended. So why did your husband set up a vet clinic there, if you don't mind me asking? She shrugged. He had a big practice in Sydney with several vets working for him, but he had a health scare ten or so years ago. That prompted him to sell the clinic, and he got a good price. Even though he was young, he figured he would semi-retire to a small town. East Bucklebury isn't all that far from Sanctuary Cove. I know the locals think a half-hour commute is a fair way, but when you're used to living in Sydney, it's not far at all. I shot Oleander a significant look. That explained how Chase and Bree Evans could afford such a big house at Sanctuary Cove. His Sydney practice must have been worth a small fortune, and even a tiny, two-bedroom, one-bathroom terrace house in Sydney is worth over a million dollars. As she made the coffee, I glanced around. Outside was a rather tasteless billiards room, the table garishly pink with mustard-coloured timber. The floors and ceiling of the room were dark-stained timber. Massive bifold doors opened onto the room. The deep, mahogany-coloured timber floor extended the length of the house, and I could see a lap pool with a giant pink flamingo floating in it. Is that the golf course I can see out there? I asked her. There's more than one golf course at Sanctuary Cove, she said. But yes, you're right. Actually, this house interior is too dated for me. I'm thinking of selling it. Now that there's just me, I intend to buy another house at Sanctuary Cove, something far more modern. I nodded. From the outside, the house looked like a new build, but from inside I could see it was around ten years old, but had been built by someone with much older tastes. Oleander elbowed me, so I grimaced and added, I'm a real estate agent from Melbourne, and my boss sent me up here to manage his office in Southport. If you ever need help with buying or selling a home, please consider me. I opened my handbag and put my card on top of the blue and white striped ottoman in front of me. I might take you up on that, she said from the kitchen. I think you and I have the same taste. I could see she meant it as a huge compliment, so I beamed. She returned, carrying three cups of coffee on a tray. She carefully put the tray on top of the ottoman. All right, I'll come straight to the point. You told me the police are going to freeze my assets until my husband's murder is solved. They didn't tell me that when they were questioning me, though. Her voice held no hint of suspicion, but I hurried to say, They did tell me that, so perhaps they were keeping it from you. I felt bad lying to her, but I had visions of the Southport watch house. She narrowed her eyes. Yes, I've seen that sort of thing on TV shows. Maybe they do think I did it. I'm sure they have several suspects, I said. Do you have any idea who could have killed your husband? It could have been that dreadful Georgia Garrison, she said. She'd been having an affair with my husband. When did you find out? Oleander asked her. She shrugged. I found out a few weeks ago. I didn't really worry too much about it, mind you. I didn't particularly like my husband. Not that I would say that to the police. I was glad when he was out of my hair all day. He always played golf every weekend. He wasn't on call for emergencies and stuff like that, I asked her. Bree chuckled. No, there was an emergency vet clinic 25 kilometers away that he always pushed people onto after hours and at weekends. He played golf every weekend, and he wasn't home much, so I could do my own thing. So you didn't mind him having an affair with Georgia? I asked in disbelief. She frowned. Of course I minded. It was rude, if nothing else. I thought it showed a complete lack of respect for me on both their behalves. I would have happily divorced him, but I don't think he was serious about Georgia. He had a lot of affairs back when we lived in Sydney as well. He told me he'd changed his ways, and I believed him. But you know, you can only take so much. After a while, I just stopped caring. We were more flatmates than anything else. We got on well, don't get me wrong. It's just that I hadn't been in love with him for years. Do you think Georgia shot your husband? I asked her. She made small circles with her fingers at the tops of her cheekbones. 
I wondered if she was doing some sort of facial aerobics. You know, I do suspect her. It's just that she seems too spineless to do anything like that. Perhaps she asked him to leave me, and he refused. He probably wouldn't have cared about leaving me, but he certainly wouldn't want to take up with her, so that might have upset her. Bree tapped her chin hard. That's only hypothetical, though, because I don't know if she did ask him to leave me. It's just an assumption. That's the only thing I can think of. I can't see what other motive she could have had. Did your husband have any enemies? Oleander asked her. Well, there was that angry dog owner. What was her name again? Martha? Mary? Mabel, Oleander supplied. I know she was upset, but would she have been upset enough to murder your husband? Bree shook her head. I've seen so many people upset with the size of vet bills, but I've never known a vet to be murdered over it. That's not to say it couldn't happen. She held both her hands, palms upward, to the ceiling. We were not getting far with the questioning. I had thought it would have proceeded much better than this. Is there anyone else you can think of? I said in a pleading tone. There is Adrian Young, of course, she said. He had been stealing money from the clinic, and Chase was about to confront him. I shot a look at Oleander. Really? He'd been stealing money? I already knew, but I wasn't about to admit it to Bree. Bree nodded. Yes, Chase only found out about it last week. The money hadn't been adding up, and he knew it was a staff member. At first, I thought it was Georgia, but my husband wouldn't hear of it, so I told him to install a nanny cam. A nanny cam? Oleander repeated. You know, a hidden camera. He trained a hidden camera on the cash register, and sure enough, we saw Adrian slipping money out when no one was around. Chase was going to confront him about it. Still, Adrian wasn't working there the day that my husband was shot. Does Adrian own a rifle? I asked her. She shrugged. How would I know? I suppose the police would have found that out, but they still seem to be questioning me. And me too, I said. So really, your husband didn't have any enemies at all? No. The only people I can think of who might have murdered him were Georgia, Adrian, you, me, and Nico. Hasn't Nico been good buddies with your husband since they were young? I asked her. She nodded. Yes, they grew up together. They went to high school together, and then they both went to Sydney University. My husband went to the Sydney University Veterinary Hospital, and I really can't remember what Nico did. I find him boring and opinionated. To tell you the truth, I've never taken much interest in him. Nico moved up here to Hope Island. He was the one who talked my husband into moving up this way after he sold his practice. Would Nico have any reason to murder your husband? I asked her. She shook her head. No, like I said, they've always been best friends. My husband always spoke well of him. I think Nico was always jealous of my husband, but if he was going to murder him, he would have murdered him years ago. She broke off with a nasal laugh. I haven't been helpful, have I? Oh, you've actually been quite helpful, I lied. My spirits fell. It seemed I had run out of suspects. Chase Evans had been murdered, and no one seemed to have a motive. I only hoped those gunshot residue results would be back before I was thrown in the Southport watch house. Chapter 14 I could not get the thought of the Southport watch house out of my mind. The police had watched me the whole time at the funeral, and I could see they still thought I was a suspect. I knew they wouldn't be able to turn up any evidence that I had met Chase before, considering the fact that I hadn't, but I had been the one to discover his body. In their eyes, that seemed to elevate me on their list of suspects. I figured I had no choice but to take Persnickel back to the vet clinic so I could get some more information out of the deceased Chase Evans. I managed to tempt Persnickel away from the TV and from his little friend Paddy and put him in the car. 
When I arrived at the vet clinic, Persnickel was quite reluctant to get out of the car. You're not going to the vet, I promise, I told him, but at the mention of the word vet, he shuddered and made strange wombat sounds in the back of his throat. By the time I wrestled Persnickel out of the car, I was exhausted. The police tape had been taken down, so I walked with Persnickel around to the back of the building, just outside the vet's office window. I did not want the police to catch me inside the building, and at any rate, I was sure it was locked. Is anyone there? I called out, not too loudly, in case a living person was nearby, although I did not think that likely. To my relief, the ghost appeared immediately. It's about time you came back, he said, waving his hands in an agitated manner. Do you remember who killed you? I asked him. Even in his ghost state, he looked most put out. Remember? That implies I knew in the first place. I told you whoever it was came up behind me. I sighed. Let me rephrase that. Have you given it some thought and have now come up with a suspect? I don't like to point the finger at anyone, he said, but I can't think of anyone who would have a reason to murder me. But you're dead, I pointed out. I'm dead, he repeated with a rueful grin. I don't want to offend you, but the suspects I've come up with are your wife, your lover, Adrian Young, and your best friend, Nico North. Do you know of anyone else? Yes, there was that dreadful woman who falsely accused me of giving her dog the wrong treatment, he said. I can't remember her name. Martha, Mabel, Mary. I really can't remember. I can remember her face, that's for sure. He pulled a face. Most disagreeable dogs. She had a lot of them. Mabel Wraith, I supplied. I heard she accused you of overcharging her and misdiagnosing her dog. He nodded. That's right. Both accusations were false, mind you. I folded my arms and then unfolded them to swat at a particularly loud mosquito. Still, would that be enough reason to shoot you? I had to do a couple of house calls once and she had rifles hanging above the fireplace, he said, tapping his chin. She used to live on a farm. She did? That was news to me. I hadn't seen any rifles hanging on the wall, and I hadn't seen a fireplace for that matter. But then again, she was a hoarder, and it was hard to see the walls in her house. How long ago was that? I asked him. He shrugged. Earlier this year? I'm not too sure. It would be in the records. I don't have access to the records, I said, and then jumped as a voice boomed behind me. Who are you talking to? I swung around, and to my horror, there was Detective Power. He had his hands on his hips and was glaring at me. Detective Walters was standing behind him. I was talking to my wombat, of course, I told him. You said you didn't have access to records. His tone was accusatory. So, do you see anyone else here? I tried to think fast. Persnickel is fond of Starsky and Hutch, and he likes some music, old-fashioned music. I tried to think of someone from the era of Starsky and Hutch. He likes Bob Dylan. He likes Bob Dylan's earlier music, and he likes to listen to him on vinyl, so I told him I didn't have access to anything like that. Walters was doing his best to smother a laugh, while Power continued to glare at me. And what are you doing here again at the clinic? Don't tell me you're trying to do that aversion therapy thing again. It's immersion therapy, I said. And no, I was still worried about Persnickel eating that shoe, so I wanted to see if the vet clinic was open. I thought there should be a replacement vet here by now. After all, this is the only vet clinic in East Bucklebury. You're not more than 20 minutes from the closest vet clinic, I'm sure, Power said. What is the real reason you're snooping around here? If I was snooping, I wouldn't have brought a wombat, I said, trying to sound convincing. I would have worn black and come at night, like a ninja. Power rubbed his forehead. All right, Miss Bloom, you're going to need to come back with us to the station for questioning. Why? I protested. I haven't done anything wrong. It's perfectly legal to take a wombat to a vet clinic. How did I know it wasn't open? 
he took a step towards me. Be that as it may, you're going to need to accompany us to the station right now, Miss Bloom. All right, then. I suppose you'll follow me home again so I can take Persnickel inside? Yes, and don't try anything funny. I didn't have a suitable comeback for that. Did he really think I was going to make a run for it? I was beyond irritated. This had been a consummate waste of time, considering I hadn't found out anything from the vet's ghost. Chase was sure that no one had any reason to kill him, and that was strange in itself. What was I missing? The vet was a clever man, and he had no idea who killed him. I headed back home with Persnickel, muttering rude things under my breath about detective power. I was half inclined to call Max, but thought it best not to get him involved. Instead, I called Oleander and gave her the heads up. Call me as soon as you get out, she said. You'll have to take Persnickel back to speak to the vet again. But how? I was barely able to keep the exasperation out of my voice. It's not possible. You know there'll be no way I can go back to that vet clinic again. Power is already overly suspicious, and I'm about to get the third degree. Why, they might even arrest me. I'm sure Chase doesn't only hang out around the vet clinic, she said. That hadn't occurred to me. You know, you're right, I said. He could easily be present at his wife's house, or maybe even George's. Look, I'm home now, so I'll call you as soon as I get out of the police station. If you don't hear from me in a few hours, that means I've been arrested. I pulled the key out of the ignition, which accidentally silenced Oleander's reply over the Bluetooth and got Persnickel out of the car. He was quite pleased to get out of the car this time. He almost bowled over Detective Walters, who had been assigned to go into the house with me, presumably so I wouldn't try anything funny. Luckily, the kitchen wasn't in view of the front door, and I made a habit of covering the coffee machine every time I went out. I opened the door and let Persnickel in. I just have to turn on the TV for him, I said. Walters raised his eyebrows. You're kidding. Before I could respond, he let out a shriek. There's a giant rat in there. He's a paddy melon, I told him. I'm minding him for a few days. I half expected Walters to ask me if I had a license to mind a paddy melon, but thankfully he didn't. All right, be as fast as you can. I marched over to the TV, turned it on, took a carrot out of my pocket and threw it in front of Persnickel, and then went back to the front door. I hope you can let me drive myself to the station this time. Of course, he said. We'll follow you. Did they really think I was a flight risk? It seemed too ridiculous for words. Still, I had no choice but to do as he said. I was glad that Detective Power hadn't been the one to take me to the house, because I'm sure he would have insisted I ride to the station in the police vehicle. It was a good half hour to the police station, so I called Oleander back. She didn't pick up. I figured she had gone over to Athanasius's apartment to fill him in. My stomach churned when I reached the police station. I parked a little way down the road, and Walters hopped out of the police vehicle. Power drove off, presumably heading for the police parking area. Walters escorted me straight through the waiting room, through the swinging door and down a long corridor, before taking a sharp left into a pale blue room. It had recently been cleaned, judging by the overpowering smell of cheap pine disinfectant. I wondered if they were going to videotape the interrogation again. This was a smaller room and looked more like an office than an interview room, apart from the fact the table was bare. Have a seat, Walters said, not unkindly. He walked around and sat opposite me. An uncomfortable silence descended on us, and it seemed like a full five minutes before Detective Power showed up, although it was probably a lot shorter than that. Power went through the usual formalities. I had to state my name, age, and address for the record. I was getting to be an old hand at this, and that was disturbing in itself. Now, Miss Bloom, tell us in your own words what you are doing at the vet clinic today. I already told you. I said, taking heart from the fact that he hadn't asked to record or even video the interrogation. I'm still worried about my wombat eating that shoe, so I took him to the vet clinic to see if it was open. 
If you were so worried, why didn't you take him to another vet in another suburb? Power's eyes narrowed into slits. Well, I would have if you hadn't come along and interrupted me, I said. Why were you lurking around the back of the building? Power countered. I wasn't lurking, I said, doing my utmost to keep my tone even. Persnickel needed a bathroom break. He just seemed to be sniffing around and eating grass, Power said. It was my turn to narrow my eyes. You don't have a dog, do you? That's normal behavior. They have to find the right spot. Power rubbed his cheeks with both hands and then pulled his hands down his face so hard that I could see inside his bottom eyelids. Ms. Bloom, we are trying to solve a murder. If you know something, you need to tell us. There are laws against withholding information from the police in a homicide investigation. If I knew something, obviously I'd tell you, I said, my voice rising. Do you think I like you following me around and treating me like I'm some sort of a criminal? If I knew anything, I would tell you. He appeared unconvinced. And you still allege that you had never met the victim before the day you discovered his body? That's exactly right, I said sternly. You can ask those Dutch runners. One of the runners, um, fell over and Persnickel ate his shoe. He ate the whole shoe and that's why I took him to the vet. I could hardly have set that up now, could I? Do you think a Dutch runner is in it with me and pretended to fall over and somehow we magically made Persnickel eat a shoe in front of a busload of Dutch health nuts just so I could go to the vet clinic? I fixed power with my best glare as I said it. Maybe that was just a happy coincidence for you, he said undaunted. Maybe you were already intending to visit Dr. Evans that day. Look, you don't have any evidence against me because I haven't done anything wrong. Those gunshot residue tests can't be far away and everyone can tell you that I had never met the vet before. I had no earthly reason to kill him. Maybe you had an accomplice, Power said. Maybe more than one. A self-satisfied look covered his face. It was all I could do not to scream. Chapter 15 I don't want to do it, I whined, bending over the steering wheel and clutching it tightly with both hands. I have one word for you, Oleander said firmly. Southport Watch House. That's two words, Athanasius piped up. Oleander spun around in her seat and fixed him with a glare. You know what I mean. And I've been in that prison and there is no way Goldie will want to go there. I'm sure Detective Power really does suspect me, I admitted. Okay, what's the plan? Oleander rested her head on her elbows. How many times have we been over it already? We will take Persnickel to places where Chase Evans' ghost is likely to appear, so you can speak with him further, with the help of Persnickel here. She jabbed her finger in the direction of the back seat, where Persnickel was happily snoozing. I suppose it's a good idea, I admitted reluctantly, but nothing will make me go back to that vet clinic. Oleander held up both hands in a gesture of surrender. Of course, you don't have to go back to the vet clinic. That would be a foolish idea. I was glad she had realized that. Oleander pushed on. I don't understand why you're so reluctant about it. It's not the whole plan I'm concerned about. It's just the plan about going back to see Bree Evans in Sanctuary Cove. That's a gated estate. I have no idea how you think we're going to get in. And if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times that I absolutely refuse to speak to her again in person. There's no way I'm knocking on her door or pressing the buzzer or whatever else you have to do to get into a gated estate. You don't have to, Oleander assured me. I was exasperated. Then please tell me why we're going there. Why on earth are we headed to Sanctuary Cove if you don't want me to speak to her? Oleander made a little sound of frustration. We're going to get into the gated estate. Then we will park outside her house just a little ways down the street where she won't see us if she drives past, but hopefully close enough for Chase's ghost to appear. Athanasius muttered something in the back. 
What was that? Oleander said snappily. I don't think the ghost will be at Bree's house, Athanasius said. He is more likely to be at his mistress's house. I think we should go directly to George's place. I agreed with him. I do too. They didn't get on terribly well, so why would he want to go to Bree's house? It was his house too, Oleander said slowly. Don't ghosts return to their own homes? Sure, he didn't get on well with his wife, but it was still his house. I'm sure he'd be just as likely to be there as he would at the vet clinic. I shook my head. No, because he was murdered at the vet clinic. I was sure Oleander was about to disagree, but we had arrived at the tall, black iron gates that barred our way to Chase's home. What do we do now? I asked Oleander. It's obvious, isn't it? She said. Circle back there and just wait. I rubbed my eyes. Wait for what? I asked wearily. Wait for someone to open the gates and then slip in behind them. Drive fast, mind you. I was aghast. Do you mean I should slip into the gated estate illegally? Of course, she said, and it's perfectly safe. I'm sure the gates have sensors so they won't close on a car. Just get as close to the other car as you can and sneak in behind it. And how do you propose we get out? I asked her. Getting out is automatic, she said. I felt foolish. Oh, I'm just not used to these Gold Coast gated estates, that's all. I'll have to get used to them soon before I start work here. I fervently hoped that no one would come along, but to my dismay, a big ute with Jones and Smith Elite Plumbing Services emblazoned along the side in big red letters drove past us. Oleander poked me hard in the arm. You sure this is a good idea? I asked her, but she did not respond. I pulled the car out and got as close to the plumber as I could. When he drove off, I tailgated him all the way in. I half expected him to stop the car, get out and question me, but he drove straight through. I can't believe that worked, I said to a murmur of agreement from Athanasius in the back seat. Now to find my way back to Bree's house. Turn left here and go along the lake, Oleander said. Bree won't remember your car, and thankfully it has tinted windows, so she won't see any of us inside it. Just park down the road a little and see if the ghost shows up. I parked a few houses away, but left the engine running with the air conditioning on because it was so hot. Chase, Chase Evans, are you here? I said in a loud voice. There was no reply. Told you, Athanasius mumbled from the back seat. Maybe you're too far from her house, Oleander said. Go forward a bit, Goldie. Go on, get a bit closer. I drove to the house next door to Breeze. Again, I called out for Chase, and again there was no response. You'll have to park directly outside her house, Oleander said. What if she sees us? Oleander pointed to other cars parked on the street. She won't think anything of it, and if she does, just tell her a client wants to buy a house here and you're checking out the area. I clutched my forehead. Still, I did as she asked and edged the car forward. Oleander was still talking. There are really no windows overlooking the road, so even if she is home, she would be looking out over the golf course. Try again, Goldie. Chase, are you here? I yelled at the top of my lungs. Persnickel woke up and grunted. Someone will hear you, Oleander said. That's the general idea. Chase, are you here? I yelled again. I yelled a few more times, quite loudly. I admit part of that was a secret desire to irritate Oleander. Finally, she relented. Okay, it doesn't seem as though he's here. Let's try George's house next. I could feel Athanasius's smirk from the back seat. Oleander was right. I was able to leave the gated estate with no trouble, and I was relieved that no one had caught us in there. It was a fair drive back to George's house, and when we got closer, I was again concerned. What if she sees us? I asked Oleander. Just do the same thing that you did at Bree's house, Oleander said. Just get as close as you can and see if Chase will respond. If he doesn't, then just go a bit closer. 
I repeated the process. I parked down the road and called out for Chase. There was no response. I edged a little further forward. Still no response. You will have to park directly outside her house, Oleander said. She's out of a job at the moment, I pointed out. She's likely to be at home. Like I said before, you have tinted windows, and she really won't notice anyone in the car. Stop worrying about everything. Oleander dismissed my concerns with a wave of her hand. I rubbed my eyes once more, being careful not to ruin my mascara, and edged on until I parked directly outside George's home. I was about to call out for Chase when Oleander said, Don't call out as loudly as last time. Chase, I said in more dulcet tones. Chase, are you here? I didn't expect anything, so I was surprised when he materialized right outside my window. He's here, I said to Oleander and Athanasius. Hi, Chase. The police still haven't solved your murder, so I'm wondering if you've come up with any other ideas. To my dismay, he shook his head. I don't have a clue. I rolled down my window. Why are you rolling down your window? Oleander said. The engine is running and you've got the air conditioner on. He's a ghost. You can hear him even with the window up. Shush, Athanasius said. Let Goldie do what she likes. So you still have no idea who murdered you? I asked him. He sighed long and hard. I'm afraid that's the case. I've been going over and over and over it in my mind. I suspected George's husband, but I overheard the police say that he has an ironclad alibi. Did you overhear anything else that the police said? Like maybe any talk of other suspects? He shook his head. That was all I heard. He's the only one I suspected. So if he didn't do it, then who did? I don't understand it. I know you didn't see whoever came up behind you and shot you, but after you had been shot, was there much of a gap between that time and between the time you realised you were a ghost? He looked puzzled. I'm not sure what you're getting at. I took a deep breath. I mean, in your ghostly form, you could have seen the murderer making a getaway. Oh, I see. He tapped his chin. That does make sense. No, I actually don't remember much about it at all. And I don't remember seeing anyone fleeing the scene. Someone typed something on your computer to make it look like suicide, I told him. You don't remember anyone doing that? He rubbed his temples with both hands. No, I don't remember a thing, but I wish I did. It's just so puzzling. Do you think it could be a case of mistaken identity? There is absolutely no one who wanted to kill me. I really don't think it would be a case of mistaken identity since you were the only vet at the clinic, I told him. And someone obviously did want to kill you because you're dead. It has to be someone you don't suspect. Can you give it a little more thought? I have given it nothing but a lot of thought, he said. I can tell you it's very boring for me just hanging around, and all I have to do is try to figure out who killed me. That being said, I don't have a clue. Not a clue at all. With that, he vanished. Chapter 16 Men don't like high-maintenance women, Goldie, said the voice. This was my mother's best friend, who had taken me under her wing after my parents passed away. When the phone rang that night, I hadn't meant to pick it up. Gertrude Hyacinth Clutterbuck always called on the landline at precisely five, which meant I never answered the phone when it rang at five of an evening. Persnickel, however, had decided he didn't like hearing the phone. By the third ring, he'd knocked it off the hook and onto the floor, and I was forced to speak to Gertrude. Does it really matter if some men don't like some high-maintenance women? I said. I had decided to take Persnickel for a walk. I thought his agitation about the colour orange might be because he didn't get enough exercise to soothe his frazzled wombat nerves. 
Nobody needed another wombat incident with the Dutch runners, especially not the Dutch runners. Your womb is empty, Goldie, empty. At least one of us should be worrying about that. Bye, Gertrude, I said. Whenever she started talking about wombs, it was my sign to get off the phone. Honestly, Goldie, she replied, which was her usual way of saying goodbye. I guess something Gertrude said stuck in my mind, because instead of walking Persnickel in my usual athletic wear of five-inch stilettos, I laced up my sneakers. I didn't even know I owned sneakers. I think I must have bought them accidentally while drunk. Most likely I'd bought them online after seeing a shirtless man jogging past the window on a night run and decided to take up jogging, only to sober up and come to my senses the next morning when the shoes had already been shipped. I shouldn't walk you at all, Persnickel, I told the wombat, clipping on his leash. You made me talk to my aunt, after all. I headed in a different direction, thinking I should try something new. We made it down several blocks before an incident occurred. Persnickel caught sight of a gnome with an orange hat and broke free from my grip, ploughing into the garden to destroy the defenceless garden ornament. You all right there? I was trying to tear Persnickel away from the evidence when Max stuck his head out a window. Is this your house? I asked him. It sure is. And is that your garden gnome? Not anymore, he replied, pointing to the bits of pottery scattered around the garden. Come inside, Goldie. Something important is happening in here. Nothing important was happening in Max's house, because Max was watching The Bachelor. He's getting rid of Mandy tonight, Max informed me, as he set down a bowl of water for Persnickel. I'll bet you anything. I was not allowed to talk during The Bachelor, although Max was allowed to speak. In great detail, he explained who was the favourite to win, who would actually win, and who was the meanest. I was relieved when The Bachelor finally came to an end. I mean, I enjoyed the show, but not that much. Max turned around as if seeing me for the first time. He gasped, Goldie, you don't look the same as usual. My hand automatically went to my hair. Oh, you mean my new hairstyle? You've seen it before. He shook his head. No, it's the clothes. And those shoes. Oh. I looked down at my sneakers and then said the first thing that came into my head. I've been in training for that run that's coming up soon, the East Bucklebury run. Max looked impressed. You have? Which one are you doing? The half marathon, the 10K or the 5K run? I automatically picked the shortest. The 5K, I said. He continued to look impressed for a moment, but then his expression changed. Be careful, won't you, Goldie? Most of the suspects are runners. They will be in those races. I filed that piece of information away. It might prove useful later. I'm sorry about your garden, Gnome. He waved a hand in dismissal. I didn't like it, to be honest. But on the other hand, I did treasure it because Oleander gave it to me. I nodded absently, looking around Max's house. For some reason, I'd imagined him living in a renovated Queenslander, but instead he was in a renovated modern, but now even more modern, house. I figured it had started life as a brick building, but now was rendered and white. The furniture was sparse, just two chocolate brown sofas contrasting with the white walls and white tiled floor. It was all very bachelor pad, apart from a giant Japanese peace lily and several turquoise cushions. The ceilings were high, and through the far windows I could see the sparkling water of the canal. Max cleared his throat, interrupting my thoughts. I was about to cook dinner. Would you like some dinner? I was taken aback. Dinner? In Max's home? Would this be romantic? Or had he friend-zoned me? He wasn't acting romantic. Still, I wasn't going to refuse. Yes, that would be lovely. Thank you. Can I do anything to help? He looked doubtful. Can you cook? I was offended. Of course I can cook. I lived alone in Melbourne. I didn't add that I had always ordered in food. I didn't have time to cook in Melbourne, even if I had wanted to, not with the long hours I had worked. 
Come to the kitchen, and at least you can have a glass of wine and talk to me while I prepare dinner, Max said. Do you eat eggplant lasagna? I nodded. Sounds nice. When we reached the kitchen, only a few steps away, I realised why Persnickel had been quiet and why he hadn't eaten the Japanese peace lily in the corner of Max's living room. He was making happy gurgling sounds while rolling around on his back. Oh no, I screeched, pointing to a carton of cask wine. It was lying on its side and wine was dripping out. How did he reach that? Max scratched his head. I have no idea. It was on the counter. I didn't think he was so agile. He's remarkably agile when he wants to be, I said. Do you think he'll be all right? Max examined the damage. He hasn't had much. But then again, it probably doesn't take much wine to get a wombat drunk. I was appalled. I was clearly an irresponsible wombat mother. Then again, Persnickel was an awfully naughty wombat. How will we sober him up? I asked him. We'll just have to wait for him to sober up, Max said. He didn't drink much, so it shouldn't take long. You won't be able to take him home like that. I don't think even the two of us would be able to lift him all the way out to my car. I readily agreed. Max and I soon fell into comfortable conversation while we made the dinner. To be precise, he prepared the dinner, although I was able to help by passing him vegetables and refilling our wine glasses. All the while, Persnickel rolled around on his back, burping loudly at intervals. Max put the lasagna in the oven and suggested we go back into the living room. Do you think Persnickel will be all right by himself? I asked him. I'm sure he will. He seems to be sobering up. Persnickel rolled onto his side, stood up, and then proceeded to roll over again, kicking his legs in the air and making strange gurgling sounds. He certainly seems happy, I said. As soon as I sat opposite Max, for the first time that night I felt a little awkward. Butterflies went crazy in my stomach every time I was around him, but there was nothing to show that it was reciprocated. Have the police been giving you a hard time? Max asked me. I nodded and then shrugged. Yes and no. After what happened to Oleander, I was afraid I'd already be in the Southport watch house. Max frowned deeply. I wouldn't let that happen, Goldie. I waved my finger at him. Thanks for the sentiment, but you would probably be powerless to stop them if they set their minds to it. They've been rather incessant with their questioning, but I do think they're probably more suspicious of Georgia Garrison. After all, she was having an affair with the victim, and I don't think they've been able to find any evidence to disprove that I hadn't met him before. Max nodded. I looked at the way his casual shirt hung on his muscled shoulders. With some difficulty, I dragged my eyes away and forced myself to focus on the Japanese peace lily in the corner. In your favour is the fact that the gunshot residue results are expected in a few days, he said. That will prove that you didn't have anything to do with it, and Georgia for that matter. The police are probably loath to make any moves before they get the hard evidence, which is surely only a few days away. Thank goodness for the gunshot residue test, I said. It's a pity it takes so long. Max shrugged one shoulder. It doesn't take so long in all states. Max said, but never mind, the results will be back soon. Who do you think did it? I asked him. Max shot me a look that was full of suspicion. Goldie, you're not trying to do any sleuthing on your own, are you? Of course not, I protested, injecting as much sincerity into my voice as I could. You can't blame me for being curious, though. I was the one who found the body. Max tapped his chin. I would think perhaps George's husband, but he wasn't even in the country at the time, and I'm sure even Detectives Power and Walters would have checked up on that alibi. That only leaves Georgia and the male vet nurse. What's his name again? Adrian Young, I supplied. He nodded. Yes, Adrian Young. I don't know what his motive could be, though. And then there's Bree, the victim's wife, and her motive could be the money, or for the fact she was angry with him for having affairs. Bree told me that Adrian was stealing money from the vet clinic, small amounts, and that her husband was about to confront him, I said. 
His eyebrows shot up. When did you speak with her? We had a long conversation at the funeral, I said. That wasn't exactly lying, but it wasn't the full truth either. Georgia had also told me, and even Adrian had confessed it, all being under the influence of the truth spell. I felt bad keeping everything I knew from Max, but then again he wasn't on the case, and I knew he would scold me if he suspected I was investigating. Who do you think did it, Goldie? I don't know. I would say Georgia, but I saw how stunned she was. I know she's licensed to have a rifle, but she did look really shocked. Then again, she could be just a very good actress. Max nodded. You'd be surprised. Murderers can be good actors, and she would have known she had to pretend to be very upset, so she would have had plenty of time to prepare. I suppose. There is also Chase's best friend, Nico, although I don't know what his motive could possibly be. Yes, but just because we don't know what a motive is doesn't mean someone hasn't got one, Max said. I'd better check the lasagna. He stood up. I stood too. I had better check Persnickel. As we walked into the kitchen, Persnickel wobbled out. He was none too steady on his feet. He walked over to the television and then looked around at me. I don't suppose you have any DVDs of Starsky and Hutch? No. Max's eyebrows shot skyward. Never mind. Persnickel had already fallen asleep. He snored loudly. Soon Max and I were sitting at his dining room table, enjoying a glass of red wine and overlooking the sea. It's a beautiful view from here, I said to Max. He agreed. It is. But I must say I do miss the surf. That's one of the drawbacks of living at the North Gold Coast. It's all broad water and no surf. I didn't know what the broad water was until someone explained it to me when I first moved here. I told him, it's that bit of sea between here and that huge island over there. All the surf breaks on the island, so all the water between here and the island is flat. They call that flat water the broad water? Yes, and that's Stradbroke Island, Max said. The male vet nurse, I can never remember his name, works there once a week, tomorrow in fact. There's a vet clinic out on the island, I asked him. He shook his head. No, he works at one of the resorts. Stradbroke Island mainly has resorts and holiday homes. Not too many people live there permanently. The only way across is by boat, and it takes about an hour. He works there every Saturday morning. That's tomorrow, I said, a plan forming in my mind. Max nodded. I do like the north part of Gold Coast, as I said but it would be just perfect if there was surf. There's nothing like the sound of the surf and the lovely beaches. I agreed. When I was told I'd inherited a beachside house, I imagined waves and surf and big golden sandy beaches like they have at Main Beach and all around Broad Beach, Surfers Paradise, Mermaid Beach, Miami, Burley Heads, all down the coast like that. So you've seen those beaches already, have you? Max asked me. I shook my head. Hardly at all. I haven't really done any exploring since I've been here. We'll have to remedy that, Max said. How about you and I? He was interrupted by a knock on his door. I wasn't expecting anyone, he said. Max crossed to open the door and said a surprised hello as a man pushed into the room. I remembered him as the man who had taken Max from my house the other night. You again? he said in an accusing voice. What of it? I responded rather rudely before I caught myself. What are you doing here? I was about to ask him what business it was of his when Max spoke. Ms. Bloom was out walking her wombat when he destroyed my garden gnome. That's right, I said. Max looked out the door and I apologized, but he couldn't speak to me because he was watching The Bachelor. Persnickel, that's my wombat, went into Max's kitchen and drank his cask wine, and now he's drunk. I pointed to the snoring wombat. And now Ms. Bloom has to wait until her wombat sobers up before she can walk him back to her place, Max said. The man's jaw hung open further and further as our tale progressed. It was clear he did not believe Max. But still, what business was it of his? That has to be one of the most far-fetched stories I've ever heard. He said, Grayson, 
I need a word with you. They both went outside. I could hear raised voices, but I couldn't hear what they were saying. The voices even woke up Persnickel, who jumped up and headed for the Japanese peace lily. I hurried over to him and clipped on his leash. Clearly, the evening was ruined by the mysterious stranger, and Persnickel wasn't going to behave himself while I finished the dinner with Max. As I opened the front door, both men stopped speaking abruptly. Both their faces were bright red. Thanks for dinner, Max, I said, glaring at the other man. Persnickel just woke up and headed for your potted plants, so I thought I'd take him home. Now he seems none the worse for wear. I pushed between them and hurried on my way. Chapter 17 Athanasius, Oleander and I were all at the Hope Island Marina, about to catch the ferry across to North Stradbroke Island. They were none too pleased, even though I had offered to pay for their tickets. I get seasick, Oleander complained, even if the boat rocks ever so slightly. Athanasius wiggled his eyebrows. So do I. It's all right for you, Goldie. You're a sea witch. I sighed. Yes, and it would help if you would tell me more about what sea witches can do. Oleander and Athanasius exchanged glances. I'm afraid you'll have to discover that for yourself, Goldie, Oleander said. Besides, Athanasius and I are not sea witches. I've already told you everything I know about sea witches. Her eyes flickered strangely when she said it, so I suspected she wasn't telling me the whole truth. It's only about fifty minutes. I said, and the ferry is big. I'm sure it's fine. It's often a rough crossing, Athanasius countered. Are you absolutely certain Adrian Young is catching the ferry today? I nodded vigorously. Max told me he was. He said he works at one of the resorts on Stradbroke Island every Saturday morning. Well, he hasn't shown up yet, Oleander said. Let's give him another five minutes and then we can go home. I rolled my eyes. I thought you two would be happy to help me investigate a suspect. We are, Oleander said. We just don't want to get tossed overboard and eaten by sharks. There are bull sharks and even great white pointers here in these canals. I rubbed my forehead. Oleander was certainly being overly dramatic. Look, I'm sure he has to start work at nine, which means he'll be along any minute, I said in what I hoped was an encouraging tone. Don't forget the plan. We're going to pretend we're having a nice tourist day on the island and we'll engage him in conversation. I hope it works, Athanasius said. Try to stay composed, won't you, Goldie? For a minute I didn't understand what he meant, but then I remembered that I could brew up a storm. Something occurred to me. You know, I think I could make the crossing calm. What do you mean? Oleander asked me. I took a deep breath before answering. If I can make a storm happen when I get angry or upset, surely if I concentrate, I can make the sea calm. Oleander looked doubtful, but said, I suppose so. It's certainly worth a shot. Oh, look, here he comes now. We all hurried into the ticket office and I bought our tickets before Adrian could get a good look at us. The ticket seller told us we could go ahead and board the ferry. He also told me all about his health problems in more detail than I ever wanted to know. I was glad the ferry wasn't already fully booked, because when I was googling it, I noticed that it did recommend advanced bookings. Of course, as we didn't know the time that Adrian would be catching the ferry, it would have been a waste of time and money to book ahead. I'm glad it all worked out. Surely this was a good sign for the rest of the day. The sea was blue-green and inviting, as we took our seats, I said to Oleander, I wonder if we'll see any dolphins. She shook her head. More like snakes and goannas. I was shocked. What do you mean? Stradbroke Island is well known for snakes and goannas, she said in a matter-of-fact tone. But surely no tourists would go over there if there are snakes, I asked her. There are three main towns on Stradbroke Island, but most of it is still a wilderness, she said. Trust me, there are lots of snakes on it. That didn't sound good to me. I wasn't overly fond of snakes, 
especially not the venomous ones. Adrian walked in. I plastered a fake surprised expression across my face. Hello, I said. Are you having a nice day out at Stradbroke Island too? No, I work there every Saturday at one of the resorts, he said. I smiled and nodded. I've never been there, as I only arrived in town recently, but Oleander and Athanasius said it's a beautiful place to visit. There are lots of snakes at this time of year, he said. I clutched my throat. Are you serious? Or are you just trying to scare me? It's not one of those jokes like the mythical drop bears that everyone likes to scare overseas tourists with. He laughed and shook his head. No, there are lots of snakes at this time of year, and goannas, but the goannas are harmless. That is, of course, unless they think you're a tree and run up you, causing nasty, seriously deep scratches, he said as an afterthought. I rubbed my forehead. The day was going downhill rapidly. The snakes and the goannas don't go anywhere near the tourist areas, though. I beamed at him. That's a relief. So you said you work on a resort? I asked. There's a vet clinic on Stradbroke Island. Of course, I already knew the answer, but I was trying to draw him into conversation, and for once I was in luck because he was sitting next to me. It looked as though I would have a long time to speak with him and interrogate him. He chatted for a moment about Stradbroke Island and then said, Are those gunshot residue results back yet? I must have looked startled because he hastened to add, I don't suspect you, not at all. I know you hadn't met Chase. That's a relief, to tell you the truth, I said. For a minute I thought you thought I did it. I thought so too, Athanasius added, leaning across. Who do you think did it, Adrian, if you don't mind me asking? Oleander asked him. He went to speak, but then appeared to catch himself. It's hard to say. I mean, it's hard to believe anyone would have murdered Chase. It just doesn't seem real. I still can't accept that it's happened. What's going to happen with the vet clinic? I asked him. He shrugged. I don't know. I expect Bree will sell it. Athanasius clutched his seat as the boat started out into the canal. I gave him a look of reassurance. If the waters got choppy, I was confident I could calm them. Don't ask me why, but I was certain. If Bree sells the clinic, it's likely that Georgia and I will keep our jobs, he said, unless the new vet brings staff along. I don't know why a vet would want to move to East Bucklebury, though. I suppose there is no competition, I pointed out. He laughed and nodded. There is that. I waved one hand at him. I'm sorry, you were telling me who you thought did it, and then I interrupted you and changed the subject. That wasn't exactly what had happened, but I hoped he would swallow the bait. I don't know who did it, he said. I suspected a couple of people, but it just doesn't seem real. Someone did it, though, I said. That's true. At any rate, I hope the new vet puts me on full time, because it's exhausting holding down two jobs. Well, I really only have one job at the moment, don't I? And it's part-time. I wonder what Georgia will do if she loses her job, I said. I can easily get more work as a kitchen hand, but she's not trained for anything else. Only acting, he said. Acting? I echoed. He laughed. And we know that's not a steady job. Yes, she trained at NIDA. You know, the National Institute of Dramatic Art in Sydney. She studied acting. Then she got married and they moved to East Buckleberry, so she trained as a vet nurse because she and her husband love animals so much. I nodded and looked out to sea. The water was choppy, so I shut my eyes and focused on the water being calm. As I did, I felt everything flow smoothly. There were no words to describe it. It had to be experienced. I opened my eyes, and Athanasius and Oleander were beaming at me. Are you all right? Adrian asked me. You don't like the sea? To the contrary, I absolutely love the sea, I told him. I love being near the sea. I don't know how I managed to live in Melbourne all those years. I know it's technically coastal, but nothing like here. My house is directly on the broad water, and I'd love to spend more time in a boat. The water is awfully calm today, I must say, Adrian said. Sometimes the sea gets quite choppy. 
You know, if you bought a boat, it would be quite close for you to get across to South Stradbroke Island. It's only a hop, step and a jump across from East Bucklebury. I thought that when I looked at the map, I told him. I wonder why there isn't a ferry across from East Bucklebury to South Stradbroke Island. He laughed. I think people would rather catch the ferry from the Runaway Bay Marina or the Hope Island Marina rather than drive up north to East Bucklebury. I suppose. I'd love my own boat, I added. I'll just have to make a lot of money in my job. What is your job? He asked me. A real estate agent, I told him. I have to manage an office in Southport. I start next week. That sounds like interesting work, he said. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll just take a nap. I always like to take a nap on the ferry. I hoped the disappointment didn't show up on my face. I hadn't found out a single useful piece of information. I had to concentrate on making the sea calm a few more times before we reached the island. And to my relief, Adrian woke up just as we were approaching Stradbroke Island. Did you have a good sleep? Yes, I did, thanks, he said. Are you going in the run tomorrow? I asked him. Yes, he said. It's a bit sad, though, what with Chase's death and all that. He used to like to run it every year. He always tried to beat his best friend Nico, and he always did. He broke off and laughed. I'm sure Chase used to run just a little in front of Nico, simply to taunt him. It's a shame about Nico's wife, Helen. That was the first I had heard about Nico's wife. Is something wrong with her? His face flushed red, and then he said, oh, I really shouldn't say, but she's an alcoholic. Nico dotes on her, though. He's tried to get her help, but it just doesn't work. I wonder why she's an alcoholic, I said. Aren't they happily married or something? He shook his head. I think they are happily married. I have no idea why she's an alcoholic. Anyway, nice to see you all again. He stood up and joined the line to get off the boat. What do we do now? Oleander asked me. Do we catch the ferry straight back? No, that wouldn't look good, I said. If Adrian is the murderer, it will make him suspicious. We need to do some sightseeing. Come on, I'll buy you both lunch. It's only nine in the morning, Athanasius pointed out. All right, how about some coffee? Their faces lit up. Chapter 18 You know, Goldie, it was most impressive how you made the sea calm. That was you, wasn't it? Athanasius clasped his hands and leant forward on the wooden table. I smiled widely. Yes, it was. It was very fulfilling. I'm glad I'm finally coming into my powers. I'm sure I have other powers, only I don't know what they are yet. Oleander patted my hand. You'll find out soon enough. Right now you're doing a good job of influencing the weather. We were sitting at a cafe not far from the beach. It was a most appealing scene. The cafe behind us that made good coffee, while we were sitting at wooden tables and chairs, under umbrellas in bright colours of yellow and red. Wild kangaroos were scattered around the grassed area that led down to the pretty sandy beach. There was neither a snake nor a goanna in sight. Don't look now, Goldie, Oleander said, but is that man following us? I made to turn around, but Oleander grabbed my wrist. I said not to look around, she hissed. If I don't look around, how will I know who he is? I said. You have a point. Why don't you go inside and order food for all of us and steal a look at him then? What would you like? Athanasius and Oleander looked at the menu. My treat, of course since I twisted your arms to come here, I added. They both smiled and thanked me. I'd like the caramelized apples with cinnamon and maple syrup, please, Athanasius said. Yes, I'd like that too, Goldie. This coffee is really good. Would you like me to order some more coffee? Oleander laughed. No, it wasn't a hint. This one cup will do me fine. I got up from the table and made my way back to the building to order. As I walked, I cast a surreptitious look at the man and did my best not to gasp. He was the one who had come to Max's house the night before and had seemed rather annoyed to see me there. I lined up and then when it was my turn I ordered, 
and then I made my way back to the table, avoiding looking at the man this time. You recognize him? Oleander whispered. I nodded. You remember that I mentioned that a man came to my house when Max just happened to be there and asked Max to go with him? They both nodded. I pushed on. Well, that's him. And I just happened to be around at Max's house last night. Athanasius gasped. You were at Max's house last night. I nodded and then shook my head. Yes, well, no. Actually, I didn't know it was Max's house. I was taking Persnickel for a long walk on a different route, and when we got to one of the houses on the canal, he ate a garden gnome under a palm tree. I'm so sorry, Oleander. It was the one you had given Max. He was awfully distraught about it. Oleander's face fell, but then she added, No worries. I'll buy him another one just like it. I smothered a giggle. That's very kind of you. Anyway, Max came out to see what all the commotion was about. He invited me inside and Persnickel got drunk. I was about to say more, but Athanasius interrupted me. Persnickel got drunk? I shrugged. Yes, he somehow got up and knocked over the cask wine and drank a bit of it. Anyway, Max rustled up a quick dinner while I waited for Persnickel to sober up. And the man came to the door. He acted like I shouldn't have been there. And then they both went outside and had an argument. Did you hear what they were saying? Oleander asked me. No, I didn't. But Persnickel had somewhat recovered by then, so I took him home. I wonder what it was all about. He looks like a cop to me, Athanasius said. Perhaps Max is under some sort of investigation. You said he was on leave, didn't you? I nodded. I knew Max's department was under investigation, but I had been sworn to secrecy. Maybe Max is being investigated for something, and that man is following him, Athanasius said. Then why is he following me? I said. I don't like it. He even came to my house, which I think is quite rude. Why don't you ask Max who he is? Oleander said. I twisted about in my seat. Max hasn't volunteered the information, so I don't like to ask him. Oleander was persistent. Why don't you like to ask him? I shrugged. I just don't like to ask him. I feel bad and pushy. To change the subject, I said, Do either of you know anything about Stradbroke Island? To my relief, they were easily distracted. Yes, it's most interesting, Athanasius said. It involves one of your ancestors. It does? I asked him. I didn't know that. He was a sea witch, Oleander said. He was coming out from Port Glasgow on the Canvas Wallace, a 75 metre steel bark. It all happened in 1894. What happened? I asked, impatient to hear about my ancestor. North Stradbroke Island and South Stradbroke Island are now separated by a huge channel, Athanasius continued. But back in 1894, the distance between them was only about 20 feet. You're showing your age now, Oleander said. Get with the program, Athanasius. We use meters now, not feet, and have ever since Australia changed to metric in 1974. Athanasius simply shrugged. Who's telling the story? He smiled and continued. Anyway, the Canvas Wallace was sailing along happily, but it ran aground in heavy seas just off Stradbroke Island. Most of the crew got to shore, but six men perished. The ship completely broke up. The cargo was whiskey and dynamite. One of the stories says that the explosives were deliberately detonated, and another story says the dynamite was unstable and eventually detonated. Which one was it? I asked, intrigued. Both Oleander and Athanasius shook their heads. Neither, Athanasius said. The ship wasn't carrying explosives at all. Your ancestor was one of the survivors who swam to shore. He was a sea witch, of course. He'd been followed by another witch who was on the steamer, the South Australian. This other witch, seeing the shipwreck, thought that was an opportune time to attack him, figuring he had been weakened in the shipwreck. They had an enormous witch battle, which had the same effect as an explosion. Your ancestor was victorious. No one knows what happened to the other witch, because he was never seen again. But the result was that large craters were left on the beach. 
Unfortunately, the beach was severely damaged. Two years after that, there was a cyclone that further eroded the beach, and that's why now there is a wide channel. You can blame your ancestor for that. I'm sure he was only acting in self-defense, I said. Athanasius held up both hands. Of course, I wasn't actually blaming him personally for the erosion. Anyway, that's why the big island was divided into two sand islands, North Stradbroke Island and South Stradbroke Island, all because of the sea witch, your ancestor. Wow, look at the giant pelicans, Oleander said as two pelicans waddled over to us. I smiled. They remind me of Persnickel. I think they're used to being fed just like the local kangaroos. It would be good to come back and explore the island one day when we're not in the middle of a murder investigation, Athanasius said. I thought you never wanted to go to Stradbroke Island, Oleander said. He shook his head. Now that we have Goldie with us, we know it won't be a rough crossing. He beamed at me. Goldie, Oleander and I have been talking and... And you won't like what we're about to say, Oleander chimed in. Athanasius frowned at her. That's no way to sell it to her, Oleander. His tone was filled with disapproval. I don't like the sound of this, I said. What do you want me to do? Last night, Oleander and I made a list of suspects, Athanasius said. He held up his hand and ticked off his fingers one by one. Georgia Garrison, Bree Evans, Adrian Young, Nico North. Yes, what of it? I arched my eyebrows. They are all running in the East Bucklebury races tomorrow, Athanasius said. A sinking feeling settled in the pit of my stomach. So? What of it? Oleander and I think it would be a good idea if you went in one of the races. I made to protest, but he continued. It's the only opportunity where all the suspects will be in the one place at the one time. Obviously, Oleander and I can't run because we're unfit, or we'd do it ourselves. But we think you should go, because you'll see all the suspects together and see how they interact with each other. It seems a very bad idea to me, I said firmly. Besides, I can't run five kilometres. Some people will be walking, Oleander pointed out. But how will that help? I asked her. The suspects will be running much faster than I will, so I can hardly run along next to them and chat. I really don't see what you think I can find out. This is a shocking idea. Both of them appeared undaunted. They have runners-only areas where you can mingle after the event, Athanasius said. Look, time is ticking on, and we still don't suspect one person over another. We have to do something if we want to break this case open. Don't you agree? I'm not fit, I protested. Surely you have running shoes, Oleander said. I do have my sneakers, I suppose. I knew I was beaten. Right. I will do this, but I don't know what you think I'm going to find out, and I'll probably have to walk most of the way. Both Athanasius and Oleander beamed. Chapter 19 This is a crazy idea, I muttered to myself after I paid for my entry. I looked around at all the fit people stretching and jogging on the spot. I hoped I wasn't going to come last. But then again, Athanasius and Oleander had assured me that some people would be walking. I wanted to run faster so it would be over more quickly. Bree and Adrian were wearing numbers, and I positioned myself behind them at the start line. I knew everyone was going to run fast and soon leave me for dead. I was surprised to see Bree. Still, I supposed she wouldn't be able to keep her trim figure without some form of exercise, and I had thought it had all been due to stomach stapling. Bree looked me up and down. Goldie, I like what you're wearing. I'm amazed you can actually run in it. Marquesa, isn't it? I nodded happily. Yes, I thought this short dress went well over my shorts. And you're wearing Stella McCartney? She smiled. I am. I thought it more suitable for running than Prada. She looked at the crowd and scowled. 
Everyone else seems to be wearing off the rack. Her very pause exuded disapproval. I looked around to glare at Oleander and Athanasius, but they both gave me the thumbs up. It was too late to back out. Probably. Oh well, all I had to do was finish the race and then hang around in the after-run crowd. Oleander was sure that the lack of oxygen in someone's head after a race would make them more likely to talk. It sounded like a crazy idea to me, but I was here now and I would have to make the most of it. I was glad the suspects, apart from Nico North, were running in the 5K race and not the half marathon or the 10K race. There was no way I could run more than 5K on a good day. I took a few deep breaths and consoled myself with the thought that the course was all flat. A man announced over the microphone that the race was about to start and asked everyone to get ready. Several people elbowed me in the ribs and I elbowed them back. The starting gun sounded and everyone took off. Even if I had wanted to go faster, I wouldn't have been able to because I was stuck in the middle of a tight crowd. Before too long, everyone spread out and I found myself at the back of the field. I looked behind me and was surprised to see a whole stream of people back up the road. That was somewhat of a relief because I sure was running slowly and I hadn't thought I would beat anyone home. I smiled to myself and kept going at a slow jog. Even though it was early morning, the Queensland sun was beating down upon me. I still hadn't adjusted to the climate, coming from cold Melbourne. This Gold Coast heat was something else again, and then there was the humidity. Even my walks with Persnickel always left me hot, with my false eyelashes sticking together. I wondered where the first water station was. Luckily, it soon came into sight. I stopped to drink, but noticed other people were drinking while they ran and then throwing water over themselves. I grabbed another cup of water and tried to drink as I ran, which proved quite difficult. I gave up and threw the water over me. It was indeed refreshing, so I decided to use that technique from now on. I had lost sight of all the suspects, but I really didn't care. All I wanted to do was finish the race. I realised this whole thing was entirely futile. How on earth did Athanasius and Oleander think I would be able to keep up with any of the suspects? I was sure it was a complete waste of time. I only hoped they were right about the suspects chatting to me after the event. I ran on even more slowly and then ran through another water station. I slowed down to drink the water but still found it hard to drink on the run. I came to a stop gulped the water, and then threw the rest over me. About fifty runners passed me, but I didn't care. I certainly wasn't going to win any prizes, not even one for my age group, especially as I had lied about my age and might have made myself a full ten years younger on the entry form. I kept running, wondering why some people said they ran for fun. There wasn't anything enjoyable about it, my throat was on fire and my breath was coming in ragged gulps. I hoped I was approaching the finish line. Over half an hour later, I saw a sign that said 1K. I hoped that meant I only had one kilometre to go. I didn't think this race would ever end. All I could think of was a nice cool shower and several cups of coffee, maybe even several glasses of wine. I kept running but as I approached the water station, some of the people from the Netherlands passed in a crowd and pushed me over to the side. I thought of coming to a stop and waiting until they went past, but I wanted to get this race over with as soon as I could. After all, I'd be back soon and I could drink water at the finish. As I kept running, locals lined the side of the road, yelling encouragement. You can do it! A woman yelled at me and waved. I waved back. She was holding out a cup, which I thought was water. I took it from her and thanked her, but she screamed, No! Sorry! I yelled over my shoulder, and then I threw the water over my face. I screamed in pain. It was not water, but scalding hot coffee. I ran blindly, wiping the hot liquid out of my face. When I opened my eyes again, I saw a muddy puddle on the side of the road from the previous night's rain. I knelt down and scooped the muddy water all over my face. It brought instant relief. 
I scooped up some mud and pressed it into my cheeks, and at once the pain lessened. I stood up, and the people from the Netherlands ran past me again. They were running quite slowly, so I dropped in behind them. I ran for another five minutes. Surely I should have been at the finish line by now. This was rather strange. I was certain I only had 500 metres left to run when I'd had the coffee incident, and surely it wouldn't take someone more than five minutes to run 500 metres. Maybe I was running more slowly than I thought. I was disoriented because there were mangrove swamps on both sides of the road and all the scenery looked the same. I hoped the Netherlands people weren't lost and were heading into Southport or somewhere horrendously far away like that. But then other people wearing numbers ran past us. I breathed a sigh of relief. Maybe the 1K sign was a mistake. I looked at my watch. 50 minutes. That was a long time to run five kilometres. There was nothing I could do but push on. My legs were aching and every breath hurt. I slowed down into a survival shuffle, something between a walk and run. I walked for a few steps, but felt if I kept walking I would collapse on the side of the road, so I forced myself back into a shuffle. Lots of people passed me. When I came to the next water station, I stopped and bent over, gasping for breath. How much further is it? I asked one of the ladies as soon as I could manage to speak. Only two kilometres to go, she said in an encouraging tone. Two kilometres? I must be running the slowest five-kilometre race on record. But still, there were people behind me, so I didn't feel too bad. I thanked her, drank two glasses of water, and then threw another one over my face. I hope my face didn't have scald marks from the coffee. After what seemed an age, I came to another 1K sign. You can do it, I exhorted myself aloud, even if you have to walk. My vision had gone funny, and I realised I was weaving all over the road. I kept going, and then I found a 500M sign. I couldn't believe my luck. In 500 metres, this infernal run would finish. I would have smiled, only my facial muscles were too tired to move. Finally, I saw the finish line in sight. As I approached, people shot me worrying looks. The last thing I remembered was crossing the finishing line. I awoke in the medical tent. Georgia was bending over me. Have I died and come back as a dog? I asked her. She laughed. No, I'm helping out by volunteering. But you're a vet nurse, I said. I'm also a qualified nurse, a human nurse, she said with a laugh. That was my very first job when I left school. Oh, I thought you were a trained actor, I said. She shot me a black look. Who told you that? She snapped. Adrian. She handed me a bottle. Drink this. It's electrolytes. You're dehydrated. I feel awful, I told her. I didn't realize it would take me so long to run five kilometers. She shot me a look. You ran ten kilometers. I shook my head. No, I definitely went in the 5K race. No, you didn't, she insisted. No wonder it took me so long, I said, sitting upright quickly. A wave of dizziness hit me, so I lay back down. Sit here for a while until you feel better, and make sure you drink all that, and then drink this water as well, she told me. I had some sort of aluminium blanket over me, and I clutched it to me. I felt cold all of a sudden. I don't feel well, I admitted. Everything hurts. My legs hurt. My lungs hurt. My face hurts. You are bright red, Georgia said. You can have a free massage once you've rehydrated. I can't imagine how I ran ten kilometres, I told her. Oleander and Athanasius must have been right. They said when people run too hard, all the oxygen leaves their brain. Georgia merely laughed. After I drank two bottles of red electrolyte drink, as well as a bottle of water, Georgia released me. She said I could jump the queue to have a leg massage, but I desperately wanted a bathroom break after drinking so much. People were lined up outside the portable toilets, much to my horror, so I had to wait. After my bathroom break, I was heading back for my free leg massage when I ran into Athanasius and Oleander. 
Goldie, are you all right? Oleander asked. She seized my elbow and stared into my face. No, and it's all your fault, I said, on the point of tears. I accidentally ran the ten kilometre race instead of the five kilometre race. I have no idea how it happened. We saw you, Athanasius said. We were there to cheer you on. You took a cup of water from a spectator and threw it over your face. That seemed to give you a new lease of life, because you took off at a fast sprint, and instead of sprinting for the finish line, you sprinted off on the 10k course. Yes, Oleander said. I thought you must have been dehydrated. And after you had that drink of water, I figured you must have felt so good that you decided to go on to the 10k race instead. That was coffee. I muttered angrily, and I didn't drink it. Coffee? They both repeated, their faces scrunched up. I waved my arms at them. Yes, coffee, I yelled. Someone handed me hot coffee. At least, I don't think she meant to hand me coffee. Athanasius and Oleander looked confused. I threw the coffee in my face and it stung and I couldn't see. That must have been when I took off in the wrong direction, because I couldn't see. I said again, no wonder coffee's illegal in this town. I put my hands on my hips and glared at both of them. To my disgust, they were clutching their sides and doing their best not to laugh. Have you had a chance to speak to any of the suspects? Oleander finally asked me. No, they all ran much faster than I did, so they've probably all gone home by now. I said pointedly, Georgia treated me in the medical tent. Athanasius rubbed his forehead. Georgia? But she's a vet nurse. She is a people nurse too, apparently, I said. Have you seen any of the suspects? They both shook their heads. I'm going for a free leg massage now. I made to storm off, but my legs wouldn't move. Chapter 20 after the race, I took two Nurofen, turned on the TV for Persnickel, and went to bed. I wanted to have a nice hot bath filled with Epsom salts, but I was too tired. Every muscle hurt, and I couldn't bend my knees. My feet sported the most horrendous blisters. I had trouble getting to sleep. Still, I must have fallen into a deep sleep, because I was shocked when I looked at the time on my phone upon awakening. It was already afternoon and I had a therapy wombat session that afternoon. I had started the therapy wombat idea as a ruse, but the East Bucklebury Retirement Home had latched onto it with glee. I had no option but to continue the charade, and besides, the residents enjoyed their visits from Persnickel. I gingerly lowered myself over the edge of the bed. My whole back ached, and the sides of my knees felt like someone was sticking red-hot pokers in them. I could bend my knees a little more, but I still couldn't bend them fully. I winced and rubbed my eyes. I staggered for the bathroom and turned on the hot water before throwing in a whole packet of bath salts. I picked up my phone and stared at it more closely. There was a missed call from Max. What on earth did he want? With my heart thumping, I called him back, but it went straight to message bank. I hung up. There was also a missed call from a number I didn't recognise, but I was sure it was the police. Why would they call me on a Sunday if not to ask me to come in for questioning? I hobbled over to the window and looked out. There was no sign of them, and they hadn't left a voicemail. That had to be good. I lowered myself into the bath, and soon the hot water was soothing my aching muscles. Even my shoulders hurt. The hot water stung my blisters, but there was nothing I could do about that. I would just have to wear stilettos with straps thin enough to avoid all my blisters on my heels and my toes. I didn't want to get out of the bath and kept topping it up with hot water, but time was ticking away. I finally managed to climb out of the bath and get dressed. I had even been too tired to cleanse my face, so I just plastered more makeup on top of it. I grabbed my bag of wombat treats and popped them in my handbag and then fetched Persnickel's car harness and leash. When he saw me, he did a happy dance. You have to be a good wombat today, I told him. It's a therapy wombat session. 
He obviously didn't care less where he was going, so long as he was going in the car. I fastened his therapy wombat blanket over him and then attached his car harness. I managed to lift Persnickel into the car, but when it came to getting into the front seat, my legs wouldn't bend. I had to sit on the seat with my legs outstretched, gently bend one and lift it in, and then do the same with the other foot. Why did people run? The attraction simply escaped me. I drove to the retirement home, wishing I had brought more neurofin with me. I could certainly do with another dose. Maybe Oleander or Athanasius had some. When I reached the car park, I was surprised to see one of the nurses waiting for me. Miss Bloom, I'm so happy to see you, she said. The residents have been talking about it all day. They absolutely love your wombat, Chris Nickel. Purse Nickel, I corrected her. She looked puzzled, but smiled and nodded. I got Purse Nickel out of the car and followed the nurse to where the residents were waiting under a pergola, sagging under the weight of heavy grapevines. The nurse smiled. When my uncle died, my mother couldn't bear to look inside his casket, so she asked me to put some of her gold jewellery in with him. I stole it. To this day, she thinks it was buried with him. And you know, I don't even feel guilty, because he won't need it in the afterlife. It's not as if he's an ancient Egyptian, is it? I was dumbstruck. I had no idea what to say, so I simply nodded. I think I would have made a good professional thief if I'd lived in the city, she continued. I would have only stolen from the rich and given to the poor like Robin Hood. With one small difference, I wouldn't have given it to the poor. I would have kept it for myself. Apart from that fact, I would have been just like Robin Hood and everyone admires him, so what's the harm? I rubbed my forehead hard. I had no idea people harboured these sorts of secrets. Thankfully, the nurse stopped speaking when the residents let out gasps of delight to see Purse Nickel, and he hurried over to accept pats and affection. Clearly, he liked the residents. One of the more elderly ladies was the first to speak. I have five nieces and five nephews, she told me. I told each one of them in private that I was leaving my fortune to them. I swore them to secrecy. She broke off with a laugh. Each one of them thinks they're going to inherit everything from me, but there is nothing to inherit. She laughed so hard that she coughed, and one of the nurses patted her on the back. You're not supposed to pat someone on the back when they cough, Harriet told the nurse, who looked quite put out. What do they teach you young people these days? Another lady piped up. If I was rich, I would buy an old, scary house in the middle of nowhere that looks haunted and invite all my relatives. In my will, I would state that they all had to stay there until there was only one of them left alive. The last person left alive would inherit my fortune. I think I saw that in a movie once, I said, wondering if she was serious. I don't like any of my relatives. She continued, they're waiting for me to die so they can inherit. So I've left all my money to charity. I haven't even left them any money for my funeral. As far as I'm concerned, someone can dig a hole with a shovel, throw me in, and then put a bit of tin over me like they do in the outback. I was shocked. Surely they don't bury people like that in the outback? I asked her. She nodded. Yes, our family used to live near Cooper Peedy, and there was a man who stole my family's opals, so they did away with him. They dug a hole and pushed him in and put some tin over him. No one ever talked about it, and his body was never found, not to this day. Not as far as I know, anyway. I realised my jaw was hanging open. She continued, now don't you go looking sorry for him, Goldie. That was the way of it. Bush justice. I shut my mouth and then said, Oh, I hoped they wouldn't tell me their medical problems. Thank goodness Harriet had already confessed everything, and I was glad my spell only worked the first time I encountered someone. My husband always thought I was a natural blonde, another lady said. How long were you married? Harriet asked her. 
65 years, she said. All the ladies laughed. Of course he would have known you weren't a natural blonde after all that time, Harriet said scathingly. The woman looked surprised. How would he know? I never told a soul. All the ladies flushed red, and Harriet whispered something in the lady's ear. She turned bright red and then said, We had a lights out policy at, you know, those times, of course, and I always kept my petticoat on. I rubbed my forehead. This was going from bad to worse. I was having an affair with Henry Swan, Julie Medina piped up. I felt sorry for her. At first I thought she had murdered the horrible residence manager, Ursula Hackles, but it turned out that Henry Swan had done it. I was in love with him, Julie said. He strung me along for years. How could I have been so stupid? Everyone hurried to comfort her. You didn't know. I said, I've been fooled by men too. There was a general murmur of agreement. I thought of Thomas, my cheating ex-boyfriend, who had sent me to the Gold Coast to get me away from the woman who had replaced me at the Melbourne office. She had turned out to be his other girlfriend, much to my shock. A slender woman stood up. I switched my friend's butter with the cheapest margarine I could find when she was baking her sponge cake entry for the local show and she came second. She always used to win. I beat her that year. The man sitting next to her laughed. My wife once sent me to buy pure woolen socks. I came back with acrylic socks. I assured her they were pure wool, and I spent the change on the pokies. That's not so bad, one of the nurses said. When I take you all to golf, I kick all your balls into the sand trap. You never notice, as I can walk much faster than you all, and my eyesight is better. That's why I always win. There was a collective gasp, broken only by the man who had confessed about the socks. Speaking of golf, I once keyed my friend's golf cart. He'd upset me badly, you see, because he said Greta Garbo had thunder thighs. The nerve of him. But that's not the worst thing I did. I held my breath. Once I ate all my grandchildren's Easter eggs that my wife had hidden in a cupboard. And to cover my tracks, I told the kids that the Easter bunny was a drunk and he'd got lost. My wife was angry with me and bought them more Easter eggs. I have the most dreadful, embarrassing medical problem, another lady said. You won't believe the symptoms. At that point, I stuck my fingers hard in my ears. I wondered how I could reverse the spell. At least it had taught me a valuable lesson. I was going to be far more specific in my spells because I certainly couldn't stand to listen to any more true confessions. I looked up to see Persnickel standing on his hind legs trying to reach grapes. Treat, I called out. He trotted over to me and I gave him one of his promised treats. Just as Oleander and Athanasius arrived, we have news. Oleander said. Chapter 21 We were sitting in my living room. Paddy was sitting on top of Persnickel, much to Persnickel's disgust. I had even shown Persnickel one of those videos where cats sit on turtles, but it had clearly offered him no consolation at all. What was so secret you couldn't tell me at the retirement home and hurried me back here? I asked them. While everyone was busy confessing to you, Athanasius and I talked about the case, Oleander said. You said you would suspect Georgia Garrison only for the fact that she was so surprised when she saw the body. I nodded. That's right. What did you say? Oleander asked me. It was raining heavily and the rain was pounding heavily on the corrugated iron roof. Normally it was a pleasant sound, but not when I had to raise my voice to make myself heard. I had opened all the windows to let in the cool air, enjoying the brief respite from the humidity. I repeated what I had said more loudly this time. And you said that you would have thought she did it, only no one could be that good an actor, Oleander continued. And then you said you found out she used to study acting at NIDA. I could see where she was going with this. Just because she studied acting doesn't mean she wasn't genuinely shocked, 
I protested. I actually don't think she's the murderer. Athanasius and Oleander exchanged glances. I don't think you can dismiss her that easily, Athanasius said. If she was accepted to NIDA and then studied there, she must be quite an accomplished actor. I think you should consider the possibility. Okay, then, I admit it's a possibility, I said. What was her motive? The fact that she was having an affair with Chase? Oleander took the throw rug off the back of the sofa and wrapped it around her, just as a gust of wind blew through the front windows. Perhaps she found out he wasn't going to leave his wife for her. I believe murders by mistresses are not uncommon. You do have a point, I conceded. And you told us about the message left on his screen, Athanasius said. It seems a rather poor attempt to set it up as a suicide. That bungling detective power didn't even think it was a suicide. So what does that suggest to you? That he's not as stupid as he looks, I offered. Athanasius narrowed his eyes. No, that the murderer must have been in a hurry and did not have time to set up the murder thoroughly. Shooting someone with a rifle is hardly a crime of passion, I said, and then qualified my statement by, that is to say, if people were out shooting and had an argument, then I could perhaps understand someone turning the gun on the other. But this was a vet in his office. Someone must have been in a terrible rage to have time to go home and fetch a rifle and then come back and shoot him. If it was a crime of passion, then that emotion lasted a long time. How long did this rage last? Oleander said. This is a small town, mind you. The murderer likely lived no more than five minutes away. So if the vet did, or said something to upset the murderer, then the murderer had time to go home to get the rifle while remaining enraged. I rubbed my forehead. It's a bit much for me to take in, I admitted. I think that run has taken all the oxygen from my brain, like you said. I'm not sparking on all fours at the moment. Athanasius waved one hand at me. In a nutshell, Oleander and I believe that the murderer did not have much time to stage the murder as a suicide. Otherwise, she or he would have done a better job. I nodded slowly. I do see your point. Yes, that does make sense. Would anyone like some coffee or a glass of wine? Maybe both? Oleander opted for coffee, while Athanasius opted for Chardonnay. I opted for both. After all, I was probably still dehydrated, so I needed as much liquid as I could get. And there's that thing with the American spelling, Athanasius said. What was that? I yelled over the sound of the rain and the coffee machine. Athanasius walked over to me and said in my ear, You told us that the word realize was typed with a Z rather than an S. The murderer used American spelling. I stopped grinding the coffee beans and turned to him. This is really bad. We don't have any American suspects. Oleander was dismayed. Athanasius means that the murderer was using American spelling for whatever reason. That should help us narrow it down. But how? I said. Do we go to their homes and rifle through their things and see which one of the suspects uses American spelling? I broke off with a laugh, but my breath caught in my throat when I thought they might suggest exactly that. To my relief, they did not. No, of course not, Oleander said. It's just something we should consider. I made the coffee and placed the cups on a tray, along with two wine glasses and the bottle of Chardonnay, which I quickly fished from the refrigerator. Lots of people use American spelling. Even Aussies on TV use American pronunciation. The TV presenters usually say schedule with a hard k, whereas Aussies should use a soft sh. Most people watch so much American TV. Both Oleander and Athanasius looked crestfallen, so I added, but it is a really good lead. We will have to bear that in mind. And we also found out that Georgia spent six months in Hollywood a few years ago, Oleander said. Maybe she picked up American spelling then. You know, I really think she did it. I thought it was all rather tenuous, but I didn't want to upset Oleander. Instead, I said, you may be right. No sooner had I placed the tray on the table than there was a knock on the door. Who is it? Athanasius asked me. Goldie won't know until she opens the door, 
Oleander said with a roll of her eyes. She might be a witch, but she's not psychic. I opened the door, pleased to see Max. I tried to call you earlier, he began, but then he looked past me to where Oleander and Athanasius were in full view. You have company. Was it my imagination, but did he sound a little disappointed? Come in. I opened the door for him to enter. Oh my goodness, you're drenched. Would you like a towel? Without waiting for him to answer, I raced out of the room and fetched two towels, which I thrust at him. He put one on the sofa and sat on it, and then toweled his hair with the other one. Athanasius and Oleander stared fixedly at him, and I knew they were wondering what he was doing there. I just hoped they wouldn't ask him. That would be awfully embarrassing. A rather strange silence settled upon us, until Max said, How is Paddy doing? His annoying Persnickel no end, I said. He likes to sit on him. Persnickel will be sad and miss him when he goes, I'm sure, Max said. Look at the two of them there. Persnickel and Paddy were curled up together in front of the TV, which was not switched on. I expect Persnickel was exhausted from giving his little friend a ride around the house. I don't know if he will miss him, I said. I think he finds him rather irritating. Enid will be able to have Paddy back any day now, I'm sure, Oleander said. I called in on her earlier. She is awfully grateful to you, Goldie. I waved a hand in dismissal. That's fine. He's been no trouble at all, I lied. Another knock on the door made me jump. Max looked startled, and I'm sure he thought what I did, that it was the mysterious man who had pulled him out of my house previously. Quick, hide the coffee, Max said. He and Athanasius took both cups to the kitchen. I figured they were covering the coffee machine with a cloth, and then Max stuck his head around the kitchen and gave the thumbs up. However, it was not a man, but a woman. I opened the door and stared at her. She was standing there in the driving rain. Come in, I said, wondering who she was. She stepped in and stood just inside the door. I'm so sorry to intrude on a day like this, but I'm from the new marina restaurant that's about to open. We were checking through our invitations and found we hadn't invited enough people, so we're going door to door issuing invitations. I'm sorry it's such short notice, though, because it's tomorrow night. What is the event again? I asked her. And how much is a ticket? She shook her head. It's completely free, and it's for a food tasting. It's for the new marina restaurant that we're about to open. We want to invite all the town residents to a tasting. You're welcome to bring a partner. Butterflies went wild in my stomach at the thought I could possibly invite Max. But to my dismay, Athanasius spoke up. Can Goldie bring more than one guest? That would be lovely, Oleander piped up. Athanasius and I would love to go. The woman must have noticed my face and the way I glanced at Max, because she said, Would all four of you like to come? To my relief, Max said that he would. The woman handed me four tickets and a brochure. All the information is in there, she said. I'm so glad you can all come, and sorry again for the late notice. The marina restaurant is going to be so good for this town. I don't suppose you will be able to serve coffee? Oleander asked her. The woman's face fell. No, I'm afraid there's no getting around that old bylaw. Chapter 22 I expected the marina restaurant to be entirely modern, with masses of glass walls and trendy decor. To the contrary, it was something quite different. An old boat, clearly intended to be a statement piece, was suspended over the bar, and the tables were mismatched. Some chairs were upholstered in tartan, and I wondered if the owners were perhaps Scottish. A brown and gold geometric pattern covered one wall, and it seemed to have nothing to do with the sea. The only nod to the sea, apart from the suspended boat, was the long rope that hung from the ceiling, forming a looped pattern. There was a cylindrical fireplace in the centre of the room, which I thought a complete waste of money, considering it never got cold enough in Queensland to warrant a fire. The curtains were drawn across one entire wall. I imagined there would be a good view of the sea on the other side, and thought it a shame that the curtains were shut. 
this is exciting. Oleander clutched my arm. I can't believe it's all free. And the champagne, too. You only have to pay for spirits if you want them. I was alarmed. Spirits? I echoed, and then laughed. I was thinking of ghosts. I don't know what's wrong with me. I chuckled again. Oleander patted my shoulder. You're probably still exhausted after your run. Wasn't it nice that Max drove us all here? Lovely, I said through gritted teeth. Was that Max's way of avoiding alone time with me? I had no idea. All I knew is that I was attracted to him, and sometimes I thought he was attracted to me, although he had never acted on it. I had seen these types of one-sided attraction matches on Married at First Sight, and they never ended well, even after intervention from the experts. I accepted a glass of champagne from a passing waiter and sipped it slowly. I looked around the room for Max, but he was nowhere to be seen. Athanasius was talking to someone I presumed was a local, while Oleander was chatting with me. I bet this place will be awfully expensive when they open, she said. I had to agree. A woman appeared in front of me. This is homemade bread with roasted garlic and aged balsamic vinegar, drizzled with extra virgin olive oil, basil and black pepper. Sounds good to me. Oleander said, helping herself to some. I instead selected a green olive. Athanasius walked over to us. Have you tried the small fried rice balls? They sound fairly ordinary, but I must say they're absolutely delicious. I nodded. You know, I think the truth spell has worn off, because I've met several people tonight and they haven't confessed anything to me. Oleander's hand went to her throat. That is good news, Goldie. She waggled her finger at me. Now remember, you have to be entirely specific in your spells from now on. The universe doesn't act on what you're thinking. It acts on what you say. I sighed long and hard. I'm afraid I've learnt that the hard way. My voice was drowned out by a waiter offering zucchini flowers, fried in a light batter and served with curried tomato coolie. I spied Max talking to a woman and my stomach knotted. Oleander followed my gaze. There's no need to be jealous, Goldie. Jealous? Who, me? I'm not jealous, I lied. Oleander laughed. That lady Max is speaking to is Helen North, Nicholas North's wife. Nico North? I asked her. The victim's best buddy? The very one, she said. The poor woman is something of an alcoholic. We don't know much about Helen and Nicholas because they haven't been in East Bucklebury much longer than you have. I thought he was best friends with the vet, though, I said. She nodded. In Sydney, back in the day, and they obviously kept in touch. Like I said, they haven't lived here long, but this poor woman, Helen, is overly fond of wine. Look at her now. She's clearly quite over-refreshed. Helen was halfway through putting her arms around Max's neck. Max was clearly alarmed and stepped backwards. Just then Nico arrived and took his wife by the elbow. He did not seem at all put out that Helen had obviously had one too many glasses of champagne. Max walked over to me and said, Have you heard if the police got the gunshot residue tests back yet? I shook my head. No, but I haven't heard from them for the last few hours, so I'm taking it as a good sign. Now don't you worry, Goldie, he said. Those gunshot residue tests will prove you're innocent. I don't know if they'll prove Georgia Garrison is innocent, though, Oleander said. My money is on her as the murderer. You know, she isn't even here tonight. I bet you anything she's made a run for it. I didn't know what to say. It's a puzzling case, to be sure, I said, and then saw Max staring at me. I quickly added, not that we have done any investigating or anything like that. I forced a smile. Athanasius materialised beside me in what was a display of bad timing. I still think it could be Adrian Young, he said. Maybe he was having an affair with the vet's wife. They looked awfully friendly at the funeral. He looked at Max and then added, Not that we've done any investigating, of course. I thought it time to change the subject. Isn't this a lovely evening? To my relief, Max agreed and made no comment on the subject of our investigating. Yes, we'll have to come back sometime for dinner. 
I did not know if he was referring to me or to all of us, so I simply said, yes, that would be nice. My heart was beating out of my chest so hard that I wondered if the others could hear it. Oh, look, there's poor Julie Medina, Oleander said. Come on, Athanasius, let's go and try to cheer her up. Cheer her up? Athanasius said, raising his eyebrows. Why does she need cheering up? Oleander glared at her. Obviously, because the man she was having an affair with turned out to be a murderer. She seized Athanasius's elbow and pulled him in Julie's direction. I smiled awkwardly at Max. Goldie, he began, but the mysterious man interrupted. Detective Grayson and Miss Bloom, imagine seeing the two of you here together. We're not here together, Max said. I merely gave Miss Bloom here, along with her friends from the East Bucklebury Retirement Home, a lift here. I'm the designated driver for the night. How charitable of you, the man said in a clipped tone. May I have a word with you, if you'll excuse us, Miss Bloom? I glared at their backs as they left. Why did Max protest that he wasn't here with me? Why was he so defensive? Was that man a friend of Max's ex-wife or ex-girlfriend or something like that? Or did Max have a current wife, and this man was a friend of hers, maybe even her brother? Soon my head was spilling with endless possibilities, none of them good. I turned around and bumped into Helen North. I'm so sorry, I said. I was mortified to see that she had spilled her champagne down her dress. There's no trouble at all, don't worry about it. Her speech was slurred. Just fetch me some more champagne, will you? I thought she'd had one too many, but just as I was wondering what to say, a waiter went past, and she snatched a champagne flute from his tray. Would you like something to eat? I asked her. I thought some solid food would absorb some of the alcohol. Yes, would you fetch me some food? She said. Maybe we should sit down. I feel a little dizzy. Sure, I said. You sit right here. Would you like to eat anything in particular? Perhaps some um, bruschetta, she said. To mop up all the alcohol? She offered a nasal laugh. Soon I was back at our little table with as much bruschetta as I could find. Have this, I said. You're very kind. I'm Helen North. Who are you? Goldie Bloom. I moved to East Bucklebury only recently. She looked me up and down. Yes, I can see that. You seem awfully overdressed for a local. I couldn't tell if her tone was critical, but I said, I'm from Melbourne. My boss sent me here to manage his office in Southport. She laughed. Was he trying to get rid of you? I laughed too. Yes, as a matter of fact, he was. Man, they can be quite strange at times, can't they? I readily agreed. My husband is the jealous type, she said. He doesn't trust me. You know, I'd really like to get out of the marriage, but I'm afraid of what he would do. He has a bad temper. I was mortified at the news. I was wondering what to say when she pushed on. He thought I was having an affair with Chase Evans. The vet? I was alarmed. Yes, Chase, she said. They'd been friends for years since they were little kids. How ridiculous is that? Why would his best friend have an affair with me? Honestly, Nico has problems. Why do you think I drink? She punctuated her remark by swallowing the rest of her glass in one gulp. I pushed the plate of bruschetta across to distract her from looking for another glass. She nibbled at the edge of the bread before speaking again. Did I tell you my husband thought I was having an affair with Chase Evans? Yes, you told me that only a second ago. I said, worried about her. She shook her head. Sorry, I lose my memory when I drink. But drinking is the only way I can put up with my husband. At any rate, he was embarrassed when he found out that Chase wasn't having an affair with me, but with Chase's nurse, Georgia Garrison. Why did he think you were having an affair with Chase? I asked her. She shrugged. Nick, I never thought that before, and we've been friends with Chase and Bree for years. But when we got back from California a couple of weeks ago, Chase told Nico that he was having an affair with a married woman. 
and Chase was gloating about the fact that her husband didn't know. Nico thought he was taunting him, that he was having an affair with me. He apologised to me when he found out it was Georgia. She waved her hand in agitation. I wish I had somehow managed to stay in California and not come back to Australia with him. I just wish I could find a way to escape him. I patted her hand. Surely you must be able to get out of the marriage if you really want to. She shook her head. Nico has a terrible temper. She sniffled and dabbed at her eyes with a napkin. Chase and Nico were good friends from childhood, she continued. But Nico was always jealous of Chase. Chase had everything he wanted, a beautiful home, and he got into vet school while Nico didn't. Nico always acted friendly to Chase's face, but I always had to hear about Chase at length from Nico. He often smashed things in the house if he heard that Chase did well. Of course, it all came to a head when he thought I was having an affair with Chase. When did Nico find out you weren't having an affair with Chase? I asked her. Only after Chase died, when it all went around town that Chase had been having an affair with Georgia, she said. Everyone knows that now. I don't envy Georgia when her husband gets back from overseas. Do you think Georgia could have shot Chase? I asked her. She hiccuped and waved her empty champagne flute at me. No, nah. although Chase said she was a crack shot, even better than Nico. My blood ran cold. Does Nico own a rifle? She put a perfectly manicured fingernail to her lips in a gesture of silence. I'm supposed to deny it if anyone asks me. Everything fell into place. Nico was insanely jealous and thought his wife was having an affair with the victim. Nico owned a rifle, and Nico had just returned from California. I suppose Nico picked up American spelling and habits? She laughed. Sure, he still gets in the passenger side of the car when he wants to drive. Sometimes he's even driven on the wrong side of the road. The photo that Max had shown me with the American spelling of realize swam before my eyes. At the time, I had thought it a tenuous connection, but now I was sure. I looked up and saw Nico standing close by. His back was to us, but he was close enough. How much had he heard? Chapter 23 I stood abruptly, nearly knocking over my glass of champagne as I did so. I had to tell someone. Where was Max? And for that matter, where were Oleander and Athanasius? Failing those, I would have to speak to Detective Power, as Detective Walters was also nowhere to be seen. Power was only metres from me. Can I speak to you? I asked, tapping him on the arm. He swung around. Well, hello, Ms. Bloom. Do you wish to confess? It was a weak attempt at a joke. At least, I hoped he was joking. I know who the murderer is, I hissed. He raised his eyebrows but the look on his face spoke volumes. He did not believe me. It's Nico North, I whispered. Nicholas North, the victim's best friend? Power crossed his arms over his chest. And exactly what has led you to that conclusion, Miss Bloom? His tone was one of extreme boredom. I realized because he's just returned from America and the American spelling, realize, was on the fake suicide note. I told him. As soon as the words were out of my mouth, I realised I should not have been party to that information. Power frowned so deeply that his eyebrows formed a unibrow. How do you know that if you had nothing to do with the murder? He snapped. It's a small town. Everyone knows that, I said. It probably wasn't far from the truth. Nico has just returned from California, and his wife said he still gets in the wrong side of the car sometimes. He is more likely than anyone else to use American spelling. Detective Powers sighed. So that's it. Don't give up your day job, Miss Bloom. Leave the detective work to the professionals. He finished his words with a snigger. I shook my head. His wife just told me he owns a rifle and that he told her not to tell anyone. He was always insanely jealous of Chase Evans and also thought his wife was having an affair with him. And did his wife tell you all that? 
Power said, stabbing his finger in Helen's direction. I followed his gaze. Helen had staggered into a wall, and two women grabbed her arms to support her. She seems far too inebriated to be able to tell you what day of the week it is, he said. Don't waste any more of my time, Ms. Bloom. With that, he turned on his heel and marched into the crowd. I stared after him, infuriated. Where was Max? There was still no sign of him, and there was no sign of the mysterious man who had been following him around. Finally, I spotted Athanasius. He was sitting in a tartan chair, chatting to some other men. I made my way over to him when the Dutch runners blocked my path. Thank you for paying for my shoes, one of them said. You're most welcome, I said. I'm so sorry my wombat ate yours. I hope he didn't frighten you too much. Not at all, the man said with what was clearly false bravado. I hope you were able to buy a new shoe in time for the race, I continued. He nodded. Yes, thank you. I actually bought two shoes, a matching pair. There are plenty of running shoe stores around here, and I was able to get the exact brand in my size. How did you go in the run? I survived it, I said. They all laughed as if I had said something funny. Helen appeared at my shoulder. I have to speak to you in private, she said, pulling me away. The smell of alcohol on her breath nearly knocked me over. I think she had abandoned the champagne in favor of gin. What is it? I asked her. Your detective friend has given me a message for you. I was surprised. Max? Max Grayson? She nodded again. He wants to speak with you in private and doesn't want anyone to see you both. He wants you to meet him out on the balcony now. But don't let anyone see you go out there, and don't tell your friends that you're going. It has to be secret. Top secret. Did he say what it was about? I asked her. She leant forward and winked. I had to grab her by her arms to steady her. I think it's for a romantic assignation, she said with a lascivious wink. Thank you. Look, I want to catch up with you later in the week, if that's all right. She hiccuped again, more loudly this time. Sure. With that, she hurried in the direction of the bathroom. I rubbed my forehead. So Max wanted to speak with me in private. I schooled my features into a neutral expression to keep myself calm. That didn't mean it was anything romantic. Helen could have simply drawn that conclusion. Maybe he had found out something about the case and didn't want the other detectives to see him speaking to me. I looked around at everyone, but no one was staring at me. I walked down the length of the curtains, looking for a way out, thinking it would be difficult to disappear onto the balcony without being seen. But the entrance was actually around a corner and down a narrow corridor. I let myself out onto the balcony and was immediately hit with a strong breeze. This time, the weather was not my doing, but I loved the breeze and the smell of the salt air. I leant on the balcony and looked over. The marina restaurant was perched high on the side of a cliff. It wasn't a particularly tall cliff, as far as cliffs go, and I bent over the rail to look at the rocks and the sand below. It was a beautiful breeze. I stood there and let the sea spray gently wash over my face. I heard footsteps behind me and swung around. You! There was no sign of Detective Max Grayson. There, in front of me, was Nico North. A black look covered his face. Chapter 24 Max isn't coming, is he? I said, rapidly putting two and two together. Nico's expression was menacing. For a smart woman, you certainly fell into my trap. It's a shame you had to involve your wife, I said angrily. He shook his head. She genuinely believed that the detective wanted to speak with you. I told her that he wanted to speak with you in private. Helen is quite a silly woman, but I'm fond of her. I doubt it's mutual, I snapped, and then regretted my words when his scowl deepened. 
What did you want to say to me? I asked him, although I realized he didn't want to say anything to me. Behind me, the storm was building. I sensed it and felt it rather than heard or saw it. I concentrated on increasing the intensity and was satisfied when I heard the windows rattle. Surely Oleander and Athanasius would know I was creating the storm and come to my aid. I don't want to say anything to you, he said. I'm simply going to throw you over the edge. He was still a few paces from me and so far had made no attempt to close the distance. I needed to delay him until help could come. How did you know I was on to you? I asked him. I overheard you talking to my wife, he said, and the silly woman told you that I had a rifle and that I'd thought she was having an affair with Chase. You and Chase were friends for years, I said. He shrugged one shoulder. More like frenemies. He had all the lucky breaks, while I didn't. Do you know I missed out on getting into vet school by one mark? I nodded. I heard that, he pushed on. And Chase scraped in by just one mark. It's not fair. He had all the lucky breaks in life. He didn't appreciate anything he had, and he always had affairs. I've never once had an affair. When I came back from California, all he could do was gloat incessantly and tell me he was having an affair with a married woman. He was so over the top about it that I was convinced he was taunting me. I thought he was having an affair with my wife. He even told me how long the affair had been going and it was only a few days after we arrived back in the country. There were too many coincidences, and I was sure he was having an affair with Helen. So obviously you asked Helen about it, and she denied it, but you didn't believe her. A glimpse of contrition passed over his face momentarily, but then it was gone. Yes, I was angry with her, and I didn't believe her. Chase just pushed me too far that day, he said he was going to leave his wife and get his mistress to leave her husband, and then half her husband's wealth would be his. I just lost it. I'd never been in such a rage. I went home and got my rifle, and, well, you know, the rest is history. But I was there on the scene not long after, because I found his body, I said. I didn't see any cars going back down the road, and the police said he had been shot not long before I got there. Of course I wasn't going to drive there to shoot him, Nico said scathingly. There's a little used dirt track not far behind the vet surgery, and I just had to cut through the mangrove swamp. I had never thought of that. He advanced on me. Enough talk. I can't risk anyone finding us here. I told Detective Power everything, I said. He knows. The game is up. Nico emitted a harsh laugh. I find that hard to believe. I just had a nice chat with him before I came out here. I was thinking of something else to say when Nico lunged for me. I did not have time to react. He spun me around and stood in front of me, his back to the rail. He grabbed my hair hard with both hands and pulled as hard as he could. Unfortunately for Nico, he did not know I was wearing a wig. And what's more, the wig was not glued on or even pinned. He had no time to be surprised that my hair came off in his hands because the momentum of trying to throw me over the rail by my hair sent him backwards over the rail instead. I leant over the rail just as Athanasius, Oleander and Max hurried onto the landing. They all gasped and I hoped it wasn't at the sight of my real hair. I did my best not to burst into tears. Nico North confessed everything to me. He had just overheard his wife implicate him in the murder. I sniffed the tears. He grabbed my wig, thinking it was my real hair, and tried to pull me over the edge. But he ended up going over, I said. They all rushed past me and looked over the edge. I looked up to see Detective Power standing behind them, his mouth agape. I told you he did it. I snapped in the most accusatory tone I could muster. You didn't listen to me, and that almost got me killed. Max rounded on him. 
Goldie told you. When? Power's mouth opened and shut. He did a good impression of Goldfish. Instead of speaking, he whipped out his phone and called for an ambulance. He's moving so he's not dead, Athanasius called out. Luckily for him, he landed in a patch of sand between the rocks, but his leg is at a funny angle. Max took me by my shoulders. Are you all right, Goldie? I nodded. I didn't want to dissolve into tears and throw my arms around Max's neck as I had after the scene of the last murder in East Bucklebury. I rubbed my forehead. I hoped this wasn't going to become a habit. Chapter 25 Oleander handed me my phone. You left your phone on the table. It's a wonder Persnickel didn't eat it. I stared at it absently. Oh, sorry. Thanks for fetching it. Oleander eyed me strangely. I took a call for you from a woman who said something about your empty womb being a matter of urgency. I looked at my watch. Just after five. Yes, that would be Gertrude. Don't worry about it. I waved one hand in the air. Oleander leant across and patted my knee. You must be happy, Goldie. Why? Because I thwarted a second murder attempt. Oleander eyed me warily and then said, No, that was good, of course, but I meant... Her voice trailed away and she nodded to Max. Oleander had taken it upon herself to invite Max to my celebration party. It was a celebration for not being thrown over the edge of the landing. I was a little embarrassed about it because I didn't know if Max had friend-zoned me... Sure, I felt lots of chemistry towards him, but I had watched enough episodes of Married at First Sight to know that chemistry isn't always reciprocated, no matter how strongly one person feels it. Oleander must have guessed what I was thinking. Give it time, Goldie. He's a good man, not like your ex-boyfriend. Speak of the devil, I said, as a text from Thomas came in. Goldie. Alexis has just left the firm. I don't need you at the Gold Coast any longer to manage the Southport office. Can you come back to Melbourne immediately to take up your old job? I know you don't have anywhere to live here now, so you can stay with me until you find a place. My ears started burning at first, and then my face. I had never been in such a rage. The nerve of that man. I could read the subtext clearly. His girlfriend had left him, so now he wanted me back. Not just as a real estate agent, but also as his girlfriend. What self-respecting woman would do that? I thought there was no point beating around the bush, so I came straight to the point. I texted back, No, Thomas, I'm living here now. Is that going to be a problem with the Southport offers? To my surprise, his reply was immediate. I'm shutting the Southport offers. Either return to Melbourne within the fortnight, or you no longer have a position with my firm. I sat with my mouth open, staring at my phone. Is something wrong? Oleander asked me. I simply handed her my phone. My boss, I said. Oleander muttered some dreadfully rude words. Is he serious? I nodded. I believe he is. I took my phone from Oleander. Seething with a cold, steely rage, I texted Thomas back to say that since I was unable to return to Melbourne, he would have to fulfil his legal obligations in all the payments he owed me. I said if he had anything further to say, he could contact my lawyers. This time, there was no reply. Oleander patted my shoulder. Goldie, are you all right? You're out of a job. I chewed the end of one French polished fingernail. It's a terrible shock, but it's not the end of the world, I don't suppose. It would have been awkward working for Thomas, and my uncle did leave me a little bit of money, as well as the house. I figure I can get by for some time, until I find another job. There are so many real estate agents at the Gold Coast that it shouldn't be too hard to get a position. But your old boss won't give you a good reference, will he? Oleander asked me. I shrugged. He will if he knows what's good for him. Why don't you go into business for yourself? Oleander asked me. 
there are some vacant offices in the main street of East Bugglebury. I laughed, in spite of my predicament. That's not a good sign, you know, Oleander, to have vacant buildings in the main street. But you can get the rent for a song, she said, and East Bucklebury is going ahead. I tapped my chin. You might be right. There are all those developers, and I don't think the other real estate agents can be bothered with East Bucklebury because it's so out of the way. You know, I might have a good opportunity here. Oleander agreed. Look, I know you won't make as much money at first as if you were, say, in an office at Surfers Paradise or Broadbeach, or in the position you were going to have in Southport, but surely you can build up the business over time and you won't have the overheads. The more I thought about it, the more excited I became. I'm fully licensed, so I can go into business for myself. I won't need to make a lot of money to live on because I invested the money that my uncle left me. I can live on that for a while if I have to, and then I'll have all the severance pay, holiday pay, and sick pay that Thomas owes me. If I'm careful, I'll be all right. I smiled at her. Oleander, I think this is a great idea. She smiled. I'm glad, and Persnickel is having a good time. Some of the residents in the assisted care facility were crowded around Persnickel, giving him lots of pats. He rolled over for a belly rub, and everyone happily obliged. I laughed. Persnickel is being spoilt. He won't want to come home with me. Nonsense, Athanasius said, coming up behind me. He loves you, Gildy. Max peeked around from Athanasius's shoulder. What was that? Who loves Goldie? It seemed he was jealous after all. Persnickel, I said, and noted the obvious relief on Max's face. Oh, I thought you were talking about your boss. Max knew that Thomas was my ex-boyfriend, and he knew the circumstances under which I had arrived in East Bucklebury. I don't have a boss anymore. I've just decided to go into business for myself, here in East Bucklebury. Max's mouth fell open, and then he looked around him. I took a guess at who he was looking for. You're looking for that man who follows you everywhere, aren't you? I asked him, surprised at my forthrightness. Still, it was too late to take the words back. Oh, yes. About him. Max shot a pointed look at Oleander and Athanasius. Oleander stood up. Athanasius, come and help me keep an eye on Persnickel. Athanasius looked startled. Why? Why do we need to keep an eye on Persnickel? He's doing quite well for himself, getting all those belly rubs. Oleander sighed dramatically. She seized Athanasius by the elbow and dragged him, still protesting, over to the residence. Max took Oleander's vacated seat beside me. I held my breath. Was he going to tell me he was married and the mysterious guy was his wife's brother? Or maybe the guy was his secret lover? I shook my head, surely not. Still, I had the worst gaydar of anyone I had ever met. What other explanations could there be? I supposed I was about to find out. My skin ran cold as a bout of nausea hit me. It must have all seemed mysterious to you, Max said. I could barely breathe, so I simply nodded. He watched me for a moment, and I hoped he didn't want me to speak before he did. I remained silent. Finally, he spoke. He works for internal affairs, but keep that just between us. Internal affairs? I said in a voice louder than I should have. I looked around me, but luckily no one appeared to have heard. Max lowered his voice. Yes, he's from Internal Affairs, and he's been investigating everyone at our police station, he said in little more than a whisper. But why was he following you around? I asked him. Well, he is investigating me as well as everyone else, Max said. He'll probably be here for another week. The only reason he's not here now is that there's a security guard at the entrance to the retirement home, and he probably doesn't want to explain who he is. He seems to have taken a big interest in you, I said, worried that Max was doing something crooked or untoward in some way. Max smiled. He doesn't suspect me of any wrongdoing as such, I'm sure. 
It's just one of the old bylaws. I was incredulous. He suspects you're drinking coffee illegally. Max's face turned a bright shade of red. Goldie, there's another old East Bucklebury bylaw you probably haven't heard about. Another one? Is it as crazy as not being able to drink coffee or be in possession of coffee in town? Max nodded. Yes, I'm afraid to say it is. Well, what is it? I asked him. It does seem a little silly. My patience was wearing thin. Out with it, Max. A police officer who is a resident of East Bucklebury is not allowed to date anyone who is also a resident of East Bucklebury. Max blurted out. I sat stock still as his words sank in, doing my best to school my features into a neutral expression, although many people had told me that I would never make a poker player. Finally, I said, But that's crazy. Max readily agreed. I sat silently processing the information. Did this explain why Max had not shown any overt interest in me? It was against the law. Maybe he really did like me after all. A police officer, especially one whose station was currently under investigation, could hardly date someone from East Bucklebury or drink coffee in town for that matter. I looked up to see Max staring at me. You have a plumbed in coffee machine in your house and it's illegal to own a coffee machine or drink coffee in East Bucklebury, he said. I nodded. Yes. He wiggled his eyebrows, so I said, I'm not sure where you're going with this. I shouldn't say this as a police officer, but those are some really silly old bylaws. My point is that there is a way around everything. A thousand butterflies went crazy in my stomach. Did Max mean what I thought he meant? I held his gaze for a moment and then looked down at my five-inch stilettos. Maybe Detective Max Grayson did like me after all. I clutched my sides. Persnickel broke the moment by stealing a plate of food from the table. I was alerted to the fact by a resident calling out, concerned. I rushed over. Persnickel, you naughty wombat. The resident hurried to reassure me. It wasn't his fault. I was just worried that it might be bad for him. No, it was one of Athanasius's lemon tarts, and they're safe for wombats to eat, I said, much to the resident's relief. This was where it had all started, Persnickel eating something he shouldn't have, resulting in me taking him to the vet, only to find the vet's dead body. My friends had rallied around me. In my life, I hadn't had many close friends, despite living in a major city with a population of over four million people, Yet here I was, in the small coastal town of East Bucklebury, with a population of just over 1,500 people, and I had formed close friendships in the short time I had been here. I knew that no matter what happened, I was happy here. This was my home. The End You've just listened to Broom for One More. Sea Witch Cozy Mysteries, Book 3, written by Morgana Best, narrated by Amy Soakes. Copyright 2019 by Morgana Best. Production Copyright 2021 by Morgana Best. If you've enjoyed this audiobook, please consider leaving a review and recommending on social media or directly to friends and family. And keep an eye out for other audiobooks by Morgana Best. Thanks for listening.